are met in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in man's mind. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Oh, well, 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 hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, <laughs> darling, the man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charm. <laughs> but my husband loves me, Jim must be my fatal fascination. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, yeah, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well, there's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes. Very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or, better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo! Tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happened. All right. Mrs. Browning! <laughs> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby ass. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. Ghastly cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold, at any rate. <laughs> You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive, almost anyway. Sandy, 
The footprints. They disappear. Oh, maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? Uh, no. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. Day and night. <laughs> you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. And here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice day. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat. Call <laughs> My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Keep 
walking, Sandra. I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now come on, stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> Again. Insidious feeling, doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for ghosts. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Black. <laughs> Don't scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Yes, Mrs. Darling, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Bonnie. Paul, oh, Paul, stop this horrible Cut thing. Cut me. Cut me. Cut me. It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. All right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes, it's gone, but Mrs. Browning, she's dead. tells Detective Hodges that a flesh-and-blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, we'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. 
Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happened. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, oh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty-night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. Here, Blackie, come here, come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie, poor doggy. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where do I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Uh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. Shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Great Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Oh! will against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. 
Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room, which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me, I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but, Paul, The room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. Did you hurt yourself climbing that petition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. That's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an ice box. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look, here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint, faint, and as if something unearthly is moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No, the blasted thing. <laughs> oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul! Paul, look! Look in that corner! Mr. Richards, you... you are alive. Yes, alive. Quite alive. Because I will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything... I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us, closing in. Yes, oh. closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down. Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards. No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Gosh, Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richard's body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world.
From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Video 4. It's half past eight. Saturday Night Theatre. We present Ursula Smith with Stephen MacDonald and Roy Boucher in Mary Stewart's Wildfire at Midnight. Adapted for radio by Stuart Hunter. Wildfire at Midnight. Abbas 337. Mother? Oh, Jeanette. Oh, what a lovely surprise. How are you both? Oh, bearing up, thank you. Uh, but what about you? That's really what I'm phoning about. Well, you're not unwell, are you? Oh, no, there's nothing wrong that a short holiday won't cure. Hugo thinks I should take myself off to some quiet spot. I dare say I was looking a bit run down. Well, in that case, the sooner you get away, the better. Uh, when would you thought? The beginning of June, probably. Oh, good. It's a pity, though, you, you miss all the fun of being in town for the coronation. I don't think I'll be altogether sorry to escape from the crowds. You will be coming down here, of course. Would you mind, dearest, if I went somewhere else for a bit? I thought of the Lake District. No, that's not far enough. Uh, how about Sky? Sky? That could be just what I need. Do you remember where the Dunhills stayed when they were there? Uh, yes, it was the Camasunery Hotel. The what hotel, Mother? <laughs> the can of pizza, as it sounds. Look, have you got a pen? <laughs> the other part is uh, F-H-I-O-N-N-A-R-I-D-H. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I think I shall go to the... How do you say it? Camasunery Hotel... I know the island like the back of my hand, but they still take my breath away every time. They? The Coolins. Oh. Uh, you couldn't have had your first sight of the hills under better conditions. You're a climber, I take it. Uh, oh, yes, of sorts. Uh, what about you? Have you come for long? A week, possibly ten days, depending on the weather. You're from... London. Ah. Well, you've certainly come to the right place if you want to get away from the crowds. What's that mountain right behind the hotel? That's Blaven. It's what? Blaven. The Blue Mountain in English. Uh, what made you come to Sky? I wanted a complete change. I shall take myself for long walks in the hills. According to the guidebook, there's a lock on the lower slopes of Blaven, is it? Uh-huh. I don't see myself going far beyond that. I'm not likely to come to any harm there, am I? Uh, you'll be staying at the hotel, of course. Forgive me, but haven't we met? I know you, surely. No, we've never met, Miss Mayling. Although, of course, I've often seen you on the stage. Oh, I have a jolly good memory for faces. I still think I've seen you before. Well, I modelled clothes, if that's any help. Indeed, that's where. You model for Montefiore, don't you? More often than not. My name's Drury, Janetta Drury. I saw your last show, and the one before, and the one before that. Mm, back to the dawn of time, darling, I know. But how nice of you. You must have been in pigtails when we did Wild Bells. <laughs> I cut them off early. I had to earn a living. Ah, enter a manservant bearing much-needed drink. Ta. Ah. Thank you. Slanche. Uh, what? Slanche, my dear. 
That seems to be what they say for cheers in these parts. Oh, I see. Cheers. What? Hmm? Well, I was about to ask rather rudely, what on earth are you doing here? Resting, my dear. Really resting, not just out of a job. The show came off a week ago. I just read a perfectly divine book about Sky, so here I am. And doesn't Sky live up to the book? In a way. Trouble is you can't really get around. Do you like walking? Rough walking. I do, rather. Well, I don't. And Fergus simply refuses to take the car over some of these roads. Fergus, you're here with your husband, then? <laughs> oh, my dear, no. Fergus is my chauffeur. Marcia. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Mayling. Marcia, my sweet, please. Who else is staying here? Well, let's see. There's Colonel and Mrs. Cardry Simpson. They're dim, but rather sweet. I think I saw them come in. Elderly and with an empty creel. That's them, all right. Then there's Mr. and Mrs. Corrigan and Mr. Brain. Not Alistair Brain. A friend of yours. I've met him. He's in advertising. Well, he's with the Corrigan couple. And if ever I could find it in my heart to pity a woman married to a good-looking man, which Hartley Corrigan most certainly is, I'd pity <sighs> that one. Why? Fish. Fish. Oh, I get it. You mean fishing. Exactly. Morning, noon, and night. And she does nothing but moon about miserably. I believe I may have caught a glimpse of her in the hall when I was registering. She didn't look too happy. Ah, oh, who else have we? Well, just before you join me in here, I noticed two women passing. One was about my own age. The other was much younger. They teach in the same school. I met a man on the ferry. He seems to be staying here. Grant, I think. Ah, uh, that would be Roderick Grant. He practically lives <clears throat> here, I believe. Polish, nice-looking, with rather gorgeous hair. That's the one. Blue eyes. And how he definitely is interesting. Is it one? I gathered that this Roderick Grant is a fisherman, too. Oh, heavens, yes. But I must say, he's only spasmodic about it. Most of the time he walks, or something. Anyhow, he's never in the hotel. He's a climber. Probably. Oh, there's another climber chap called Beagle. Oh, Lord Beagle. He's a famous mountaineer. Oh, well, he goes around with another man, a strange little creature called Hubert Hay. Oh, I almost forgot there's another man who got here last night. I have a feeling he writes. Good heavens. <laughs> We're a positive galaxy of talent, aren't we? <laughs> this other chap's all dark and damn your eyes. But believe it or not, he fishes too. There's only one thing for it, you know. We'll have to take up fishing ourselves. I'm told it's soothing to the nerves. Does your husband fish? <laughs> Possibly the ring misled you. I'm not married. Oh, sir. Divorced. Oh. <laughs> so am I. Three times, darling. Aren't men stinkers? Mine could be, at times. What was his name? Nicholas. Oh. It's fast. But dinner could be said to be in the offing. Thank heaven. I'm hungry. I must say the view from here really is spectacular. The garden certainly looms. Not any more of that, please. Do you mind? I'm being a boom. I can't help it, Jeanetta. That bloody mountain gets me down. Let's just not talk about it. Oh, my God. What's wrong? Is it because... Oh, no, no, it's not you at all. It's the man who's just arrived at the front door of the hotel. Ma'am? Yes, I dare say he's your nameless, dark, damn-your-eyes writer. Except that he doesn't happen to be nameless to me. His name is Nicholas Drury. Nicholas Drury? No. You can't mean... Just that. My husband as was. This holiday is going to be fun. Janet Drury. Alistair, <laughs> nice to see you again. Where have you been all these years? Oh, well, America, mostly. Well, Nick didn't tell me you were joining him here. Oh, Lord, Alistair, don't tell me you don't know. Know what? We got a divorce. When? Ages ago. You really hadn't heard? No, not a word. Oh, well, these things happen. It just didn't work out. I'm sorry, Janet. But, uh, what are you doing in this part of the world? I'm on holiday. Oh, Oh, by the way, have you met the Corrigans? No, not yet. Then I must introduce you. Oh, my name's Brooke, Alistair. Not Drury. Do remember. Not to worry. Uh, Hartley, Alma, this is a friend of mine, Janet Brooke. Janet, Mr. and Mrs. Corrigan. Uh, how do you do? I gather you and Miss Melling have already introduced yourselves. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to desert you two at dinner. Miss Brooke and I have known each other a longish time, and we've a lot to talk about. Is this your first visit to Sky, Miss Brooke? Yes, it is. I'm sure it won't be your last. There's Nick at the foot of the stairs. Oh, yes, uh, Nick. <clears throat> Hi, Nick. Hello. Look who's here. 
You do remember Janet Brooke? Janet Brooke? Uh, yes, of course I remember her. Hello, Janetta. How are you? Well, thank you. And you? Very fit, thanks. Another old friend, darling. Yes, Marcia. It seems my London life's catching up with me even here. You beg your pardon. I was daydreaming. I'm sorry if I startled you. Would you like some coffee? Yes, please. Black or brown? A uh, black stick. Why should you wait on me? Oh, nobody serves the coffee. They bring it all in on a huge tray and we each get our own. Oh, thanks for telling me. I shall... No, let me this time. Black, you said. Please. I've put a little sugar in. I hope... You that... are kind. You've just come, haven't you? Yes, this afternoon. Won't you sit down? I'm Roberta Simes, by the way. And I'm Jeanetta Brooke. We're walking, Marion and I. That's Marion. Marion Bradford over there with the Who Done It. Actually, we're sort of climbing. Are the Sky Hills the kind you sort of climb? Well, Marion's a climber, and I'm not. Though we're scrambling, which is a halfway solution. But I'm dying to learn. I'd like to climb every peak in the Cullen, including the inaccessible pinnacle. <laughs> a thoroughly unworthy ambition. Unworthy, Mr. Grant? Yes. That from you, of all people. Why unworthy? I'm sorry, I forgot you two haven't met. We have, in fact, on the ferry. Why unworthy, Roberta? I'll tell you. Just look at the hills. They've been there countless ages. But you, who've lived out a puny 20 years, talk about scaling them as if they were... Mole Hill. <laughs> <laughs> More of a challenge, surely. Mere men, or worse still, mere women, pitting themselves against the giants of time. Everest, for example. Exactly. How do you rate their chances, Mr. Grant? I think they're going to make it. Did I hear someone mention Everest? Any news yet? No, nothing further. Have you met Beagle? No. Oh, well, in that case. Uh, Ronald, come and join us. Well, he really can speak with some authority on climbing. Jeanette Brooke, this is Ronald Beagle. I did. I just stuck my neck out by saying that I reckon the Everest chaps are likely to pull it off this time. Would you agree, Ronald? <laughs> Depends on the weather. And, uh, going on the last report I heard, they're going to have it better than we look like having. Oh, no. And I wanted to start really climbing tomorrow. Quite determined to conquer the food ends, then. Quite, Mr. Gardner. Where do you intend to start, Miss Sun? Uh, Marion, what do you think? The best climbs are Bruachna Bannockstick and Bruachna Free, but they're too far away. Guardsman's within easy reach, but of course it's just plain dull. Oh, Marion, I'm sure Mrs. Corrigan's right. It doesn't look hard, and there must be a wonderful view. There's a wonderful view from every single peak of the coolings. Having climbed them all, Miss Bradford? If you mean do I know what I'm talking about, the answer is yes. As this discussion seems to have become a free-for-all, do you think I might... My dear Hubert, we are all ears. If I were you, Miss Simon... I've already I... made up my mind where we're going. We're going up Blarven. You did say Blarven, Miss Bradford. I did, Mr. Beagle. Is that, um, quite wise? It's easy enough from this end. Uh, quite, but, uh, well, if the weather is bad... Oh, a spot of rain won't hurt us. And if the mist threatens, we won't go. Look, isn't it time someone broke the hoodoo on that blasted mountain? Now I must get some fresh air. It's so stuffy in here. You're coming, Roberta. Okay, Marion. I think I'll follow Miss Bradford's example and have a walk. I wonder if you'd care to join me, Mrs. Corrigan. I'd have liked to very much, Miss Brooke, but... Uh, I've had all the exercise I need for one day. If you don't mind, Miss Brooke, I too could do with stretching my legs. Or would you prefer to be alone? I shall be glad of your company, Mr. Grant. If you want to climb unstrown, we'd better keep to the Blarven side of the glen. There's a bog farther on near the river. It isn't too pleasant. Even the deer avoid it. Uh, not walking too fast for you, am I? No. Is this your home, Mr. Grant? Oh, no. Well... My father was minister of Ochlechty, a little lost village at the back of the north wind. Uh, do you know it by any chance? I'm afraid not. Oh, you don't have to apologize. That's where I learned my mountain worship. I had no mother. My father was a well, remote kind of man who had very little time for me. It was miles to school, so as often as not, I just ran wild on the hills. You must have been a very lonely little boy. Hmm. I, I don't think I felt lonely until an uncle died and left us a lot of money. After that, I was sent to a public school. Bad luck. I hated it. And now you've spent your time climbing. Oh, pretty well. 
I travel a bit, but I always seem to end up here in May and June. Here, watch your step now. What? What was it? A cock grouse. Look. That's terrific. Larvan at its most impressive. I wonder if those two fool women will rarely go up there tomorrow. Is it a bad climb? Well, there are several nasty places, even there. Miss Bradford said she knew her way about. Yes, yeah, she did, didn't she? Mr. Grant? Hmm? What did Miss Bradford mean about a hoodoo on Blavon? What's wrong with it? Why does everyone shy off it as they do? Don't say you haven't noticed it. You don't know? Well, of course I don't know. I've only just arrived. Murder's what's wrong. Murder? Two and a half weeks ago. Happened on the 13th of May. A local girl was murdered on... On Blavin? Oh, no. On Blavin. Who was the girl? And who did it? We still don't know who did it. The girl's name was Heather McRae. Her father does some gillying for the hotel folks in the summer season. His crofts three or four miles up the strath. It, it seems that Heather was keeping company with a lad from the village, one James C. Farland. And so, when she took to staying out a bit later in the long summer evenings, her folks didn't worry about it. They thought she was with Jamesy. But she wasn't. And Jamesy says not. But then, in the circumstances, he would. And if it wasn't Jamesy, who could it have been? Jamesy says that he and Heather had a quarrel. Yes, yes, he admits it quite openly. He says she'd begun to avoid him. And when he tackled her about it, she flared up and said she was going to go in with a better chap than he was. A, a gentleman, Jamesy says she told him. A gentleman from the hotel. But that doesn't mean that the man from the hotel was necessarily the murderer. No, I suppose not. But what we do know is that Heather McRae went out on the evening of May the 13th to meet a man. She told her parents she had a date. On Blavin, you said? Yeah. This bit isn't nice, but I'd, I'd better tell you. At about midnight that night, some men were out late on Loch Scarve, approaching sea trout, I expect. Suddenly, they saw what looked like a great blaze of fire halfway up Blavin, and they decided to investigate. And found? Well, by the time they reached it, the fire was out, and it was only the tongue of smoke licking around the rock that guided them to it. They found a whitish ledge, easy enough to get to, with the remains of charred driftwood and birch, and heather blackened, and it seemed deliberately scattered all over the rock. Lying in the middle of the blackened patch was Heather McRae's body, oh. flat on its back. Could I have one of your cigarettes, please? I don't seem to have any on me. Yes, of course, here. Thank you. A light? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Do you want me to go on? I might as well know the lot, mightn't I? She wasn't very much burned, and she'd been murdered before she was laid on the fire. Her throat had been cut. Oh, dear God. She was fully clothed, and she was lying quite peacefully, it seemed, with her hands crossed on her breast. The oddest thing, though, w was that she was barefooted and all her jewellery had been taken off. Jewellery? Oh, not stolen. That was all there in a little pile in the corner of the ledge. Her shoes, leather belt, all the ornaments she'd been wearing, a ring, cheap bracelet, even a couple of hair slides, and, um... Oh, yes, and, and a brooch. It's odd, don't you think? And the police? Do they favour this Jamesy person or the gentleman from the hotel? Mm, God knows. Well, now perhaps you see why the nerves of your fellow guests are a little bit on edge. Yes, I do. I also understand why, whenever I mentioned Blavin, people reacted so strangely. I'm surprised that Major Persimmon didn't warn you guests of what was going on. I could hardly expect Persimmon to ruin his season by warning off intending guests. Well, I suppose not. Just tell me this. Mm -hmm. Which gentlemen were staying in the hotel on May the 13th? Uh... Oh, all those who are here now, with the exception of Miss Mayling's chauffeur. And which of you has an alibi? Uh, none of us that I know of. Colonel Cardry Simpson and Major Persimmon are vouched for by their respective wives, but that doesn't count for all that much, of course. But Corrigan and, and Brain were out fishing on Loch At midnight? Well, quite a lot of people do just that thing, you know. Then they were together? No. Now, they separated to fish different beats of the river after eleven. And they made their way back to the hotel separately in their own time. Mrs. Corrigan says her husband got in well before midnight. Did he let himself into the hotel? It's open all night. How convenient. And Mr. Hay, what about him? In bed. A very difficult alibi to break. Or to prove. 
It is, if one happened to be alone in it. My alibi happens to be the same. What's that? A can? That? Oh, no, no, that's a bonfire. A, a bonfire? Yes. It's for the local coronation celebrations. Oh. They've been building it for weeks back. Oh. Here, let's press on. Those are the lights of the hotel. It isn't as far away as you think. Oh, good. I suddenly realize that I'm tired, so I'm going to have a bath and turn in. Janet. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, Alistair. Please stop shining that torch in my face. I'm sorry, but what on earth are you doing down here at this time of the night? You're just about startling me out of my wits. You can imagine how I felt. Well, I was trying to cause as little disturbance as possible. I wish this hotel didn't have a blackout from midnight on. <laughs> well, you're in the Highlands, remember. Our host doubtless feels he's doing us proud by having a generator installed. At least it lets us have light at the touch of a switch up to the time when all decent folk should be abed. Don't forget your book when you go upstairs. You've been fishing, I suppose. Yes. Any luck? Mm, pretty fair. But Hart caught a beauty. Hart? Mm. Oh, Hartley Corrigan. Oh, where's he got to? To his bed, I should think. He came back a good two hours ahead of me. I just had some good risers, so I decided to stay on. Uh, strictly illegal, you know, so don't give me away. But that can't be right. What can't? I'm sure I heard him minutes before you came in. Someone was out there in the porch. They messed around for a bit, then went away. Mm. Oh, that would be Jamesy you heard. Jamesy? Yes, Jamesy Farlane. He was with us, but I told him not to wait for me. He had the longest way to go, you see. And then it would be him I caught a glimpse of. I went to the window and I saw someone striding along the road. Yes, that'd be Jamesy. Well, did you think it was a burglar? But we don't have to worry about such urban horrors here, Janet. No, only murderers. Who told you? Roderick Grant. I see. Worried? Naturally. Well, the police are still working on it, and they don't let up, you know. Alice, did you think Jamesy Farland did it? Or do you think it's someone staying here? I just don't know. When I came in, I asked you a question which you still haven't answered. What brought you down here at this late hour? I'd remembered I'd left my handbag where I'd been sitting before I went for a walk. By the time we got back, I'd other things on my mind, so I forgot to pick it up. Well, it would have been perfectly safe till morning. But I needed it, Alistair. In the middle of the night? Yes, my tablets were in it. Tablets? I turned in quite early, but I thought I was never going to get to sleep. However, I must have dozed, then bang, I was wide awake again with a thumping headache. Oh, poor you. I wasn't really sorry to be awake. I'd had a horrible nightmares. Fire seemed to be the theme. Fire at midnight. On Blarven. Then I lay thinking about a gentleman from the hotel. So you crept down here and were scared stiff by me. Too bad, Janet. I'd been frightened before that. There was the prowler in the porch. But I was upset anyway. Mm, understandably. As Grant had No, not just to... a murder, Alistair. As I was tiptoeing along the corridor, I heard voices coming from one of the bedrooms. Marcia Mailings, a woman's voice and a man's. Now, Janet, you're a big girl. You know that sort of thing goes on, especially when there's someone like the mailing around. Earlier on, I'd seen her and Nicholas in the corridor, and they weren't just discussing the weather. Now, that doesn't prove that it was Nick who was in her bedroom. And in any case, He's Janet... no longer my husband, so what he does is no concern of mine. Is that what you were about to tell me? I think you should go back to bed, my dear, and try to get some sleep. Take a couple of your tablets. <laughs> know something? I've just realised my headache's back. Miss Brooke, I believe you said you would like to try your hand at fishing. Yes, I did. But I think I might wait a day or two. No, just as you like, of course. But you'd maybe care to fix up a time with uh, Duke McRae here. What about Wednesday, then? Ah, uh, Wednesday's a free day, so it'll be suiting fine. Where shall I put you down for, Dugo? Uh, the upper beat, Major, and now if you'll excuse me, I'll be on my way or I'll be late for the trip. Uh, good day to you, miss. Uh, good day, Major. Good day, Dugo. I wonder if I've time for a breath of air before I go through to the dining room. There's no hurry, Miss Brooke. Mr. Brooke, my name's Hay, Hubert Hay. How do you do, Mr. Hay? I hope you don't mind my speaking to you, but the fact is, I want to ask a favour. Yes? Yes, you see, 
I'm a writer. I'm a writer of travel books, Miss Brooke. That's why I'm here. I see. Collecting material. Yes, I go for walks and then write about them. How very original. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I shall look out for your books, Mr. Hay. I'll send you one. That would be most kind of you. I've been looking at these, Miss Brooke. I pinched them from the lounge, a couple of dotties. I've a photographic memory, Miss Brooke. Have you? How extremely... As soon as I clapped eyes on you last night, I knew I'd seen the face before in something I'd leafed through recently. So I did a little bit of research. It is your photo that's in these, isn't it? <laughs> Full marks, Mr. Hay. I take photographs for my books. I thought if I took a picture of the cool inns, I'd like to put a lady in the foreground. Well, of course you may photograph her, Mr. Hay. That's very kind of you. If it clears up, how about this afternoon on Skirmish Tree with the Coolins behind? It's a date, then. I can't begin to tell you how grateful it I am to... It is a pleasure. But will the three you've taken be enough? Oh, yes, thank you. Miss Brooke, would you take it amiss if I said something to you? Of course not. You're here, on Sky, I mean, solo, aren't you? Yes, I am. Then don't go out alone with anyone, Miss Brooke. It isn't safe. You don't mind my saying so? No, I don't mind. Funny, though. Funny, peculiar. What is? I expect you know that Heather McRae claimed to have been associating with one of the gentlemen from the hotel. That means, of course, that one of them could have been her murderer. I know that, Miss Brooke. Oh, the, the whole thing's damnable. That girl was only 18. It was actually her birthday. It upset me a lot, Miss Brooke. You see, I knew her. Well? Oh, no, no, not intimately, as you might say. I'd stopped at the McRae's Croft a couple of times and she'd made me a pot of tea. She was a pretty youngster and full of life. You didn't get any hint of who it was from the hotel that she was going with? Oh, but that's a silly question. If you'd had any notion of who it was, you'd have told the police. You're right, but... But? Oh, nothing, really. There's something at the back of your mind, Mr. Hay. She did drop a hint, didn't she? A very little one. I told her that I was writing a book, of course. And then I asked if there wasn't still a bit of witchcraft going on in the island, like there used to be. Suddenly she shut up like a clam and pretty near hustled me out of the kitchen. Witchcraft? That's absurd. Absurd, no doubt. But I can't help having a feeling about this murder. It must all have been carefully planned, you see. There were branches of birch wood and a big chunk of oak, hardly charred, and a, a lot of that dry fungus, algorithm it's called, that you find on birch trees. Oh, God. Then, when he was ready, he got the girl up there. There was the fire and the shoes and things in a neat pile, and the girl laid out with her throat cut and her hands crossed on her breast, and ash on her face like, like a sacrifice. But only a madman. Whoever well, did it must be crazy, and yet most of the time seem as sane as you or me. So I wouldn't go for a walk with anyone if I were you. I won't, I promise. In fact, I'm beginning to think I might go back to London. It wouldn't be a bad idea at that. And now I'm... I'm sure you'll be wanting to get back to the hotel. I say we're a bit thin on the ground, aren't we? Claimers not back yet? They weren't in the dining room. Well, I hope there's nothing you miss, Mrs. Oh, Collins. woman, she shouldn't have gone climbing on a day like this. Copy us. Do you mind clearing the table, Janet? The tray's heavier than you It's only that awful Thanks. woman hasn't gone and done a silliness just to impress do that Do you think she'd do anything rash, Mr. Grant? Miss Bradford doesn't take kindly to advice, but she's actually a very accomplished climber. I'm sure she wouldn't take any chances with a mere beginner like Miss Symes. After all, Ronald Beagle set out to climb Scorden and Geelan, and he certainly wouldn't have gone in unfavourable conditions. He's not back either, Mr. Grant. Uh, where's your husband, Mrs. Corrigan? He? Oh, he went out walking. Yes, we set out to walk up to the ridge for the view over Loch Slap, and I brought Mrs. Corrigan back, but Hart decided to go a bit further. Uh, did you see any sign of the two women, then, on Blavin? No, we didn't, but we saw someone. I believe it was you, Nicholas, in the distance. No, I wasn't on Blavin, so I saw nothing of them either. I think I'll have a word with Persimmon. They may have told him that they intended being late. Where did you go today, Marcia? To Four Tree, darling. I got some marvellous tweed, sort of purple and... Ah, our dear Roderick is returning to our midst. I'll show you later. Roderick, darling, what did the Major say? That there's no earthly reason for undue anxiety, but... But? No, I, I don't much like the look of that sky. You're not damn music. The Colonel's determined not to miss the latest about Everest. 
It was really rather a dear. I'd hate him to be disappointed. But you know, I've the oddest sort of feeling about Everest. I believe I'd be almost sorry to hear that the summit has been reached. Really? I've always thought of it as a sort of remote, white, unattainable fastness. Immaculate, as it were. Exactly. I think it'll be rather a pity to see human footprints in the snow. Oh, I didn't know you had this vein of poetry in you, Jeanetta. You appear to have developed quite a flair for overhearing what wasn't intended for your ears. Watch it, Nicholas. I didn't. I don't think you know Miss Brooke well enough to make such a personal remark. You know, Grant, I'm not sure that I'm all that much interested in what you think. And if I'm mistaken, our friend Beagle is returning to base. Alone? Yes, alone. That's strange. What is, Nicholas? Well, he's coming down the glen from the loch. I was under the impression that he was going up Skuanangili, and that being so, wouldn't it have been easier for him to come down the west side of the glen? Well, it's certainly a short cut, but the going's terrible. Anyhow, he'll be here in a matter of minutes, so we'll know then if you saw any sign of the two women. We were all pinning our hopes on your having caught a glimpse of them, Beagle. So when you told us you hadn't... Oh, he's made you for a good one. Can I have your attention for a moment? Now, I don't want to be an alarmist, but, well, I think we'd better go out and look for them. Your husband, Mrs. Colligan, has just returned, and Dougal McRae is with him. They saw nothing of the two ladies when they were coming through the glen. Can we be certain they went up, Bluff? Certain. Can we be as certain as all that, Major? I mean, we know that that's what Miss Bradford planned to do, but they might have changed their minds. They went up Blarvin, all right. They were seen on it. Seen? When? Whereabouts? At the Spooten Do. My God, man. The Black Spud's no place for a beginner. Black Spud? Are you sure, Pursuant? Yes, I'm sure, Mr. Beagle. Who saw him, though? Dougal McRae. He saw them making for the gully at about four o'clock. All three of them. All three? Well, Dougal is positive there were three. Yet everybody's back here. Well, that's odd, isn't it? Well, perhaps the third member of the party was a local, someone they'd arranged to act as a guide. They set off without one, Drury. Gentlemen, could you be ready in ten minutes? My wife is preparing coffee and sandwiches for us to take with us. Uh, couldn't we help Mrs. Persimmon? Oh, that would be very good of you, Mrs. Corrigan. Jeanetta, shall we... Jeanetta? Sorry, Marcia, I was thinking. And about something distinctly ghastly, to judge by your expression. About Dougal McRae's story. Three climbers, Marcia, three. I wonder if the third could have been... Who? Oh, James E. Farland. Why him, Jeanetta? What would he have been doing with them? I don't know. I don't know, Marcia. That's what I find so worrying. Mind if I join you, Marcia? Where are the others? Gone upstairs. I thought you'd be in here, so I bought a drink for us both. Oh, you perfect angel. Oh, isn't it an utterly foul night? It certainly is. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Jeanetta. Do you believe there's a hoodoo on that mountain? Lava? Oh, of course not. The women will turn up all right. But that other climber, whoever it was, he certainly wasn't a ghost. That Roberta child's rather sweet. Pathetic, too, in a way. The other I find pathetic. Frustrated, my dear. She's in love with Roderick Grant, you know. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> I think I shall go to bed shortly. I do likewise. Janetta? Yes? Would you like to see the piece of tweed I bought? Yes, I would. Just a sec, that I'm the switch. <gasps> ah! Marcia, for God's sake, what's the matter? The bed. Look, the bed. But it's just a doll, Marcia. Its throat's been cut and there's ash scattered over it. The murderer's been here. news, Major. Oh, no, I'm afraid. I just phoned the local rescue team and we should all be out again by nine. I'd like to help. Well, you and Mrs. Corrigan could tackle the area of Scree and Heather bordering the Black Spout. And we're leaving at nine? That's right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have things to see to. Doesn't the hotel look far away from here? And Miss Mailing's rolls. I suppose it would have been too much to expect her to come along with us. But surely she could have allowed her chauffeur to join in the search. Every available man is. She's leaving. Leaving? She's returning to London. I can't pretend that I'm broken-hearted to see her go. You'd understand how I feel about her if you were a married woman, Janetta. 
partly been following her around like a lapdog ever since she came, and I've been made to feel and look a fool. Why should he be allowed to get away with it? Do you or do you not wish to keep your husband, Alma? Of course I want to keep him. Then let him be. If you want him, then you must shut up. I can't. Well, we're getting out of touch with the others. Let's get going. Give me a hand, Janet. That's right. Over this way. Not too near the edge. Oh. They'll get to them soon, if Dougal was right. But, Alistair, they can't still be alive. Well, they could be if they managed to creep into shelter. Do you really believe there were three of them, Alistair? Dougal McRae isn't given to flights of fancy. Are any of the local men missing? I'm told not. Then the third climber must be someone from the hotel. Yet no one's missing from there either. Exactly so. And if no one from the hotel reported the accident, then it means... Just that. Oh, you've made it, Miss Brooke. Good for you. Just. <laughs> what happens now, Mr. Grant? If Dougal McRae was right, and they're starting to work their way across the spot, then the first move is to do likewise. Did you get this far last night? Uh, yes, but it was dark by then. Oh, it makes me dizzy just to look down there. Is it a very bad place to climb? It's bad enough for anyone with a bit of experience, but for a beginner, sheer lunacy. Can the men get down into the gully if, if they have to, Mr. Grant? Oh, yes. Beagle and Rodri McDowell are prepared to go. Look, the others have begun to rope themselves together. Yeah, I'd better join them. It looks as though someone's had the bright idea of searching the hillside and scree on this side of the gully. What shall I do? Wait here, if you don't mind. If they find them injured, you might be able to help. It looks as though Mr. Beagle's work flown to the far side of that overhang and, and Roderick's up to, onto the ledge he was on. He ain't been moving up any minute now. Maybe they've seen something down below. Uh, maybe, but I hope they had sense enough not to let the lassie try that place. They, Dooku? Wasn't it you who said that there were three climbers? Aye, uh, there were three, sure enough. And the third one, was it a man or a woman? Well, at that distance I couldn't be sure, but I could see that one of them had a red jacket on. His signs had a red anorak. Roderick McDowell's pointing. He's seen something. Oh, God, no, please. Please let them both... Uh, steady, must know. Steady. It won't be long now till we know. I can't bear not knowing. I'm going to join the main party. Put the stretcher down for a minute, lads. Oh, my God! Would you look at that? I'm looking, Bill. And I wish I didn't see what I see. What is it, Major? We know she's dead, poor soul. So there can't be anything worse. She fell from that slab. The rope's still around her body, or at any rate, part of it. It broke, you mean? The rope was cut. Cut clean through. I don't understand, Major. Oh, it's easily enough understood, Mrs. Corrigan. Someone cut the rope deliberately. And Miss Bradford fell to her death. Murder? What... What about Roberta Sines? Uh, she hasn't been found yet, Giannetta. Miss Brooke. Janet. What on earth are you doing up here alone? You should have gone back to the hotel with the others. Tomorrow bells will ring out for the coronation. And bonfires will be lit. Bonfires, Roderick. The children have been building for weeks back, prepared for a celebration, not for... A sacrificial right. I know how you feel. Oh, you look exhausted. Please take my advice. Go back to the hotel. But we've got to find Roberta. Another night on the hill. I doubt if another night's going to make any difference to her, Janet. She must be alive, Roderick. Don't you see? If she'd fallen into the gully with Miss Bradford, she'd have been found. Dougal McRae said she could have been stuck higher up on a ledge or something. There must be places near the top of the gully. We've combed the upper gully twice over. There was no sign of her, Janet. She must be somewhere. She must be hurt. Or she would have answered you. And if she was hurt, she couldn't have gone far unless... Roderick, you saw Marion's climbing rope. It was cut. Not a shadow of doubt, I'm afraid. That can only mean one thing, can't it? Yes. Murder, again. Yet Dougal swears there was a third climber there. If he's to be believed. Oh, I think he is. If anyone in this world said dependable, I'd say it was Dougal McRae. If there wasn't a third person there, then it was Roberta who cut the rope, and that's fantastic. Oh, but what is it? 
You can't possibly be. She was a beginner. If, if Miss Bradford fell and the girl thought she was pulling a dime after her, she could have easily got into a panic and... I can't accept that, and neither can you. Uh, no, no, I, I can't, but it's a possible theory. So the third climber cut the rope. He was there when Marion Bradford fell. And now Roberta can't be found. Look, Janet. Beagle and McDowell are coming back up from the hotel. They may have heard something. The others are cutting across to meet them. Can you assure me that each of those caves and fissures were searched by at least two of you? What exactly are you suggesting, Brain? My question was put to Beagle, not you, Grant. I, however, have just put one to you. What are you suggesting? I overheard you, Brain, and I think it was a pretty rotten thing to imply. But he's right, you know. It could quite easily be one of us. But why should it be in the murderer's interest to continue to conceal the second body after the first had been discovered? It would certainly be in the murderer's interest to be the first to find her if she were alive. But he could silence her. But he didn't. Every crevice in that gully was searched solo and otherwise by all of us. All right, all right, forget it. I suppose I'm a bit on edge. And we all. Giannetta, get back to the hotel at once. I can't, Nicholas. I can't give up yet. I couldn't bear having nothing to do but wait and listen with the Cowdery Simpsons for the latest news of the Everest climbers. Well, Drew is right, Miss Brooke. You should get back a rest. I'm trying to find some way of taking your mind off this unfortunate business. <laughs> By the way, since your mention of Everest reminds me, they've done it. <laughs> You hear that, you chaps? The news came through a short time ago. They've reached the summit. Now, see here, Giannetta. Leave her alone. What the hell do you mean? What I said, Drury. I'm no use here, so I'm going back to the hotel now. I'll pack the flasks and mugs and take them down. Are you... you're quite sure? Yes, I'll be all right. This picnic basket's not at all heavy. You go and help the others. And Roderick... Yes, Janet? Please find her, won't you? Eyes on ground. Mustn't trip. Break ankle. Leg. A leg like Roberta. Marion. God, no. No. Oh, please. Not storm again. Roberta lying cold. Just bees. Carrying smell. Smells. Smells of what? Heather. Peat. Pog myrtle. Something else. What else? Wood smoke. Smoke. Bonfire. Yes, gunfire, lit, flames, rising. Oh, oh, his coronation. No, no, too soon. Fire. Pyre, pyre. Robert. Robert. Robert! What? Pull her off! Oh, thank God. Somebody here. Help me, please. Are you all right, Miss? Yes. Yes. I'm a fire. It's your fire. Let me know, lass. You're safe now. You're safe. <laughs> Mr. Corrigan. Is she dead? It's not Roberta Sines. It's Beagle. And someone has cut his throat. <laughs> Miss Brooke, is it not? Yes. I'm Inspector Mackenzie, and this is Sergeant Monroe. Uh, draw up a chair for Miss Brooke, Hector. Yes, sir. Well, now, Miss Brooke, I've jotted down one or two wee bits of information. Uh, maybe we can check it. I'd be glad to help, Inspector. You are Miss Brooke, of course? Yes. Uh -huh. You arrived here on Saturday afternoon? Yes. Uh, before you came here, had you heard anything about the murder of Heather McCray? No. Not even read about it in the papers? Not that I recollect. Now, I understand it was you who found Mr. Beagle's body on the bonfire last night. I was first on the scene, but I don't know who pulled him off the fire. When was it you first noticed that the fire was burning? Not until I was quite near. I'd been aware, subconsciously, of the smell of wood smoke in the air. Then when I looked up, I saw the flames. And realised someone had lit the bonfire? That's right, Inspector. Then? I saw a shadow, like a man's, near it. I take it you didn't recognize him? No. No! Was he carrying or holding our body, then? Oh, no, he was just moving about on the fringe of the smoke. It was billowing here and there, you know, as the breeze caught it. I screamed and ran towards the bonfire. I 
I saw there was something, a body on top of it. I was trying to reach it before the flames did when the murderer attacked me. Uh, in actual fact, it was James E. Farlin who grabbed you. Well, I know that. You... Now, let's get it right. You realize, no doubt, that Mr. Beagle cannot have been killed long before you found him. You met or passed no one at all on your way down. Not a soul. So the last time you saw Mr. Beagle alive was when the group split up for the final search last night. I... Are you allowed to ask a leading question, Inspector? Now, did you? Yes. Did you see which way he went? Downhill. Alone? Yes. Sure? Quite sure. I see. Now, let's get back to the bonfire, shall we? You ran towards it screaming. There was an answering shout from close behind, I think you said. Yes. Did you recognize the voice? No, not at the time. But later, I assumed it was Alistair, uh, Mr. Brain, who shouted, because it was he who pulled James E. Farlin off me. He must have got there pretty quickly. Uh, Mr. Alistair Brain, then, was the first on the scene. And there was Dougal McRae, too. Who else, Miss Brooke? Uh, Mr. Corrigan. He dragged the body off uh, he and Alistair may have come down the hillside together. Ah, uh, that they didn't. They arrived independently. Who else was there? So far as I know, Inspector, no one else. Mm-hmm, just so. You uh, booked your room, Miss Brooke, in the name of Drury, Mrs. Nicholas Drury. That is my name. Then why did you change it in the visitor's book almost as soon as you got here? And why have you and your husband been at such pains to behave as though you were comparative strangers to one another? Because he's not my husband. We were divorced some time ago. I didn't know he was here, and when I saw him that evening, I was horribly embarrassed. I understand. But to avoid awkwardness all round, I changed my maiden name. I'm sorry if I've distressed you, Miss Brooke, but uh, you have been very helpful. But why all this questioning, Inspector? You've got the murderer. Got the murderer? James E. Farlan, of course. He was at the bonfire and he attacked me there. What more do you want? A bit more, Miss Brooke. Farlan's story is that he was near the foot of Aunt Throne when he saw the bonfire go up. He came back up the slope as fast as he could and uh, was just about at the top when he heard you scream. Then you came running and so he says, flung yourself at the fire. He thought you were going to get burned, so he grabbed you and hauled you back. You struggled like mad and you both fell to the ground. Uh, wasn't that his way of it, Hector? Aye, uh, that's right, Inspector. Any comment, miss? Only that it might be the truth. Aye, so it might. Especially as Dougal McRae was with them at the time. Oh, well, that's all for now, Miss Brooke. Uh, you'll be uh, about all day, I take it? I'll be on the hill myself, Inspector. There's still someone missing, you know. I hadn't forgotten. Hello, Mr. Hay. Hello there. Doesn't this sunshine make a difference? Yesterday, under that lowering sky, it, it seemed the right sort of setting for a tragedy, but today... And yet Roberta Syme's body is somewhere up here. Well, we can't be sure that she's dead. After two nights and a day, she must be. But we've still got to find her. If only to help the police hunt down this madman. You're convinced that he's insane? Well, only a maniac would go in for two elaborate ritual killings. He must be caught, Mr. A. He will be, I'm sure. Ah, looks as though those chaps seem to have abandoned the Black Spout for the time being. Do, do you suppose they found her? Doesn't look like it. I'd better get across. Coming, Miss Brooke? No, I'll carry on on my own. In which direction? Up by the Black Spout. But that area's had a pretty thorough going over. Have you ever had the feeling that although others have looked and looked for something and failed to find it, you simply must satisfy yourself that it isn't there? Yes, I have. Well, don't you get lost. I'll try not to, Mr. Hay. Oh, what oh, idiot to come here. I should have joined me. Rest. No, not again. Keep on going. What gleaming among roots, shining like silver. Brooch. I'm sure I've seen one like that before. I saw someone wearing one exactly the same. Of course. Roberta. Now try and think. Think. Be rational. 
Oh, others have given up through useless research. I must carry on till I drop. Ledge. Can't possibly. It's too narrow. Must. Must. Roberta could... Roberta? A cave. A little cave. Oh, Roberta. Roberta. Child, child, you're safe now. You're safe now. Who's that? My God, you found her. Oh, Roderick. Thank heavens. Oh, what a fright I got when I heard your footsteps. And she's alive. Alive? Yes, yes, she is. I heard her moaning. Yes, yes, she's alive, but only just, I'd say. I'll stay with her, Roderick. You go and get the others. You'll go far faster than I could. Uh, Janet, I left my haversack at the other end of the ledge. My brandy flask's in the pocket. Fetch it, will you? Mm, Okay. Uh, Did did you catch what she said? It sounded like Marion killed. It was... Roderick, I think she knows who who did it. You're right. And by heaven, she's going to stay alive till she tells us. Get that brandy, please. I'll try and ease her into a less cramped position. Yeah. Oh, once she's had a sip of brandy, that brandy, if we can get it over her throat, you'll get along to the end of the ledge and yell bloody murder till someone comes. Then if you don't like the look of whoever comes, you'll just yell bloody murder for me. Now hurry. Okay, just let me tuck her hands in. Roderick, her eyelids... She's coming too. It's Jeanette, my dear. Oh, oh, what a pity. She's passed out again. Poor youngster, she... Roderick, did you notice the way she looked? Oh, just now, do you mean? Yes. She opened her eyes wide for a second or two. And it, it was as though she saw something that terrified her. But what? Roderick, there's someone out there. On the ledge. Coming this way. See it is. Oh, oh it's, it's Corrigan and Drury. Oh, y- yes, and Brain. Mrs. Corrigan's bringing up the rear. We found her, Corrigan. One of you will have the nearest party with a stretcher. She's alive. It won't be long now till we have her back at the hotel. Oh, thank heaven for that. Roderick. Hmm? I've only just realized that Roberta has only to recover enough to speak... And a man, a man staying at the hotel, is going to be charged with a double murder. I'm putting Constable Neil on to guard you, lassie. The district nurse is away to a tricky maternity case on the other side of the island, so we'll not be seeing her before the morning. And that raises a question. Who's going to look after Miss Symes in the meantime? Do you know anything about nursing? Not much, I'm afraid. Uh, but enough, maybe, to keep an eye on Miss Sachs. Well, I... Would you stay with her tonight and watch her for me? I'm willing enough to try, but surely there's someone more competent. Uh, hasn't it struck you, miss, that you are the only woman in the hotel who wasn't here at the time of the first murder? But, Inspector, you can't suspect a woman, surely. Uh, maybe not, but Mrs. Corrigan and Mrs. Persimmon have husbands. And I want no one in that room the girl's in who's in any way involved. No one on any pretext whatsoever, you follow me? Uh, oh, uh, when I came down from having a look at Miss Symes, uh, Mrs. Persimmon and Mrs. Cowdery Simpson were attending to her. I understood you said you didn't want anyone near Robert who was in any way involved. Ah, uh, there's no danger with the two women there. Anyhow, Neil's around. Neil? Oh, the constable who's to be my watchdog. Uh, one of them, anyway. Sergeant Monroe and I will never be far away. How's Roberta now, Mrs. Cardi Simpson? Well, there's not much change. We've made her as comfortable as can be. All we can do now is wait for the doctor. Does Inspector Mackenzie really expect the murderer to try and get in here? Yeah, he wouldn't be knowing what the inspector thinks, ma'am. Well, what do you think, Constable Neal? The murderer knows that if she talks, we've got him. Oh, I've been looking for you, Janet. I went out for a breath of fresh air. 
The doctor's examined her, hasn't he? Yes. How does he rate her chances? He seems to think she has a goodish chance. She's still unconscious, of course. I'm afraid so, Roderick. Well, there was nothing really I could usefully do, so I felt I was better out of the way. She's in your room, isn't she? Yes. Well, where have they put you, Janet? Oh, I'm not moving rooms. The inspector wants me to stay there tonight. As a sort of night nurse? Sort of. But Janet, I'm not happy about you having to... I'll be all right, Roderick. Oh, does the inspector think there's still a threat to Roberta? I believe so. But Roberta will be safe enough, and by the same token, so will I, so don't worry. Oh, very well, then I won't. As a matter of fact, I've a hunch that you're the only person in the hotel who isn't endangered from the murderer. Roderick, I know how horrible it must be for all of you, this feeling that you're a suspect. I think I'd like a drink. Will you join me? So long as you let me buy you one. What will you have, Janet? Yes, sherry, please. Medium. I'll get them from the bar. It saves time. Okay. I'll be in the lounge. I hope the police can protect that poor girl from the, the beast that's loose among us. Oh, there is a murderer in this room. You can't get away from that fact. Not necessarily, Mrs. Cowdery Simpson. Grant, Drury, Major Persimmon, not to mention James E. Farlane, aren't here. They lengthen the odds more than a little. I hope this is to your taste, Janet. Oh, you're back, Roderick. I didn't see you come in. Perhaps neither did Brain. I am here now. How does that affect the odds? And what odds? Well, it seems we're beginning to take seriously the idea that someone in this hotel is a murderer. Drink okay, Janet? Yes, thanks. I imagine the police can be relied on to get on with their job. If they only look after Roberta Seidman's properly, she'll do it for them. A police officer will be watching her all night, and I'm staying with her too. Actually, she's in my room. Won't you be frightened? I don't think so, Mrs. Corrigan. By the way, where's Mr. Drury? Gone to the garage, I think, to fetch a book from his car. Why so interested, Miss Brooke? Has the inspector asked you to spy on us? Oh. Mrs. Corrigan, it's... It's all right, Roderick. Mrs. Corrigan's suggestion isn't really so outrageous. I'm certainly cooperating with the police, as I hope we all are. And if that means giving the inspector an account of anyone's movements at any time, I'll do so. Good for you, Miss Brooke. I second that, uh, Once a man puts his hand to murder, he's automatically an outcast. That's a strong statement, sir. All the same, it's absurd that we should all be treated as suspects. The police must have some idea who did it. If they haven't now, they certainly will have as soon as Roberta Sines can speak. Oh, oh sorry. It's, oh, it's you, is it? Why, it's our little copper's knock. Don't you dare speak to me like that, Nicholas Drury. You've got no right. So, my sweet Giannetta, you keep telling me. Where were you going in such a hurry? It's none of your damned business. It's anyone's business in this murderous locality to stop you wandering about on your own. And where's your gallant with the golden hair? Why isn't he playing you bodyguard? You always did have a nasty tongue. Yes, I did, didn't I? But I'm quite serious as it happens. You're altogether too fond of wandering about this place alone. Or with someone you don't really know. Aren't you scared? I wasn't until now. <laughs> so you're afraid I'll kill you, Giannetta Mia. Do you really think I'll do it, Gianetta? And all for what? Do you need a reason? What's your proof? I haven't any. If you had, would you hand me over? I... I don't know, Nicholas. You were my wife. I know that, but... You always used to say that you didn't believe in divorce. It wasn't my fault we got divorced. Even so, according to what you used to preach, you should still think of yourself as bound to me. Do you still? Now? Now? I don't follow. No. I was harking back to the blonde boyfriend. Damn you, Nicholas. Oh, you've got a tricky problem, haven't you, Gianetta? Loyalty versus civic duty, or is it old love versus the new? It would simplify matters for you emotionally, I mean, if you could hand me over to the law this very minute. If I were still your wife, legally, I shouldn't help to incriminate you, even if I could. You see, as your wife, I'd feel identified with you in all you did, but I'd leave you. I couldn't stay with you, knowing that you were... Cain? Uh, yes. And as things are? As things are, I don't know, God damn you. Now, let me buy. The uh, doctor left instructions, Miss Brooke. I've written them down for you. They're on the bedside table. Uh, mostly it's a matter of keeping the patient in the room warm. And the doctor's off to a confinement. But if there are any problems, I have to ring up the Broadford Hospital for advice. So if I'm worried about anything, I send Constable Neal for you. Uh, no, use the phone there. I'm occupying what was Miss Mayring's room. Uh, Constable, you know what you have to do, yes, don't you? Sir. Yes, sir. All right. 
Uh, Sergeant Monroe will relieve you at 2 a.m., and I'll be along now and again to make sure everything's in order. Uh, let me see. All right, the window. Uh, I see there's a mist coming down, a pity. Anyhow, that's the window snipped. Uh, you have a long night ahead of you, but a safe one, I hope. Oh, uh, one thing more. Major Persimmon will keep the generator running all night, so the lighting will be on. Try to get some rest, miss. Neil will let you know right away if Miss Simon stirs. Very well, Inspector. I'll say good night, then. Good night. Uh, Constable Neil. Yes, sir. As soon as I go out, you'll lock the door. Understood? What is it, Sergeant? Roberta, is oh, she... Oh, she's scarcely stead since you refilled the hot water bottles. But you were having a nightmare. You were muttering. And I thought you'd rather I woke you. I'm worried about the fire, too. What about the fire? It's almost out, miss. Oh, so we'd better get it going again. The doctor said the room must be kept warm. Ah. We should have asked Mrs. Persimmon for some wood to help us keep the fire going. Would I go and get some, then? I can't find where it's kept. When I was having a look around earlier on, I saw a pile in a shed at the back. Should you go, do you think? Well, either I go or that fire goes out. Well, if I turn the key in the door and don't open till you get back, there'll be no harm done. But I must be sure that it's you I open it for. I'll give a knock like this. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, Daddy, oh. Go on, burn, confound you. You're mm-hmm. all right, my pet. All right. But you must be covered. That's it, child. Rest. Is that you, Sergeant Monroe? No, it's Inspector Mackenzie. Unlock the door, lad. Just a minute, Inspector. I must finish remaking Roberta's bed. Mackenzie here. What is it? Quickly. He's at the door. Oh, hurry, hurry, please. Inspector. Where the devil have you been, Sergeant? To get wood, sir. Oh, you're hell up, have you? Mm-hmm. Now, Miss Brooke, are you there? This is Inspector Mackenzie, and Sergeant Monroe is with me. Go on, man, tell her you're here. I wanted to be sure that there are two of us and that we're who we say we are. It's me, miss, and I've got the wood. I'll knock. Okay, I'll unlock now. Uh, don't you touch that handle, nor this side of the door. Glad to see you, uh, Inspector. Close the door. The maid. Uh, you sit down there, miss. It's all right. I'll hear all about it in a minute or two. Don't you bother trying to talk just yet. Oh. Sergeant, get the fingerprinting equipment from my room and get the outside of that door a good going over. Right, sir. Inspector Mackenzie, do you know who the murderer is? I could make a pretty good guess, but we've no real proof as yet. And if that lassie on the bed there doesn't tell us something soon, I'm afraid of what may happen next. You take tonight, for instance. He took a desperate chance and very nearly got away with it. He'll tempt his luck once too often. He's not just lucky, Miss Brooke. He's diabolically cool. Did you feel up to finishing your watch, Miss Brooke? Yes, of course. Good. But uh, don't send Sergeant Monroe away again for anything. I won't, Inspector. Have you something to help you pass the time, then? Mm, I found a book, Golden Bough. Golden Bough? Uh, Isn't that about primitive religions? I wouldn't know. I'll not be on the end of the telephone, miss. I've one or two things to do, but don't worry. Sergeant Monroe will be back in a minute, and I'll not leave you till he comes. You're sure you'll get him, Inspector? Oh, yes. We'll get him. Uh, What is it, Miss Brooke? The Golden Bough. The book you saw me with last night. I put a marker in the bit I'd like you to read. Uh, Central Highlands Bonfires, 1st of May, Human Sacrifice, Island of Sky, Very Combustible... Where did you find this? In the lounge. And when did you read this passage? Last night, after you'd gone. I was just browsing through. Do you know whose book this was? I... uh, No. Uh, You had other things to tell me, I believe. Uh, No, Miss Brooke, what was it you thought I ought to know? The cut climbing rope. Yes? On my first night here, 
I lay awake for hours. I came downstairs to the lounge in search of my handbag. While I was there, I spoke to Alistair Brain. But before that, I'd heard someone in the porch, almost certainly James E. Farland. Well, Alistair told me then that Mr. Corrigan had been fishing with them and had already come back to the hotel. Later, his wife said he didn't get in until three o'clock, but it was half past two when I spoke to Alistair Brain. What you're really trying to tell me is that each of these three men, Farlan, Brain and Corrigan, had the opportunity to tamper with the women's climbing ropes on the night before the climb. Yes, I suppose so. Then where does Dougal McRae's third climber come in? He might be innocent and just be frightened. Hmm. Had you anything more to tell me? Well... There was Miss Mayling's doll. Oh, but maybe you know about it. Yes, I do, as it happens. Mrs. Corrigan told me about it. She did it to frighten Miss Mayling away from the hotel for, uh, well, for reasons of her own. Well, it appears to have worked. Quite so. Is there anything else? No, Inspector. You're lying to me, aren't you? No. Lassie, Lassie, I think you told me a lie last night, didn't you? A lie? You <laughs> said you hadn't guessed who the murderer was. Do you really believe that a woman of Marion Bradford's experience wouldn't have noticed that the rope was damaged when she put it on? Do you really think that the rope was damaged in the hotel porch that night? No. I'll tell you how we think this murder was done. You realize, of course, that Roberta Symes never climbed the Sputandu at all. No? Well, you found her. Was there a rope in her body? No. No, there wasn't. Of course, I see it now. If she'd been middle man on the rope... The murderer couldn't have cut it between her and Marion. We think he contrived to meet Marion Bradford and the girl on Blavin. He suggested doing the climb with Miss Bradford, Roberta being left to spectate. When he got Miss Bradford out of sight... He could cut the rope then without, without being seen. Just so. From where she was watching, Roberta Symes would see what appeared to be an accident, her friend falling. Then she would hear him shout that he was coming back... She, meanwhile, would wait for him in who knows what agony of mind. And in turn, as he planned it, he'd throw her down. Oh, no. It... If a man's a murderer, lassie, he doesn't deserve to be defended. But loyalty... Your loyalty is to the rest of us. Even if I had guessed who the murderer was, it would only be a guess. What more can I do to help you catch him? I've told you everything. I uh, know you haven't, Miss Brooke. And if you're holding back the evidence I need, then I must warn you. I haven't any evidence. I swear I haven't. And if I had... Oh, my God, I must get out of here. I've got to have time to think. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I was hoping to have a word with you, but if you're in a hurry, then... Good morning, Dougal. Uh, hurry? No, well, that is... Well, uh, it was today I was taking you fishing, Miss uh, Brooke. Uh, had you forgotten? Fishing? I... I'm sorry, but... It seems odd to be thinking about fishing after all this. Oh, uh, to be sure it does. Uh, but you'll be better out in the, in the clean air fishing and taking your mind off things. And take my word for it, ma'am. What's the weather going to be like? No, oh, it's fine now, but th there could be a bit of mist coming in off the sea later on. Can I take time for a cigarette, Dougal? Oh, of course, my son. I'll have a throw at my pipe. Uh, you've no objections. Heavens, no. <laughs> have as many drawers as you like. Now, where's my package? Too many pockets. That's my trouble. Oh, damn. Roberta's brooch. I meant to hand it over to Inspector McKenzie. I must... Where did you get this? Oh, up near the Sprout and Do. Miss Symes must that have dropped it. brooch belonged to my daughter. Oh. I had just given it to her for her birthday. And she was wearing it for the first time when... When she went out that night. You, you you give it to the inspector and you tell him where you found it. God knows it won't help my lassie now, but it might help him. Well, if we don't catch anything now, we won't have the excuse that it was too bright. I don't think we're in the mood to carry on fishing. Anyway, rotten mist's getting thicker while we're talking. Uh, don't you worry about it, monsieur. Just you bide where you are till I get our tackle from where we left it. Oh, if you can find it. No, I'll manage. I'll just have to walk along the bank till I come to it. Oh. You bloody murdering bastard. What is it, Run, oh. lassie. Run. Run.
Oh, Roderick warned. Seem if you stand still. Must keep moving. Gianetta. Gianetta. Only Nicholas calls me that. Are you there, Gianetta? Don't be afraid. Don't answer. Don't let him know. Oh, thank God. Thank God I'm out of the mist. Thank heaven. Janet? Oh, oh, Roger. Oh, oh. oh Janet. <laughs> Imagine. Oh, Janet, Janet, just sit down. Get this boulder. Take off your coat. It's soaked through. I'll be okay in a minute, Roderick. Oh, you, you know, don't you? Yes, I know. But back there with the mist all round, Nicholas was hunting me down. But to... I told you you were safe from him. I was wrong, though. It was wrong of me to try to protect him once I suspected that he was what he is. Why did you? Because I'm his wife. Were his wife, Janet? Loyalty dies hard. Why talk about loyalty when you mean love? That's it, isn't it? I, I suppose so. What exactly happened? The mist closed in. We'd left our rods and other bits and pieces down on the bank, and Dougal had gone to collect them. There was sound of a struggle. I got in a panic and ran. While I was floundering about, I heard him calling Giannetta. He was within yards of me at times. He must know that you've guessed who, what he is. I should think so. How far away? Only minutes ago, since he was far too close. Hmm. Come on. On your feet. Here, let me give you a pull-up. We're above the mist now. Shouldn't we wait till we till it clears all the way down? We're not going down. We're going up. What do you mean, Roderick? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Now, don't ask questions, do as I say. Are you putting on your coat? No, I'll carry it. It's really too wet. Oh, let me have it then. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, I-, I must get my handkerchief out of the pocket. Here, you've pulled something else out. What's this, Janet? Oh, brooch. It was Heather McRae's. Uh-huh. I found it yesterday near that dreadful ledge. I thought it was Roberta's, but today Dougal McRae recognized it as his daughter's. Oh, my God. What's wrong, Janet? You told me about the little pile of jewelry found on the ledge. You told me about it when you were describing Heather's murder. A bracelet, you said, and a brooch and other things. But the brooch wasn't on the ledge when the body was found. And since she'd only been given it that day for her birthday, you couldn't have known about it unless you'd seen her wearing it. Unless you, yourself, put it on the ledge beside the bonfire. What a pity you remembered. So it wasn't Nicholas. You were the killer. I really am sorry, Janet. I knew... When I overheard you talking to Dougal McRae back there by the river, that sooner or later you'd remember about the brooch. But I'd no intention of killing you. But of course I'll have to now. No, don't try and make a run for it. <laughs> and don't scream, Janet, because then I'll have to throttle you and... Well, I always cut their throats if I can. It's the best way. Why did you kill Heather McRae? They wanted it. They? The mountains. A life, a year. That's what they need. They must have the May Day sacrifice they received when the world was young and when men knew that gods lived on the mountains. Hmm. Now, together we collected the nine woods, the algorithm and the oak to make the wildfire. She helped me to build it. Then I cut her throat. But why did you kill Marion Bradford? The little one talked sacrilege, chattering about conquering Everest. Impudence. Bradford was no better. <laughs> that, that was quite easy. That dreadful, stupid woman was a little bit in love with me. She was delighted when I met them up by the Spoot and Do and offered to show her the climb across it. I suppose you thought they were both dead when you left them. They should have been. Wasn't it bad luck? I'd been along that ledge three times already. Never occurred to me that she'd reached that little cave. Anyhow, you found her. I did. Yet you nearly gave me the chance I wanted, Janet. When you asked me to go for your flask? Yeah, a little pressure on the throat and... But you came back too soon. That explains. What? While I was trying to make her comfortable, she opened her eyes. She seemed to be looking at someone beyond me and was terrified. For an instant, I thought it might have been Nicholas who'd found his way into the cave. But it was you she saw. She knew that you were the kid. Of course she knew, Janet. But you were so sure Drury had killed the Bradford creature and Beagle. Why Beagle? Uh... At night, on the mountainside, he wouldn't stop talking about Everest having been conquered, as he put it. Everest! 
Snow's defiled and trampled, but I'd hoped no human being would ever set his sacrilegious feet. You said that, Janet, do you remember? You spoke about Everest like that, and because you did, I thought I could never hurt you. But Beagle, I followed him down the hill, caught him from behind, and killed him. Now, my knife. What is it? I was sharpening it on a stone. I put it down somewhere. There it is, Roderick. On the ground, just behind you. Well, I don't see it. <laughs> Jenna, come back. You won't get away. That ledge, that ledge. Must reach that ledge. Come down here, Janet. Come down here, Janet. You are trapped. <sighs> Very well, I shall have to come up. Keep away. There are plenty of stones here. Big ones. Stay where you are. I'll smash your head in. That piece of rock would smash my skull. You couldn't do a thing like that, could you? No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I thought not, Janet. (laughs) Don't worry, Janetta. I can. Nicholas, I'm perfectly all right now. Tell me, please, what happened when you caught him? Well, he put up a pretty desperate struggle, and I shouldn't like to bet on what the outcome might have been if Sergeant Munro and his sidekick hadn't arrived on the scene. That's a nasty cut on your cheek. Oh, I'll live. Ah, here comes the law in all its majesty. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. I'm far off as good as. We're just waiting for transport to take us and the accused back to Inverness. Are you quite recovered, Miss Brooke? Quite, thank you. Ah, good. Well, it would seem I was wrong in thinking that you were withholding vital evidence. But what did you imagine I knew that I hadn't told you? I thought you'd recognized the man you saw in front of the bonfire. I hadn't. I believe you now. Even so, I could have sworn you were lying about something. I was, but not about that. Uh, concerning Mr. Drury, I suspect. No, it doesn't matter now. Take care of her, sir. She's had a rough time. I will, Inspector. Oh, by the way, Mr. Drury, I hope you've a license for that gun of yours. Uh, now I'll uh, say goodbye to you both. Goodbye, Inspector McKenzie. Uh, bye, Inspector. <laughs> My oh. God, you had me worried, Giannetta. The Inspector had put Neil on to watch Grant, but the mist came down and Grant gave him the slip. I knew where you and Dougal were fishing, so I made my way upriver. I heard a yell from Dougal, so I ran like blazes. I found your rods, but you'd gone. I started a frantic search for you, which landed me in that damn bog. I know, I heard you. I was scared out of my wits. I thought you were the murderer. And you didn't help by calling in such a sinister way. Well, I didn't want him to reach you before I could. So you knew then that it was Roderick? So did Inspector Mackenzie, but there was no proof. What was the information the inspector was waiting for from London? It concerns Roderick Grant's family. His mother died when he was born, and his grandmother, his father's mother, brought him up. Then she died in an asylum. Oh, Nicholas, how dreadful. So his father's family... Exactly. His father had always been a stern, God-fearing Presbyterian. His son only mattered to him as someone to whom he could pour out his cranky theories about customs and legends of the Highlands and Islands. Grant must have spent a large part of his childhood listening to his father's garbled versions of the old folklore, of which the so-called ritual murder of Heather McRae was the eventual spin-off. I know, I found some of the bits in the Golden Bough. Uh, My Golden Bough, which you handed to the inspector. Uh, What, I wonder, would you have done had you known it was mine? But I did know it was yours, Nicholas. There was an envelope inside it addressed to you in Daddy's handwriting. By the way, how come that Daddy knew you were here? Well, I remember that he had the books I phoned to ask if he'd send it on to me. You see, Grant had made one or two remarks that struck me as being half-remembered quotes from the Golden Bough. When I saw how the author's details checked with poor Heather McRae's May Day sacrifice... May Day? Well, May 13th is May Day, according to the old calendar. Well, everything fitted in a bizarre sort of way. So I showed the book to Inspector McKenzie. When? Last week. And you knew the book was yours? Of course. Did he never suspect you? Well, he may have done to begin with, along with Hubert Hay and Grant. You see, Hay and I had both displayed some knowledge of local folklore. Hay, however, had an alibi provided by you in the case of Marion Bradford's murder, and I had indicated my innocence by putting the police on the right track by the Golden Bough. So that left Grant. Then why did the inspector seem so sorry for me when he was lecturing me about loyalties? You assume, don't you, that he was lecturing you because he thought you were being loyal to me? Roderick I'd seen by the bonfire. Exactly. He was pretty sure by then that Grant was the murderer, and he suspected you of shielding him because you'd fallen for him. I'm afraid I told him so on the uh, scant evidence of Roderick Grant's marked interest in you. You told the inspector I was in love with Grant? I did. Sorry, Jeanetta. Sheer dog in the manger stuff. Jealousy exaggerates, you know. 
So when you seemed to be holding back evidence about Grant, Mackenzie took it that you yourself suspected him, but was loath to give him away. That's absurd. I thought he had bags of charm. I wasn't in love with him. Oh, why not? We'll skip that, if you don't mind. <laughs> when did the inspector finally decide that Roderick Grant was his man? Brain Corrigan Persimmon or Beagle could have had an unacknowledged interest in folklore, but Marion's murder narrowed the field down appreciably, since it pointed clearly to the fact that the murderer was a first-rate climber. Now, Beagle was the only one of that lot who was, and it wasn't long until he was murdered. So that... Left Roderick? Yes. Trouble was to pin anything on him. Roberta, of course, could have provided more than enough evidence. But there was also the chance that she'd have mercifully forgotten all about the whole ugly episode. Mackenzie phoned London asking for information about Grant. He was going to risk pulling him in if they came up with anything that would give him a pretext for doing so. This morning, word came back that Grant's father died in a mental home two years ago. Oh, no. Well, that, of course, was quite enough to warrant his being detained. But that damned mist rolled in from the sea like curtains. Grant managed to give Constable Neil the slip and go hounding after you. Oh, she and it. What a risk you ran. Dougal didn't hurt him, did he? No, he arrived on the scene hell-bent on revenge, but he calmed down when he saw Grant. Why? Grant had gone to pieces. I just hit him on the jaw, hard. Yet there he was, smiling at me like a bewildered child and wiping the blood away. He just stood smiling at us. Dougal said, come on, laddie, and he went quite happily with them. Then he started to sing. Sing? Well, croon, sort of. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come mine aid. Oh, the poor crazy devil. Poor Roderick Grant. You did see me, didn't you, in the corridor with Marcia Mailing? Yes. I want you to know that in this instance I was more kissed than kissing. All night? Meaning what, Giannetta? I passed Marcia Mailing's room during the night. I heard voices, and one was a man's. I see. Well, I didn't spend the night with her. I merely got myself momentarily, um, how should I put it, waylaid. Mm. I should think the man you heard was Hartley Corrigan. That's why he came back early from fishing that night. Yet Alma Corrigan said he didn't get to bed until three o'clock. Well, well. Evidently, he'd found his way to another bed before that. Poor Alma. Oh, I think the worst's over for them, too. And now, shall we talk about us? No, I... don't speak. I want you back, Gianetta. I do most damnably want you back. I do love you, my darling. I don't think I ever stopped loving you. Have me back. Please. I never did have any pride so far as you were concerned, Nicholas. You know, it wasn't just coincidence that I met you here. When your father told me you were due a holiday... Don't ever leave me again, Nicholas. I don't think I could bear it. Never again. What do you bet? That when we arrive at Ten Jabbers, Mother will meet us as though nothing had ever happened and show us to the spare room. Then we better get married again before we get there. Midnight was adapted by Stuart Hunter from the novel by Mary Stuart. The part of Giannetta... There's nothing wrong that a short holiday won't cure. Hugo thinks I should take myself off to some quiet spot. ...was played by Ursula Smith. Roderick Grant... I'd no intention of killing you. But of course I'll have to now. ...by Stephen MacDonald. And Nicholas... Ah, here comes the law in all its majesty. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. ...by Roy Boucher. Marcia. It's gross, Binker, and there's ash scattered over it. The murderer has been here. It was played by Claire Richards. Dougal. He was wearing it for the first time when, when she went out that night. By Murda MacDonald. And the inspector. The uh, doctor left instructions, Miss Brooke. I've written them down for you. They're on the bedside table. By John Shedden. Alistair was played by Derek Gilbert. Hubert and Corrigan by Brian Carey. Mrs. Corrigan, Gertrude Bryce, Mrs. Brooke and Marion, Thelma Barlow, Roberta, Sally Farrell, Beagle, Arthur Boland, Persimmon, Clement Ashby, and Police Sergeant, Charles Batiste. Wildfire at Midnight was produced in our Glasgow studios by Stuart Conn.
out of the past. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale declared insane. Think of your rival for your husband's affections. Are you positive that's the same, Madame Jean Renault? I'd stake my honor upon it. Cecil, you've staked your honor so often there's nothing left to it. Madame. Amazing. I wonder how a woman like that could extract such huge sums of money from my husband. She might have certain charms you don't understand. But she's fat and pockmarked. Crurene. But powerful enough to make you and your children penniless within ten years. How can we break her hold on Pierre? I've tried. Pierre won't listen to me, either as his brother or his lawyer. So there's only one thing left. What's that? Simply that you ask for a commission for lunacy against him. Imply that he's insane and have him locked away. But Pierre is insane. With your political prestige at Louis XV's court, I'm sure we can convince a young ambitious judge to the contrary. Pierre's many eccentricities can bear fruit. His monomania on Chinese customs could easily be misinterpreted. You understand? But, Cecil, I... Now listen to me. Tomorrow morning, I want you to pay an unexpected visit on your husband. Drive out to that country hollow and... Is your master in, Roger? Madame the Marquis, we weren't expecting you. Do come in. Monsieur is in the study. If you follow me, he'd be pleased to see you, madame. It's been such a long time. Thank you, Roger. Monsieur, Madame la Marquise? René. I'm sorry to disturb you, Pierre, but you know what the court says. The separation of ours does not do my reputation any good. Your reputation? Naturally. What are you doing dressed up in that silly outfit? I am writing a history of China, René. One can't understand the Chinese mind without trying to feel the tempo of their mode of life. Oh, that's neither here nor there. I've been hearing about the way you're handling the children. The children are well and healthy. I don't feel comfortable about them out here. So I'd like to change nurses. The woman you have now is too old for the job. I've brought an English woman out here with me today. Her name is Maggie Campbell. I think you'll find Maggie a gem in many ways. Your absent-mindedness endangers our children's very existence. What are you hinting at? Hinting? You know very well what I mean. That woman... Madame Jean Renault. She's no concern of yours. My son's future inheritance, however, is my concern. I can't prevent you from throwing it away on a swine-headed woman. But really. Really what? Who is this Jean Renault? What power has she got over you? Why do you insist on living in the country and giving her the major part of your income? That's one question you'll never have answered. You wouldn't understand. That's why I've hired Maggie Campbell to act as nursemaid. The children are never to be in that woman's company. And Miss Campbell will follow those instructions to the letter. Well, Rene, I didn't expect you to come back so soon. It didn't take me long to sell Pierre on the idea of hiring your fatuous Miss Campbell, Cecil. What did he think of her? Nothing much. My story was completely believable. We can depend on Maggie Campbell to weave an interesting web for Pierre to stumble into. In the meantime, you've work to do. Work? I've invited young Bianchon for a party at your house this evening. Aren't you presumptuous? Not at all. That fool has always been in love with you. His uncle is a judge of the inferior court, Monsieur Popinot. If you can convince Bianchon to bring his uncle into our camp... A commission for lunacy against Popier's one. You're in a position to do both of them a great deal of political good. It might be wise to remind them of it, gently. The party is to start it now. Bien, Jean. I'm so glad you could come to my little party. Oh, you're playing with my heart, madame. Ah. Oh. If only I were a free woman, 
free to play with a man's heart. Oh. But my husband being ill... Oh, Pierre's ill? Didn't you know? No. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. It's a mental condition. I thought you knew. Oh. Is there anything that I can do? I'm afraid there's nothing anyone can do. He insists now upon throwing his money away on a woman. Known as Jean Renault, whom he favors now. Oh, a woman. A fat, ugly, pockmarked woman who is closer to 60 years of age than anything else. He's given her almost a million francs. Oh, this is serious, madame. But what can I do? He controls all the money in the family except my own small income. Well, have you ever thought of securing a commission for lunacy against him? My own husband, Monsieur Bianchon? But it's necessary, madame. My uncle is judge of the inferior courts. He could get it for you quite easily. If you'd consent to visit with him, I'm sure... Bianchon. Yes? Could you persuade your uncle to visit me here in my home? I would repay him for his trouble. A close friend of mine, Philippe Brett, is head of the civil court. He could do your uncle much good if I suggested it. Oh, but of course, René. I shall pay my uncle Pope and Noah a visit this evening. Would tomorrow night be a convenient night for you? So convenient. And if Monsieur Popineau is interested in verifying my case, he might ask Maggie Campbell, my children's nurse, about Pierre's strange actions. In this loony house, come over here and bottle. <laughs> yes, Maggie. Uh, what is it now, nurse? Listen to them, will you? A father playing with his sons, a twist in their arms, and they scream in agony. Look at them there in the garden. Uh, he's teaching the boys how to wrestle, Maggie. Uh, wrestling's a fine art in China. Mm, wrestling, is it? It's a fine kind of wrestling. I'm trying to pull the boys' arms out by the garden. <laughs> A laughing and a screaming. A maniac's mind. A maniac, I tell you. Even help us. What will those madmen do next? Thank you, driver. Uncle Poppy, no. Uncle Poppy, no. Well, if this isn't my nephew. <laughs> well, well, be on strong. Come in. Oh, how can you live in this rat trap? And if this is a rat trap, Bianchon, then you should throw your old uncle a piece of cheese. What brings you down here on the banks on this hot day? Oh, a matter of urgency. A friend of mine is in trouble. Mm, trouble. Life was ever thus. Her husband is stark staring mad. And the poor woman hasn't the faintest notion how to go about getting a commission for lunacy. Mm, who is the lady? Madame la Marquise de Spard. Madame de la Marquise? Yes. <laughs> she probably knows more about these things than you do, nephew. Uh, nevertheless, I'll see her when she arrives. She's not well, uncle. You can't expect her to visit you in a place like... like this. Hmm? Besides, he's a close friend of Philippe Brett, and he's the head of the civil courts and can do you a lot of good. That crook? Oh, Poppy, no. Madame le Marquise had the kindness to invite us to dinner at her house tomorrow night. Bien, Jean, I'm surprised at you. You know very well that I'll be the examining judge on the case, and our courts forbid a judge to d d dine in a petitioner's home. It's against the law. Oh, yes, I'd, I'd forgotten. After dinner, then, Uncle? Well, yeah, she can see me here. In all fairness to her. She's ill, Uncle. Drop in at her house. Was it a request or a demand from her, Bianchon? Both, I imagine, Uncle. Mm. Even a judge is afraid not to grant her demands. A woman like that is a powerful factor at court. Then you will drop in and see her? Yes. Tomorrow afternoon at three. But warn her not to serve any food or drink to me at all. Oh, yes, Uncle. She will be well warned. Maggie, what are you doing prowling about the master's bedroom? Oh, I, um, oh, I was looking for a good tonic for the children. The master keeps all the medicines locked up here. Yeah. 
While I'm about it, uh, you ought to take the tonic, Roger. You don't look so well lately. Oh, I, I never felt better. Mm, spring's uh, coming, Roger. Everybody should take a tonic. Yeah, drink this. You'll feel like a new man in a few seconds. I'll fix up a draw for the children. Uh, I can't figure you out, Maggie. One moment you shout, and the next you worry about my health. That's just my why, Roger. Go ahead. Drink it. I'm a nurse. I ought to know what's good. Go ahead. Drink it. Well, uh, this will make us better friends, Maggie. Uh, I'll drink it. <sighs> mm. oh, tastes like poison. Roger. Roger. The master's calling, Roger. See what he wants. Uh, I'm coming, Monsieur Le Marquis. You'd better come along to the study, Roger. I'm expecting a visitor, and I'd better have the place looking spick and span. Visitor, Monsieur? Madame Jean Lenoir will be here soon. Then the business between Madame and I will be over, finally. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. I'm... Monsieur, uh, look at the study. More Chinese books than all of China. I need them. I, uh, I, uh... What's the matter, Roger? He, if you're so ill, Monsieur Le Marquis, in heaven's name, yeah, I, I better don't sit down know. over here, Roger. I, I don't. I'm. I help. Uh, Roger. Uh, Maggie. Maggie. What's the matter, Monsieur? Roger. Roger, oh, sorry. Roger. He's dead. Dead? His skin is turning black, Monsieur. Black? As if he had drunk. Yes. Just if he drop a strong draught of Chinese poison. How do you know the effect? I'm a nurse, sir. Now your madness is no longer innocent. You're a murderer, too. Poisoning a poor, helpless man just because he disagreed with you. What are you talking about, Maggie? Well, you know what I'm talking about, monsieur. You're a murderer. A murderer. Now get the police for your poisonous all in the middle of the night. Madame la Marquise, may I present my uncle, judge of the inferior courts, Monsieur Popinel. Good afternoon, Monsieur. How do you do? This is my brother-in-law, the Chevalier de Stein. Say so. How do you do? How do you do? Won't you be seated, Monsieur Popinel? My uncle will do everything in his power to help you remain. I'm sure he will, Bianchon. Tell me, Madame, when you and the Marquis separated originally... How much money were you allowed? Just my original income of 26,000 francs a year. Hmm. You say that the Marquis had given a certain Madame Jean Renault considerable sums of money? Almost a million francs. Hmm. Is there any reason for him to give her money? None. None but an imaginary one dictated to him by his twisted mind. Does Madame Jean Renault live well? Live well? In a mansion? I'm a poor man myself, Madame. How much does Madame Jean Renault spend on her house? Oh, the stables alone cost 16,000 francs. Mm, judges are apt to be incredulous. If the uh, stables alone cost 16,000, then how much for the entire establishment? Between 50 and 60,000 francs. So much? You don't say. Now, how much do you spend for this lovely place? About the same, 50 or 60,000. Money! Huh? Oh. <laughs> I thought you said your income was only 26,000 francs. You must be badly in debt, obviously. But, monsieur... See, if you're in debt, the court might not feel justified in allowing you to handle your husband's money. They might think you have a different motive for trying to secure control of your husband's money. Not that I have. A selfish one. Do you serve, madame? Well, I'm sorry, Madame Le Marquis. It's against the law for me to eat and drink at a petitioner's home. I thought you knew. Madame Le Marquis! Madame Le Marquis! Oh, Maggie, 
What are you doing here? I've been trying to get her all day, I have. Missing the Macias murdered his butler. What? Poisoned him. I thought it was my own eyes. <sighs> the police came. They've got him away in the jail. He's stark, staring, writhing mad ears. Murder now. Well, Monsieur Pocono, is murder a part of the same man's mind? Such a place for a judge to live. Oh, if I lived here, I'd never make old bones. Monsieur Popino. Yes? I got your summons to come and see you in your house. Well, here I am. Yes, here you are. But who are you? Madame Jean Reno. Mm. Kind of a judge to you, anyway, living here. Huh? You must be an honest one. Well, what do you want to see me about? I've learned that you've been receiving extraordinary amounts of money from Monsieur le Marquis d'Espard. Well... As a matter of fact, I have. Mm, what seducer's art have you oh. been using on Monsieur Le Marquis? Oh, seducer's art? <laughs> Look at me, Monsieur. Fat, ugly, hideous. <laughs> what kind of a vamp would I make? <laughs> well, that's a question I can't answer. But you will have to. Monsieur, I'm sorry, but I am under oath. I can never divulge the reason that Monsieur gives me the money. Madame, if you have any pity for your benefactor, you'll tell me. A commission for lunacy has been taken out against him. Huh? And you're named as having some strange power over him. Oh, oh which is supposed to have driven him mad. Oh, great heavens. I am as good a monsieur le marquis and warn him. He's a saint, that man. A saint, monsieur. Yes, but he isn't at home. He's in jail. Madame Jean Renault. Monsieur le Marquis, I am Judge Popino of the Inferior Court. You are most welcome to come in and share my prison cell. Are you here to accuse me of murdering a man, too? No, monsieur. But your wife has taken out a commission for lunacy against you. Monsieur, you're joking. I wish I were. Your passion for Chinese customs has led them to believe you live in a dream world. I was commissioned to write a book about China by the most respectable firm in all Paris. Have you a contract from them? In my desk drawer at home. Hmm. Are there any duplicate copies in case your copy is stolen? Certainly. Here's the address of the firm. They have the duplicate. Hmm. The second count is, of course, there's murder. You were accused of murdering your butler just to try out a potency of a new Chinese drug you've discovered. I've never toyed with Chinese drugs or poisons. How about this business of giving all your money to Madame Jean Renault? Monsieur, I never thought I'd tell anyone that secret. Your life depends on it. Madame Jean Renaud is the descendant of the Jean Renaud family who owned a large estate in Saxony in the 13th century. My ancestors murdered her ancestors and stole that property. What has that to do with you? The entire Despire fortune was founded on that property. I'm trying to pay back a debt. The amount of money which should have been paid to the Jean Renaud when the property was taken over. You're too conscientious, Monsieur Le Marquis. I don't want my children to be ashamed of their family as I'm ashamed of mine. They'll always be proud of the disparate name. I don't think we'll have any trouble clearing you of this charge. Tell me this. Is there any place in France where the black Chinese poison can be ordered? One place might have it. It's a small pharmacy called Lincoln. I don't usually carry that particular mixing drug in our pharmacy, Monsieur Propineau. It's too dangerous. But I did have a special order for it from a cockney woman named Maggie Campbell just the other day. She had a note authorizing her to buy it. Who was the note from? From the head of the medical research department, through the Chevalier Despard. Mm, thank you very much. Clerk. Clerk. Has Monsieur Le Marquis Despard's contract arrived from Paris? Yes, Monsieur Popineau, this morning. Where's Madame Jean Renault? She's waiting for you now, Monsieur Popineau. Just have her sign this legal bill of sale for the Saxon property and ask her to appear in court tomorrow morning. Yes, monsieur. And the clerk. Yes. Send this letter to the Marquise Despard. After this note, I don't think she'll appear to press charges. After all, come along, Rene. We'd better go inside the courtroom. It's almost time for the sessions to start. You go ahead, Cecil. I'd like to see Monsieur Philippe Brett before court starts. A few later, though. Oh, my dear Renee, uh, you look charming. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Not at all. 
Here's the letter Monsieur Popino sent me last night and the affidavit you asked for. Mm-hmm. This letter from Popino places you in a very ugly position. It threatens the entire civil court. Besides naming the head of the medical association, Monsieur Brett. Yes, I know, Rene. Leave everything to me. I'll see you in court in a few minutes. Order in the court. The Fifth Court of Inferior Appeals is in session. The first case is a commission for lunacy. The case of Madame de la Marquise d'Espard. Forget Monsieur la Marquise Monsieur Poupin. Yes, Monsieur Brett. As head of the civil courts, I cannot allow you to preside on the bench during this case. Cannot allow me? Do you realize, man, you violated the most important law in all France? I have three sworn affidavits that you partook of tea and cake at the household of René Despard at 5 p.m. four days ago. Now, since Madame is the plaintiff in this case, that renders any decision you might give is invalid. But, Monsieur Brett, they are lying. Your own nephew swears it's the truth. Will you relinquish the bench? Who is to take over in my place? Monsieur Devreux. Devreux? Yes. A man who spends his time currying favor for my majesties? Monsieur, will you give up the bench? I have no option. But if I can't work as judge on this case, I will represent Monsieur de la Marquis Despard as his barrister. Will you ascend the bench, Monsieur Dubreau? Naturally, Monsieur, but the barrister in charge of proceedings will start. But as you, Chevalier Despard, is it not, Cecil? Yes. Thank you, Monsieur Dubreau. In behalf of my client, Madame la Marquise, a poor innocent woman who has been robbed of her children, her income, and her home by a lunatic husband, who is guilty of murder. You only presume he's guilty of murder. I presume nothing, Bobano. You've already been tried and convicted. When? Ten minutes before court started. I signed the papers, Monsieur Bobino. You did, Brett. Yes. You haven't the foggiest notion of what this case concerns. I have definite proof that Maggie Campbell was hired to murder the butler. Here it is. My proof that Monsieur Le Marquis is innocent. Judge Tavreau. You can set aside this conviction. Uh, yeah, let us proceed. A woman named Madame Jarrineau has forced Monsieur Le Marquis to give her over a million francs. We all know that Monsieur Popeno made up that story about the Saxon property to fool the court. But these are lies, Monsieur Devro. Continue, Chevalier. And last but not least, we base our claim on the fact that Monsieur Le Marquis thinks he lives in China. Ha! <laughs> Is that a thought for a sane man? Monsieur Le Marquis is writing a book on China. He has a contract for that book. We investigated the contract, Monsieur Popeno. The Paris firm swears they never drew it up. Mm. You've done well, gentlemen, to make a mockery of the courts of France. This trial is a farce, a plain farce. Of course, you grant the commission for lunacy, you will be heaped with honors by these weakling fools. That is only your opinion, Popeno. Judge Tepro, remember, your conscience will weigh heavily on your soul. If you send this man away, you will have only yourself to answer to. You wake up in the middle of the night screaming for forgiveness to your maker. Think on it carefully, Judge Tepro. Think before you make the decision. There is no need for thought. I demand an immediate decision. There's only one decision I can possibly make. An honest one. A decision dictated to me by my conscience and the evidence on hand. The commission for lunacy is granted. Mr. Devro, I'm as sane as you are. You can't lock me up. Pope and I'll tell them. In heaven's name, stop them. Don't let them. God! Take that man out of court and put him in a straitjacket. Before he loses his mind completely. From the time worn pages of the past, we have heard the story declared insane. Bellkeeper. Hold the bell.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake in The Canterville Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Hunt Stromberg. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you've heard that story of two ghosts indulging in a bit of phantom conversation. One turned to the other and asked that question that has troubled ghosts since time began. Do you believe in people? We bring you tonight the story of a ghost who cherished very little confidence in people, and even less faith in himself. The legend dubs him one of England's most spectacular phantoms. Charles Lawton plays the title role in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's comic fantasy. The Canterville Ghost. Co-starred with Mr. Lawton is an actress still young on the vine, and shortly to be starred in MGM's Our Vines Have Tender Grapes. Seven-year-old Margaret O'Brien, winner of this year's Academy Award. Also in our cast is Tom Drake, who, as Cuffy Williams, finds himself billeted with an American expeditionary troop in the ancient castle of the Canterville, where what transpires may sometimes challenge your belief at the same time that it sparks your risibility. While the setting of our play is wartime England, America has had its share of ghosts too. In fact, there was a time when it was considered a safe precaution to dunk all suspicious characters in water. If they stayed under, they were innocent of harboring anti-social spirits. Well, we'd hardly tolerate such laundering in our present day society. Unless, of course, we added Lux Flakes to the process. Give Lux Flakes a ghost of a chance, and you'll never work yourself into a skeleton with old-fashioned methods. Nor will your nice things ever wear that haunted look. As we lower the lights in our theater, we suggest you do the same at home and draw up a chair to hear the first act of The Canterville Ghost, starring Margaret O'Brien as Lady Jessica de Canterville, Charles Lawton as Sir Simon, and Tom Drake as Coffee Williams. <laughs> Authorities on the subject of phantoms declare that the most fearsome ghost in all the British Isles is that of a somewhat overweight nobleman named Sir Simon de Canterville. Haunting Canterville Castle for 300 years, this portly apparition has been unique for its shrewd sense of showmanship and its spectacular variety of stunts, shapes, and sound effects. The ghost originated in 1634 when Sir Simon was scheduled to fight a duel. He took one look at his fierce and towering opponent and ran away from the field of honor in a startling display of speed and cowardice. He was chased to his father's castle by his frustrated opponent, Sir Valentine. Where is he? Where is the cowardly poltroon? Sir, uh, what means this violation of my hall? Lord Canterville? I? I am Sir Valentine of Bolton Manor. Your son, Sir Simon, having accepted my challenge, fled before my sword. Fled? You lie, Sir Valentine. My honor has been twice offended. I demand that the fat coward faces me. You are new to these parts, Sir Valentine, or you would know that cowardice in a Canterville is like snow in July. Every Canterville bears on his neck the Canterville birthmark. It is the badge of valor. The Cantervilles are the bravest men in England. So call off your hounds and leave these halls. Fine words, my lord, but it seems the hounds have found their quarry. That room there. Why is the door closed, and why do my hounds leap upon it? No son of mine cowers behind a door. No? Then my lord can have no objection to sealing up the door with stone and mortar? I certainly can. I have too great a regard for my house. For your house, my lord, or for your son? Childs, Thomas, fetch the stonemasons. Tell them to bring their brick and mortar. One more stone, Sir Valentine, and the room is sealed. Are you satisfied? Aye. And you still think my son is in that room? If he's a coward, why is he not called? He is a coward. Father, father! Ah, he finds his tongue at last. Masons, stop. I heard nothing. Continue, Masons. Seal up the wall. Father, father! It is Simon, my son. My lord. There's no one in that room. Put in the last stone, I say. Put it in. Father, father! 
It is I. But, my lord, t'was only meant in jest. Leave my house. Aye, but tis thy son thou hast entombed there. And you, Masons, get you hence. I mean, lord, I... Simon de Canterville, full well I know it is thou behind this masonry. But because thou hast dishonored thy proud blood, that room shall be thy tomb. When thou art dead, may thy craven spirit walk the halls of Canterville Castle until a kinsman shall wear thy signet ring and perform for thee the brave deed thou didst fail to do. So did Sir Simon die, and so was born the Canterville ghost. Now it's 1942. Canterville Castle stands silent and deserted, inhabited only by a slightly tired but still fearsome phantom. The only remaining Canterville is Lady Jessica. She and her aunt find living less disturbing in a modest cottage on the castle grounds. Lady Jessica is seven years old. Auntie, Auntie, I just saw him. I just saw the ghost. The ghost, dear? Where? On the roof of the castle. Oh, that was the tinsmith, darling. He's mending the water spouts. We're turning the castle over to some American soldiers. American soldiers? Mm, rangers, I believe they're called. Like our commandos. But good gracious, Auntie. Can they live in the castle when it is haunted? Your family did, darling, until 20 years ago. Excuse me, men. Oh, yes, Potter. Everything's ready at the castle. We were wondering about tea, ma'am. Oh, of course. I'll be there shortly. Yes, ma'am. You're going, Auntie? Certainly, dear. They'll be our guests. Noblesse oblige. But, Auntie, you're not well. Remember what the doctor said? Well, perhaps I shouldn't. Auntie, what does it mean? Noblesse oblige? Oh, it's just an expression, darling. But what does it mean? Well, noblesse oblige is French. Those of us who are nobly born must prove ourselves worthy by being kind and thoughtful of others. So, when guests arrive, we must see that they enjoy their stay. Auntie, those Americans, will there be cowboys and Indians? Mm -hmm, some of them, I dare say. What does one do to make Indians welcome? Jessica, you're not going to the castle. Well, someone should greet the soldiers. But aren't you afraid of the ghost? Oh, yes, Auntie. And you still want to go? Well, I really should. It's my castle. Noblesse oblige. It starts when you're born, doesn't it? <laughs> Run along then, darling. The Americans should be there now. And don't worry, Auntie. Ghosts almost never come out in the daytime. Hey, Hunt! What tune accounted for, Lieutenant Kane? I get this. As long as you men are in this castle, you're to conduct yourselves like gentlemen and respect this property. Get a good night's sleep. You'll need it. If you want me, Sergeant Benson, I'll be at headquarters in the village. Yes, sir. As you were. Oh, hey, now, that's my chair, Copy. I Sorry, Jordan, I'm consolidating this uh, position. Well, not bad. <laughs> Pup tents are okay for the hoi polloi. Me, Copy Williams, I prefer the comforts of the castle. An easy chair, a cozy fire. Take your big feet off that table, Williams. Where do you think you're at? Canterville Castle, one of England's most impressive I estates. I beg pardon. Shall I serve tea now, gentlemen? Tea? Hmm? After your journey, you may be a bit done in. Well, uh, okay then. Uh, thanks. Very good, sir. Now, listen, fellas. It says in the book here that when you're in England, you've got to act the way they do. If they say tea... You drink. Excuse me, gentlemen, but Lady Jessica would like to say good evening. Oh, well, lady. tell her we'd be honored. Very good, sir. Lady, oh, what do you say to a dame that's a lady? Do you have to kiss her hand? Now, watch it. Lady Jessica de Canterville. Good evening, gentlemen. Holy smoke. It's a midget. No, it's a half pint. How do you do? I want you to all know I'm glad you're here. And I do so hope you'll enjoy your stay in my castle. Well, uh, uh, yeah, my lady, may I say on behalf of my compatriots that we're very grateful for your hospitality. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, gentlemen. You'll uh, excuse the fellas, I hope. I, uh, uh, we thought Lady Jessica was a... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I thought a girl had to be married before she was a lady. Oh, dear, no. A lady is a lady when she behaves like one, my auntie says. Which one of you are Indians? Huh? Oh, <laughs> oh, that tall fellow, Trigger, he's an Indian. Oh, to which tribe do you belong? He's a Hoboken Indian. <laughs> I don't believe I've ever read about that tribe. Please serve, gentlemen. Oh, of course. Will you pour, my lady? 
Thank you, Mr. Uh... Uh, Williams, Private Cuffey Williams. I shall be happy to, Private Williams. This way, gents. Would anybody like some more tea? No, no, thanks. Who did that? Come on, now. Who did it? Who did what, Sergeant? Who made that spot on the rug? Who spilled the tea? Speak up. Oh, that's not tea, sir. It ain't? No, sir. Nothing will remove that spot. It's blood. Blood? Quite so. The blood of Lady Barbara Moody. She stabbed herself in the throat when she saw him. Him? Uh, who was him? Sir Simon, our ghost. Your ghost, did you say? Oh, yes. He's quite the most famous ghost in England. And he lives here in this castle. Now, wait a minute. Well, if you don't want me to tell you about it... Oh, but we do. Now, give the lady a chance, fellows. If she says her castle is haunted, well, who are we to quibble? It may sound irregular to you, but I have seen the ghost myself. No fooling. That's the door to his bedchamber behind that tapestry. Isn't it, Mrs. Potter? Aye. He was walled up in there centuries ago. Holy catfish. Well, that's awful. Yes. And every night now on the stroke of twelve... His spirit walks the halls. Searching for a kinsman with the birthmark at the Cantervilles. Oh, oh, gentlemen, beware. I shouldn't tell you this before bedtime, but the Dowager Duchess of Stutfield was found one night on her balcony, stock staring mad. There's the loveliest picture of her gibbering like an idiot. Oh, you don't say. Well, that's awful. And Lady Margaret Bilton, she drowned herself in the fish pond. Do you know why? Because there he was again, with long green fingers, twitching with palsy, and his eyes burning my coal. The bloodsucker of Bexley Moor. Bloodsucker? Didn't I tell you, fellas? Who are we to quibble? What is your name, please? Cuffy Williams. Well, Cuffy Williams, I know right well that you've been laughing at me. Oh, no, my lady. But just you wait until midnight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Hey, Cuffy, it's twelve o'clock. Oh, so what? Oh, nothing. Boy, this bunk's hot. I can't get to sleep. Well, fill out a complaint and mail it to the colonel. Hey, Cuffy, do you think there's anything in this ghost business? Oh, for crying out loud. Pipe down, you guys. I said pipe down. That ain't us, Sarge. Sounds like somebody dragging ash cans around. No, it's chains. Hey, look, there's a light on the stairs. Hey, look, fellas, it's taking shape. It's the ghost. Who oh, is? Oh, it's him. It's her Simon. <laughs> I am the ghost of Sir Simon de Canterville. Did you ever see a man slice of his own head? Observe. <coughs> it's off. A head without a body, a body without a head. <coughs> now it's on. <coughs> now it's off. <coughs> now it's on again. Yeah, it's on, but you put it on backwards. Oh, did I? Excuse me. <coughs> Is this better? Ah, scram, dribble boys. Take care, take care. Take care, lad. Hey, fellas, I'm going to let them have it. Well, let's face it, Sarge. That was a real ghost. Yeah, yeah, I don't believe it. But I see he comes back. We've got to scare him again. Scare a ghost? That's right, and this time scare him good. Now, listen, you put on our gas mask. Take the sheets and wrap them back. Company, attention. Morning, men. Morning, Morning, sir. Well, from now on, we're officially attached to British commandos. We're going to celebrate with a 10-hour endurance hike. Forced marching rate eight hours, double time last two. Oh, oh, no. What's the matter with the men, Sergeant? Yes, sir, uh, I'm afraid they didn't sleep so good last night. Oh, no, why not? Well, uh, uh, maybe it was, uh, well, you know how it is, a, a strange place. Yeah. Jordan, is that what kept you up, a strange place? Oh, no, sir. What kept me up was seeing the ghost. Wasn't it, Eddie? Uh, Yes, sir, that's right. You saw a ghost? Oh, you should have seen him, sir. He cut off his own head. We shot at him, then we put on sheets and gas masks and scared him away for good. 
I hope. All right, Sergeant. What really kept him up last night? Well? It was the ghost, sir. Ghost, huh? Phone the platoon. I guarantee the men will sleep tonight. Yes, sir. All in. Williams, where'd you get that limp? Oh, it's nothing, sir. I was just running up the stairs. Chased by the ghost? Oh, no, sir. I was chasing him. Well, you can chase yourself right back into that castle and spend the next ten hours sweeping the floors. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Well, well, hello there, lady. Oh, it's you. Well, who did you think it was? I, oh, no one. I was just bringing these onions into the pantry. Really? Then why did you take that great circle route? Um, oh, Auntie thought the mess sergeant might like some onions. I'm a brownie and brownies raise onions. Oh, come now, you were afraid I was a ghost. Well, what if I was? Well, he's nothing to be afraid of. Didn't he come last night? Sure, and we chased him right up the chimney. Oh, you didn't. Oh, you think I'm kidding, huh? Well, we'll ask old Foxy Grandpa himself. Who? The ghost. Oh, that won't be necessary. Now, uh, let's see. This is the door to the room that's walled up, isn't it? Hmm, pretty solid. Hey, Grandpa, open up! Oh, what do you know? It wasn't locked. Oh, oh no, please. Auntie's expecting me home. Oh, come on over here. Come on. That's right. Now, look, you, you just pretend you're not afraid and you won't be. That's all there is to it. Are you sure? I'll prove it to you. Come on. Hey, ghost, where are you hiding? That must be where he was walled up. Mm, those bricks look loose. Maybe I could find a hand. Well, what do you know? Look. What? Over there on top of the mantel, Sir Simon. He's sitting on a mantle. Must you invade even my tomb? Will there be no place I could call sanctuary? What are you doing up there? Tried to keep out of drafts. I've got a slight head cold. <laughs> well, drift down here. There's someone I want you to meet. I have already bet your colonial ruffians. They pursued me through the halls like ghosts. Humans. <laughs> now, nobody's going to hurt you, Grandpa. I want you to meet Lady Jessica. Sir Simon the Ghost. The lady. How do you do? Not at all well, thank you. Uh, <coughs> Bless you. Oh, that a girl. Oh, she's been scared stiff of you. And I just wanted to show her you wouldn't hurt a flea. Sir, my record speaks for itself. An unbroken reign of terror through three centuries. Well, record or no record, as long as her ladyship's around, you've got to behave yourself. It is absurd asking me to behave myself. Quite absurd. I must rattle my chains and groan through keyholes. I must gibber from the oriel window on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. It is my solemn duty to haunt these halls. Uh, that's a lot of ectoplasm. Well, Cuffy, he's the family ghost. American's child. What can a people without ancestors know about ghosts? Now, wait a minute. You never heard of the, uh, the headless horseman? Or Red Grange the galloping ghost? Or uh, Mrs. Pruneface? <laughs> Provincial stuff. Spirits with neither crest nor title. Titles? Well, what about Count Basie, Duke Ellington, the king of SWAT? Nobility and a democracy, balderdash. What's your Simon? We've had democracy here in England ever since the Magna Carta. Madam, I have never chosen to recognize it. But you should, Sir Simon. That's what we're fighting this war about. That's the stuff, my lady. You see, you're not afraid of bed. Oh. Now that you two Cantervilles are acquainted, you must have a lot of family matters to gab about. So I'll get on with my cleaning. You sure you're all right, m'lady? Yes, thank you. I'll see you later. Unless you're Simon, you'd rather be alone. Oh, no, no, please. Pray sit down. I've forgotten my manners. Well, if I may say so, you could have been a little more polite to Cuffy just now. After what he and his band of hooligans did to me, I may have very little else. But I still have my pride. But you frighten them. I must frighten people. I have a reputation to uphold. The most fearsome phantom in all England. Cuffy told me that they chased you up the chimney last night. That's because they wore those ghastly masks and shrouds. Lady Jessica, I can pretend no longer. Since last night, it is I who am frightened. I who tremble at the slightest noise. Oh, you poor, 
poor ghost. Do you know what it means to be a ghost? To live in emptiness between heaven and earth with nothing for company but bitter memories? But do you have to keep on being a ghost? I am condemned to be a ghost until a kinsman performs a brave deed in my behalf. If I could only rest, if I could only die, oh, to be buried in the soft brown earth in the garden beyond the pine woods, to have no yesterday and no tomorrow. Oh, dear, I wish I could do a brave deed for you. How's it go, lady? Oh, fine. Sorry to bust this reunion up, but the Louis will be back in a minute. Goodbye, Sir Simon. And I'm very happy to have met you. Milady. Cuffy, I think you ought to tell your friends not to chase him up the chimney anymore. Well, that depends on him. But he's so old and sleepy. Hey. Oh! Hey, take it easy. I stumbled on my shoelace. It's untied. Well, stand still. I'll tie it for you. Cuffy. Huh? What's that on your neck? That oh, that's, mark. That's just a birthmark. Hey. Hey, where are you going? There's something I've got to tell Sir Simon. It's very important. I've got to tell him. Sir Simon. Sir Simon. Are you back so uh, <coughs> soon, my lady? Cassie, Cuffy has a Canterville birthmark on his neck. What, that American ruffian? He must be a Canterville. Isn't that wonderful? Well, Gad, if he be a Canterville, shall I prance around joyously like a saucy antelope? But, but if Cuffy is a Canterville, and if he does a brave deed for you, he can save you, can't he? Can it be that they have concealed from thee why I am still here? Dost fancy it is merely because I cannot find the kinsman? Well, I've overheard Mr. Potter say that all the Cannavilles always turn out to be cowards. But that isn't true, is it? Cowards? Gross flattery. Had they twice the courage, to only give them half the name. Sir Simon. Thy grandfather, would he mount a horse? Thy father, so fearful of water that he trembled in his bath. Or thyself swooning at the mere sight of my shadow. Really, now, it's your family, too, Sir Simon. Only too well do I know it. But Cuffy can save you. I know it. Mm. It isn't true that all Cannavilles have to turn out to be cowards. I was a coward, wasn't I? I was frightened to death of you. And now look at me. I'm not afraid of you in the least. Oh, don't you see, Sir Simon? Nay, nay, it is in the Canterville blood and bones. It isn't in my blood and bones, and it isn't in Cuffy's. Oh, I'll, I'll arrange for you to meet him again. Tonight, in the garden beyond the pine woods. And if it turns out that he is a Canterville, my goodness, maybe you'll be able to go to sleep. Very well, my child. At seven, I gibber in the portrait gallery, following which I practice horrible hallucinations. If these go well, I'll meet thee in the garden shortly before eight. Act two of The Canterville Ghost, starring Charles Lawton, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake, will continue in a moment. Now, let's listen in on a conversation in one of Hollywood's popular restaurants. Oh, no dessert for me, just coffee. Oh, dear, this new diet. Why, Betty, what are you staring at? That girl at the table in the corner. She has on a rayon print dress just like yours. Where? Oh, oh, she must have bought it last year, too. What do you mean? Yours looks brand new. Oh, heavens, no. I got it at the beginning of last summer. Well, you'd never know it. Hers looks much older than that, sort of faded and washed out. No. <laughs> she probably did wash it out the wrong way. Better not wash yours, then, if that's what happened. Oh, silly, I've done it lots of times already. No. But they look so different. You must have a knack. No knack, just Lux Flakes. I always use them, and I never had a dress look like that in my life. Shh, not so loud. She's coming this way. Well, it'd do her good to listen. Yes, it would help that girl to know about Lux Flakes. Actual washing tests prove that gentle Lux Care keeps colors lovely up to three times as long. So don't risk wash day methods that are hard on fabrics. Strong soap, hot water, rough handling can make colors look drab far too soon. Let Lux keep your washables lovely longer. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. (laughs) 
Act Two of The Cantival Ghost, starring Charles Lawton as Sir Simon, Margaret O'Brien as Lady Jessica, and Tom Drake as Coffee Williams. Nightfall envelops the massive turrets of Canterville Castle. In a garden beyond the pine woods, Lady Jessica and Cuffy Williams patiently await the ghost of Sir Simon. Suddenly, Jessica sees a faint phosphorescent glow. Her face brightens in response. Here we are, Sir Simon. Here we are. See, I brought him. Hiya, Sir Simon. What's cooking? Cooking? Yeah, I mean, what's all the mystery? Go on, Sir Simon, ask him. Uh... Well, uh, uh, tell me, prithee, dost thou by any miracle remember aught of thine ancestors? Ancestors? Well, my old man would never look his up. Said he was afraid one might turn up that ended in the hot seat. <laughs> hot seat? <laughs> Nowadays, England and America have everything in common except, of course, the language. Think back, Cuffy, and try to remember. Well, I had an Aunt Martha. She was a little wacky on the subject. Traced my mother's family tree back to some guy that landed in Massachusetts way, way back. Name was, uh, Marmalade. No, no. Mount Morency. No, uh, Marmaduke. That same Marmaduke who fled to Salem after Cromwell scattered the chivalry of England to the four winds? Oh, Sir Simon. You knew him? The son of my brother Anthony. Oh, now, now, take it easy. How do you know it's the same Marmaduke? By the birthmark of the Cantervilles, observe, beneath the ruffle of my collar. Holy cats. A birthmark, same as mine. Now show me thine, please. <laughs> Holy cats, indeed. What did I tell you? Well, I'll be... Well, that makes me your, uh... His nephew. Great, great, great nephew. Aye, thou art a kinsman, a kinsman who can free me from these earthly bonds. Huh? By performing a brave deed in his name. You mean that's all I have to do? Thou art a Canterville, the bluest blood in all broad England. Wilt wear my signet ring and carry it into battle in my behalf? You must say it in Cuffy. He's so old and tired. Okay, it's a deal. The first time they turn me loose on those nuts. I shall be everlastingly grateful, nephew. I too. Thumbs up, Uncle. It's in the bag. Good night, Sir Simon. Good night. And Godspeed, oh, Father, grant that he be not like the others. Hey, fellas, get a load of this. Get a load of what? It's a bullet from the lieutenant. Well, will you listen to this? Because of inefficiency of the platoon billeted at Canterville Castle, cause of which has not yet been satisfactorily explained, all leaves to London are hereby canceled. Oh. I could tell him the cause. Nobody around here can get me sleep. How can we sleep with a ghost in a joint? What gets me is that Louis still thinks we stayed up all night shooting crap. If he'd only seen the hey, ghost. Hey, wait a minute. Perhaps we can take a picture of the ghost. Yeah, with a camera. <laughs> hey, listen, you guys. Why don't you lay off that poor old ghost? He's perfectly harmless. Harmless, huh? He just ruined our weekend. Well, he's just doing his job. A ghost has to groan through keyholes and rattle chains. Why the sudden sympathy? Well, I got a sort of personal interest in him. Gentlemen, I have every reason to believe that I am the long-lost Duke of Canterville, the bluest blood in all England. Oh, the Duke of Canterville yet, eh? Seems to me I seen you in the induction center, buddy. <laughs> if I were you, I'd be careful what I said and did, see? Like what? Well, like loafing on my lawn. So this is your private lawn, huh, Dookie? Yeah. Only you can lie on it? Yeah. Excuse me, your grace... Then why? Hey! <laughs> Sit on him, Eddie, and leave us remove as royal britches. It's an old English custom. Sure. The pants and the duke. <laughs> hey, cut it off. I got him. Here's his pants. Okay, dookie, now you can get hey, up. Hey, fellas, look. Here comes a carriage. It's Lady Jessica and a dame. Give me my pants. Get behind us, Cuffy. Gather around him. Jensen's dame's coming. Yeah, oh, okay, okay, cover him on. Good afternoon. Hello. Oh. This is my aunt, Mrs. Calverdine. How do you do? Cuffy, won't you come and meet my aunt? Well, if you don't mind, I'd better meet her from back here. <laughs> How do you do? Why are you hiding behind the others? Oh, oh, it's just sort of a, a military procedure, Lady Jessica. Cuffy, I mean all of you. Auntie said I might invite you to the party in the village this afternoon. Oh, thank you very much. It's only a Saturday at home dance. But there'll be refreshments. Dames, too? I mean, scoits? I mean, girls? Oh, yes. 
And you'll all come? Four o'clock at the service center. Don't forget. Hey, fellas, wait! Hey, fellas, wait! My pants! Auntie, look at Cuffy. Well, what sort of a uniform is that? Why, Cuffy's wearing kilt. nice of you to dance with me, Cuffy. Oh, not at all, my lady. But I'm afraid I'll never learn this kind of dancing. <laughs> Why, you're cutting the rug to ribbons. Cutting the rug? Well, what I mean is you give with a jive. How's it feel to be a slick chick? Fine. But does it always make you so dizzy? <laughs> okay, okay. What do you say to a glass of punch? Hey, Cuffy. Hey, Cuffy, come here. What do you want? Oh, hiya, Sarge. I want you should settle an argument. Let's see what this is all about, Jessica. What kind of an argument? Good afternoon, Mr. Cawthorn. Uh, good afternoon, m'lady. Cuffy, I was telling Mr. Cawthorn, the lieutenant thinks it's applesauce about the ghost. Oh? As a native of Canterville, gentlemen, I believe you saw the ghost right enough. But the day will never dawn when he'll run from a human being. Okay, Dookie, you tell him. Dookie? Yeah, Cuffy here. He's the Duke of Canterville. Ain't you, Cuff? Uh, uh, well, in a manner of speaking, I'm, uh, well, what's the joke? My dear boy, if you wanted to impersonate a British nobleman, you'd never chose a cat of, uh, oh, with the Lady Jessica, my profound apologies. And just what's wrong with being a Canterville? Well, since you're so well acquainted with the ghost, sir, I suggest that you ought to keep... Yes, yes, I think I will. Cubby, please, will you dance with me again? Sure, sure, my lady. Hey, Sir Simon, cut it out, will you? Cut it out. Mm, who's that? It's me, Cuffy. I've been looking for you since midnight. Where have you been? In the North Turret, gibbering. I'm sorry you overheard. I'm in poor voice tonight. Look, if you're supposed to hang around here until a Canterville does a brave deed for you, how come you're still here after 300 years? Oh, I've been waiting for you to ask that. And all that time, someone must have tried to help you. Excuse me, I really must get back to work. Now, wait a minute. Quit stalling. What's wrong with the Cantervilles? If you're trying to hold out on me, I'll... Nay, 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 kinsman. I was merely trying to spare thee. Spare me what? Go on, spill it. Mayhap it is better if thine ancestors speak for themselves. Come with me into the portrait gallery. This is the portrait gallery, nephew. Hey, would you look at those pictures? Gaze upon them, our noble family. Sir Gerald de Canterville, proud skipper of the frigate Cranston. When she sank, he was the first to leave the ship. <laughs> Sir Andrew de Canterville, he saw a grenadier lose a finger at Blenheim battle and swooned away. And the blessed twins, Lieutenant Paul, rode the wrong way in the charge of the light brigade. Lieutenant Peter was ten lengths ahead of him. You mean they were all cowards? All I, of all the heroic families that, that, that for centuries have brightened the glory of England, ours had to be a brood of lily-livered titmice. So that's why you held out. You thought if I found out, I'd be the same way. Oh, nay, nay, not at all. It never entered my mind. Well, then, what are you making all the fuss about? I don't care what the others did. This is Cuppy Williams, see? I verily. Well, all right, then. That's all I wanted to find out. I've got to get back to my bunk before the sergeant misses me. A dear kinsman. Would that I be could believe that he were different. All right, men. This is it. Start loading the trucks. Battle equipment. Walker, look after dynamite, plunge your boxes, fuse and the wires. We're going over. Okay, Sarge. Williams, take off that ring. It'll shine in the dark. Okay. And don't stick it in your pocket if it's worth anything. Well, it's sort of a family heirloom. You better leave it in the castle. Make it snappy. This is it, huh, Sarge? I have not to tell you this, but you'll know soon enough. We're crossing the channel. We're making a raid on the coast of France. All right, let's go. Start bringing up the truck. Down the truck. Cuffy, 
Jesse, you're going away. Looks like it, Lady Jessica. Then maybe you'll have a chance to do a brave deed. Maybe you'll save Sir Simon. Listen, lady, I know there's a yellow streak down the family back a mile wide. Sir but Simon you, told me. But you're not going to let it worry you. Well, how do you think it makes me feel? Cuffy, you told me yourself you don't have to be afraid. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Cuffy, I believe in you. And if you have any children of your own, I know they'll believe in you. Children? I haven't any children. I haven't even got a wife. Well, maybe you'll want to marry someday. Somebody. Well, that's the last thing on my mind. Now, lay off. I gotta get going. Cuffy. Oh, Cuffy. Goodbye, Cuffy. Off to the wars. <laughs> Our kinsman hies himself to battle. Oh, Sir Simon. Oh, there, there, there. Now, now, milady. But I'm so worried about Cuffy. Tears never steeled a noble heart to valor. Upon the craven foe, our hero's furious might will... You're worried. How do you think I feel? Our stars, Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake will continue with the Canterville Ghost in just a moment. Who are you phoning, Sally? I'm getting a weather report. Have some blankets to wash soon. But what's the weather got to do with it? Shh. 5 p.m., temperature 73 degrees, humidity 49%. Tonight clear, lowest temperature about 64. Tomorrow, sunny and mild, highest temperature about 75 degrees, gentle to moderate winds. 5 p.m., temperature... Of course, that isn't really how it will be all over the country tomorrow. But in lots of cities, you can get an up-to-the-hour weather report over the phone. Will you please tell me what all this has to do with washing blankets? Why, obviously, you need a good day for it. Not too hot, not too cold, not too windy. Do women wash blankets in the middle of June? That's the best time, before storing them away for the summer. Moths are particular. They don't like clean wool as well as soiled wool. So just whisk your blankets through rich, lukewarm Lux suds. Hold on, Sally. I can't see a woman whisking a, a wet, heavy blanket through anything. Oh, it's easy with Lux. Just make sure you have lots and lots of suds. The suds do the work. Wouldn't a machine help? <laughs> sure, if you're lucky enough to have one. But don't run the machine too long. That's as bad as rubbing. Too much agitation mats and shrinks the wool, leaves it harsh and scratchy. Three, three to five minutes is about right for a machine. And use gentle Lux flakes so your blankets will stay soft and fluffy. Be sure to hang the blankets in the shade over two or three parallel lines. That way, the air can circulate through it, and the weight of the water won't pull it out of shape. Thanks for the tip, Sally. You certainly deserve a B.A. for all that advice. Bachelor of Arts? No, Blanket Authority. Now back to Hunt Stromberg and our stars. Act Three of The Canterville Ghost, starring Margaret O'Brien as Lady Jessica, Charles Lawton as Sir Simon, and Tom Drake as Coffee Williams. <laughs> In the black of night, a handful of American rangers have landed somewhere on the coast of France and are creeping stealthily inland. Back in England, the Canterville ghost rages in the portrait gallery, bolstering his anemic hopes by hurling defiance at his ancestors. Ye skulking, cringing, misbegotten peafowls, ye insults painted upon canvas, ye wretched poltroons, not for long now shall I have you leering at me with cynical mockery. Not for long, ye dribble pusses. <laughs> A kinsman worthy of the name now wears my signet ring in battle. Meanwhile, in the cottage on the castle grounds, a sleepless Lady Jessica bolsters her hopes in the way most mortals do. Lord, don't let him get hurt. And Uncle Simon, he's such a poor, funny old ghost. And he's so tired. Please let Cuffy do a brave deed for him so he can go to sleep at last. And please let Cuffy come back. Ye gallery of lily-livered rabbits, ye shake-kneed milksops, well mayest thou, thou, thou cower in thy gilded frame, shamed by a colonial, 
by Cuffy Williams. As for thee, fat Algernon, who posed for two years as a dowager to escape fighting a duel, I spit in thine eye. <laughs> thee, Sir Percival, who fought through the Thirty Years' War without firing a shot, thee also. <laughs> From yonder bunk in yonder room has risen a lion-hearted kingsman. Yonder bunk. What gleams there in the moonlight? The ring, the signet ring, imbecile, don't, he has forgotten it. I must speak to him before it's too late, before it's too late! Okay, men, you're on enemy territory. Now remember, we're here for one purpose only, to blow up the oil refinery. Right. Yes, Refinery's got to go at 2350. Now check your watches. It's now 2307. 2307. Jordan, Baker, William. Yes, yes sir. Get off the road and set up the machine gun in the ditch. If you see any Jerry's, it's up to you to hold them off till the rest of us get back. Check, check, sure. check. Jordan, you'll find telephone wires down the road. Cut them and get back to Cuffy and Trigger. Now get going. Okay, right. Sarge, see you later, kid. The rest of us will go up this side road. Now, after the explosion, wait till the last man has reached the shore. Then join us. Yes, sir. Okay, and good luck. Cuffy? Yeah? There's a hill right in back of us. Get up there and keep watch. What about you? I'll set up the machine gun. If you see anything, get back here on the double. Okay. <laughs> Who's that? Who's there? All are our fire. Spare your bullets, kinsman. It's only I. Oh, what the devil are you doing you here? You forgot the ring. You left it in the castle. Here, nephew. Get away from me. Put it in thy pocket. Only have it on thy person when the test comes. All right. Give it here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, nephew. Uh, thinkest thou the enemy will come this way? That isn't what's worrying you. Oh, plague take it, man, with but half an eye one can see that thou hast the courage of St. George. Horse feathers, get out of here, will you? I merely thought I could bolster you up in case you were a bit squeamish. I want to be squeamish. Hey, Cuffy. Yeah? You all right? Sure. What time is it? 23.50. Who dost thou converse with? Look, Sir Simon, I thought I told you to scram. <laughs> What mighty blast is that? The refinery, they've blown it up. Nephew, look down yonder road. Motorcycles. Jerry's. Keep a cool head. Keep a cool head. Keep a cool head. Trigger! Trigger! Motorcycles are patrol! Get down here and hold the ammunition belt. Keep a cool head. Keep a cool head. Get out of here. Beat it! Huh? Oh, nothing. Look. Look, Trigger, Jerry's. Lots of them. What are you waiting for? Nothing. Trigger. Trigger, what's the matter? What's the matter? Looks like you've got to take over, Cuffy. Trigger. Cuffy. Get him, Cuffy. Get him. The machine gun. Jordan, be back soon. To hell. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan. Fire, nephew. Fire. Fire. Nephew. Nephew! Blood. Trigger's blood. Nephew, they're drawing closer. Fire! Blood. Cuffy, what's the matter with you? Trigger, Trigger's dead. Get out of here. Give me that machine gun. Give me it, you fool. At ease, men. Well, men, the Colonel's compliments, and after last night's raid, he wants me to tell you we're the best so and so platoon in the whole outfit. <laughs> But I'm not satisfied. So we're going to take a little jaunt into these woods and iron out the mistakes we made right now. Williams. Uh, yes, sir. Here a minute. Yes, sir. All right, Fritz. Williams, I've discussed your case with the colonel. We, uh, we've both considered what happened last night, and he feels that we have no alternative but to transfer you back to your old outfit. Yes, sir. Fine up there. Now, remember, Williams, there are many men who may be psychologically unfit for combat who can still perform useful roles in service. Now, pack up your things. I'll arrange for your transfer when we get back from maneuvers. All right. Thank you, sir. Good luck, Williams. Yeah, the platoon is formed. All right, Sergeant. Left. Face. Right shoulder. Turn. Forward. Turn. Cuffy, Cuffy, I've been expecting you all morning. What happened? Oh, you'd better run along home, lady. I've got to go in and pack. You're going away? Yeah. Oh, Cuffy. That's right. Look at me. I'm a cannibal, all right. Just as cowardly as the rest of them. Don't say that. You're not a coward. 
You're brave. I know it. I know it. All right, lady, have it your own way. Coffee. I'm sorry it turned out like this. Bye, lady. Oh, Coffee. <laughs> Wretched me that I should have pinned my faith again upon a Canterville. Oh, pipe down, Sir Simon, will you? And get down off that chandelier. It makes me nervous. Nervous, I that I well believe. Oh, shut up. Get on. I've got to pack. Pack, then, and leave me to my fate. Thou who hast raised my hopes only to dash them like a robin on a rock of granite. Cuffy, Cuffy. Oh, my lady, you can't come in here. I know it's your castle, but... Well, this is barracks. Covey, there's a parachute. I saw it coming down. Parachute? parachute? It'd be a Nazi came down in it. Oh, Covey, what will we do? Well, where did you see it? On this side of the stone bridge. Well, where is the stone bridge? Do you know the old side road? No. Then I'll take you there. I know a shortcut. All right, come on. No, 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 wait. Where's my rifle? All right, come on. We'll grab a seat. Hurry. There, there it is, Cuffy. The parachute. Yeah, caught in a tree. I don't see anybody, but you'd better stay here. I'm going to look around. Duck down in the jeep. Keep down now. Cuffy, look over there. Huh? All through our woods, those men, who are they? Oh, well, don't worry about them. They're rangers. Maneuvers. Yeah, that's where I'd be if I hadn't... Cuffy, what is it? In the bushes. A parachute mine, a bomb, a blockbuster. Oh, let's get out of here, lady. That thing goes off, it'll kill every living thing within a half a mile. We gotta get... Oh, the rangers. They're scattered all through the woods, they'll be killed. Get back to the castle, quick, run! Aren't you coming? No, I've got to drag it away with the jeep, dump it over the cliff. Get going, run now, run! Hide in the cellar! Run! Lady Jessica? Oh, Uncle Simon. Where's Cuffy? Has he encountered the enemy? Oh, no. Cuffy's moving the blockbuster. He's doing the bravest deed there ever was. Gad, darest I believe again? Where? This way, down through here. Oh. There. Oh, save thy breath, child. Look to his quaking knees, his eyes that tremble with the ague, his hand that shrinks from contact with yon lethal instrument, the portrait of a Canterville. No, Uncle, no. Coffee, coffee. Cuffy, you're not afraid. You're not. I... I can't. I can't touch it. There's a timer on it. The least little jar would set a ticking. I... Well... Cuffy, you were doing a brave deed. Don't you see? You can do it. You don't have to be afraid because you're a Canterville. Look, Cuffy, I'm not afraid of the bomb. Look, Cuffy, I'm k kicking it. Look, Cuffy, look, I'm not afraid. That sounds... It's ticking. You started it ticking. Okay, lady. Thanks for the lesson. I'm all right now. You run for it. Go on, get out of here. This thing goes off in 60 seconds. Oh, Cuffy. Hurry, I'm dragging this thing out of here. Go on, get out of my way, my lady. Run for it. Careful, nephew, careful. Hop in, Uncle. Keep your eye on the tow chain. Let me know if it slips. Well, we're out of the underbrush. Hold on now. Oops. Yes. Nephew, look out, the rangers. Hey, you rangers, run for your lives. I got a blockbuster on here. A time bomb. Run, blockbuster. Oops. Ouch. Where are we going, nephew? To the cliff. We'll dump it in the ravine if we get that far. How many more seconds? I don't know, maybe 20. Five, six, seven, eight, whoops, 10, 11. There's a ravine. We better jump. Let the jeep take it over. There she goes! Well, we made it. 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Say, what's all this hooey about ticking? Oh, it's a dud. We never were in any danger. All that work for... Jessica, dear, thank goodness you're all right. It, it must have been an air raid. No, it was Cuffy. Cuffy? Near the stone bridge. 
A bomb from a parachute. Cuppy blew it up. Cuppy saved everyone. And if Cuppy blew it up, then he's blowing up too. Roll out the barrels. We'll have a barrel of fun. Roll out the barrels. We've got the blues on the run. Cuffy, Cuffy. Now's the time to roll the barrels for the gang's all here. Cuffy, Cuffy, you're alive. What happened? Happened? I just dumped a cockeyed thing right into the ravine. Like St. George slaying the cockeyed dragon. What's your assignment? What, child? If Cuffy's a cannibal, and if Cuffy did a brave deed for you, then why are you still here? Hmm? Yeah. Why aren't you in the garden beyond the pine woods? Yea, verily. Why not? Well, if you're going, you'd better hurry up. Here come the rangers. Father! Father! Why am I still in mortal coils? Look. Uncle Simon's glowing. Hey, Scott, Lieutenant, look! The ghost! <laughs> Thank you, nephew. Thank you, niece. Farewell. Farewell. He's gone. Did you see that, Lieutenant? Yeah, that's what we've been trying to... Hey, Lieutenant! Hey, guys, the Louis has fainted. <laughs> Uncle Simon's grave. The garden beyond the pine woods. It looks mighty restful here. Isn't it nice that he can have a little plot to call his own? And a headstone of his own, too. Well, that was the ranger's idea. We had it inscribed, see? Sir Simon de Canterville, 1603-1943. Gee, that's a long time to go without sleep. Yes, but you nearly always have to wait for something that you want very much, Cuffy. How old are you? How old? Why? I shall be eight in May. Our stars, Charles Lawton, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake, will turn for their curtain calls in just a moment. Meanwhile, here are Patty and Kay planning their vacation. Oh, I don't think you'd like that place, Patty, even if it is so nearby. I was there last summer, and it was awfully noisy. Oh, but it sounds good. Beach, tennis, dancing every night. Well, that's just the trouble. It's right near a Coast Guard station, and the boys come over to the dances. And sometimes everybody ends up singing. It's impossible to get any sleep. <laughs> Why, Kay, you sound like an old fuss budget. I thought you liked dancing. Well, well, there were more girls than fellows, and... Well, a little thing like that shouldn't stop a cute gal like you, unless... What? Oh, skip it. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Patty Have you did... seen the new movie at Proctor's? Patty didn't forget what she had in mind, but how could she tell Kay what she was really thinking? Kay's cute enough to get any man she wants. If only she were as sweet and fresh as she looks. But you just can't tell even your best friend that she's careless about daintiness. If I could only give her a hint about luxing under things after every wearing, luxing her dresses and blouses often, if I could tell her how fresh and sweet it leaves them, then she wouldn't risk offending. She'd have all the fun she deserves. Gentle Lux Care does protect daintiness, and it's kind to fabrics, too. Keeps lovely underthings new-looking three times as long. Don't use hot water, strong soap, or handle nice things roughly. That kind of treatment makes them look faded and drab far too soon. Lux is thrifty care. Here's Hunt Stromberg and our stars. Back to our footlights come Margaret O'Brien and Tom Drake, along with the ex-phantom of our cast, Charles Lawton, now very much in the flesh. Must you put it quite that way, very much in the flesh? I don't think well, right. actually, Charles, you look as if you'd lost a little weight. <laughs> lost a little weight? No, no, it's around here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Lawton, you carried plenty of weight as a ghost, didn't he, Margaret? Mr. Lawton's my favorite ghost. Have you ever met a real ghost, Margaret? No, but I'd like to. I think you would, Margaret. There's no reasons why ghosts shouldn't be highly useful citizens. <laughs> But rather expendable in wartime, wouldn't you say, Mr. Lawton? No, there might be lots of useful things a ghost could do in wartime, frighten the enemy. Give a pint of blood to the Red Cross? Well, I'm not so sure of that. Ghosts haven't much to spare. <laughs> well, they could give their clanking chains and creaking armor to the scrap drive. 
Maybe they could sell war bonds. Right, Margaret. They could promote the sale of war bonds over a ghost-to-ghost -ghost network. <laughs> Wouch. <laughs> or indirectly by haunting the conscience of individuals so chicken-hearted as to not to buy their fullest share. Do you buy war bonds, Margaret? That's how I spend all my money. Well, you couldn't find a better way to spend it. And if you go to see Tom Drake in Metro Goldwyn Mayer's This Man's Navy, you'll get an idea of where your money's going in building the greatest navy in the world, about to meet its greatest test in history. Well, I don't think any of us need too much persuading to buy war bonds, Mr. Stromberg. Uh, tell us, what are you going to have in this theater next week? Next Monday night, we bring you one of the most talked-of dramas of the year, The Woman in the Window, starring Edward G. Robinson, Joan Bennett, and Dan Durier. If you ever felt sympathy for a murderer, you will in this gripping story of a man who is trapped to kill in self-defense and teams with a woman to conceal their crime from the police. Well, for sheer suspense, I don't think I know any more exciting play than The Woman in the Window. We'll be listening, Mr. Stromberg. Good night. Good night. Good night, Hi. Margaret. All our thanks. <laughs> our sponsors, the makers of Lux Lake, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson, Joan Bennett, and Dan Durier in The Woman in the Window. This is Hunt Stromberg saying good night from Hollywood. <laughs> the Canterville Ghost was presented through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Anchors Away. Hunt Stromberg's next picture will be Young Widow, starring Jane Russell. Charles Lawton will soon be seen in the Benedict Boges picture, Captain Kidd. Heard in tonight's cast were Eric Snowden, Boyd Davis, Claire Verdera, Ed Emerson, Gerald Moore, Gloria Gordon, Eddie Marr, Clifton Young, Robert Cole, Charles Seal, and Norman Field. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear The Woman in the Window with Edward G. Robinson, Joan Bennett, and Dan Durier. met in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in man's mind. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Oh, well, 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 hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, <laughs> darling, the man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charm. <laughs> but my husband loves me, Jim must be my fatal fascination. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, yeah, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well, there's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. 
You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. The door's open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. What do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo, tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happened. All right. Mrs. Browning! <laughs> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me. A wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby ass. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. It's ghastly cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. <laughs> You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive. Oh, almost anyway. Sandy. The footprints, they disappear. Oh, maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? Uh, no. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, God, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago... My husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning... How much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. 
day and night. <laughs> you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, you're not going to take Blackie with you. Well, of course I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. Here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice day. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat. Call <laughs> My chubby aunt. It is him. Oh, excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Sandra, I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now, come on, stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile, but I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for ghosts. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. <laughs> quiet, quiet, Blackie. You'll scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. Coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Yes, Mrs. Darling, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Bonnie. Paul, oh, Paul, stop this horrible Cut thing. Cut me. Cut me. Cut me. It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. It's all right, darling. Oh, it's 
It's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning, she's dead. tells Detective Hodges that a flesh-and-blood woman gets bumped off by a ghost. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind, we'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh, Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, uh, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happened. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, oh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty-night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see, it's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. Here, Blackie, come here, come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie, poor doggie. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. 
if people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone... Couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where do I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room... It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. <laughs> shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand. Reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Great Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around us! Sandra! Sandra! Ah! against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. Sandra, you're safe now on your own home. Just lie still, darling, and drink this. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me... I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but, Paul, well, The room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. Did you hurt yourself climbing that petition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. That's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an icebox. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. Bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look, here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint. Faint and... Is this something... 
unearthly. He's moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No. The blasted thing. Oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves, so my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul! Paul, look! Look in that corner! Mr. Richards, you... you are alive. Yes, alive. Quite alive. Because I will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything. I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us, closing in. Yes, oh. closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down! Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards! No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the petition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Shadow of a Doubt, starring Anne Blythe and Ray Milland. Now to introduce tonight's program, here is our director, Fletcher Markle. Tonight, we introduce to you, rather nervously, a gentleman known as Mr. Charles Oakley. Also as Mr. Charles Spencer and Mr. Charles Otis. But mostly, he's Uncle Charlie. And when he's being Uncle Charlie, the family favorite... This man is probably a lot like someone you may know yourself. Tall, attractive, with a slight blur of gray at the temples, who often wears a curious, preoccupied expression, as if he had an important secret to keep. But we hope you don't know anyone with a secret like the Uncle Charlie in Thornton Wilder and Sally Benson's story, Shadow of a Doubt, because life with anyone like him is quite unpredictable, as you shall hear. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Spencer. Mr. Spencer. Yes? Oh. Mr. Spencer, I hate to bother you. I, I knew you was resting, but I thought you'd like to know there was two men here. Two men asking for you. A young man and a kind of a older man. The, the older man was here twice before. They were sorry you wasn't in. I... I said you wasn't. Mrs. Teeler, don't stand there. Don't behave like a landlady. Come in and sit down. Well. And close the door. Forgive me for not getting up. It's good to lie down and rest on a hot day. Did they uh, say they'd be back? They didn't say exactly, but I think they will. Just now when I had to walk down the AMP, I seen them standing there at the corner. <laughs> Maybe I, I should have let them in, only you said not to disturb you and... and... Yes? And I'm sure they'll be back. Mr. Spencer, you do look awful tired to me, and that's a fact. Maybe New Jersey doesn't agree with you. Maybe you got a headache or something. I think maybe you need a real rest. That's what I think. Maybe I do, Mrs. Tilly. Well, I, I better go, and you better lock the door when I'm gone. Those friends of yours told me not to say they called, wanted to surprise you, but I thought you'd like to know somehow. Thank you, Mrs. Tilly. You go ahead with your nap. I'll pull a blind down. You rest now, Mr. Spencer. You rest. No. No! Yes. You're there. Down at the corner. But what do you know? You're bluffing. You don't know anything. You've got nothing on me. I'll get out the back way. Operator, Western Union, please. What do they know? They're bluffing. And it was very easy getting out the back way. Western Union? Oh, I want to send a telegram to uh, Mrs. Joseph Newton, Santa Rosa, California. That's right. Here's the message. You ready? Homesick for you all. Coming to stay a while. Arriving Wednesday. We'll wire exact time later. Love to everybody and a kiss for little Charlie from her Uncle Charlie. Yes, operator. That's the signature. Uncle Charlie. Yeah, that's right. Going to Santa Rosa, California. <laughs> Charlie. Charlotte. Who is it? It's me. Oh, come in, Papa. Well, look at you all stretched out on the bed at five o'clock in the afternoon. What's the matter? Don't you feel well? Oh, I'm perfectly well. I've just been thinking for hours, and I've come to the conclusion that I give up. I simply give up. Hmm. I'll sit down if you don't mind. What are you going to give up? Have you ever stopped to think that a family should be the most wonderful thing in the world and that this family has just gone to pieces? We have? Of course we have. We just sort of go along and nothing happens and we've gotten in a terrible rut. Oh, come now. Things aren't that bad. The bank gave me a raise last January. Money. How can you sit there and talk about money when I'm talking about souls? We eat and sleep and that's about all. We don't even have any real conversations. We just talk. And work. Yes, poor mother, she works like a dog. Uh, what uh, were you thinking of doing about it? Oh, nothing, I suppose. I guess we'll just have to wait for a miracle or something. Oh, you two are up here, Uncle. Oh, here she is. In Charlie's room, Emmy. All I'm waiting for is a miracle. Now, Charlie. Well, what's all this about? Oh, what's the matter, Charlie? Joe, what's the matter? Well, it seems Oh, like... it's just that I've become a nagging old maid and... <laughs> Oh, Mama, you went downtown in that awful hat you promised me you'd throw away. Mother! Goodness, what on earth does it matter what hat I put on? Mother! And Roger! Yes, Roger, I know! I don't see why you let that child yell at you like that, Mother. If he has something to say I'm or going downstairs that... in a moment anyway. And I'm going down right now. Hope there'll be some dinner soon. Mama! Mama! I'm going downtown to send a telegram. I want a short walk before dinner anyhow. Why, Charlie, who do you know to send a telegram to? Mom, I know just the person to come and save us. A wonderful person who will come and shake us all up so we'll be good and dignified and intelligent well, again. Charlie, have you gone crazy? What do you mean, save us? All this time, there's been the one real right person to save us. Mama, what's Uncle Charlie's address? 
Wasn't he living in Philadelphia last we heard? Darling, you're not going to ask Uncle Charlie for money. No, no, that wouldn't help us. I just want him to come. Oh, but think of asking a busy man like that to come all the way out west for nothing. He'd come for me. I'm named after him. I'm going to go right now and, and wire him right away. <laughs> Charlotte, I just called up your house a little while ago, a telegram for your mother. Oh, did you, Mrs. Seastrom? Uh-huh. Well, here you are. It's from your uncle, the spoiled one. My uncle? My uncle Charlie? Oh, let me look. Yes, youngest ones in a family always get spoiled the most, I guess. That's the way it was with my young brother. Mrs. Seastrom, hmm? do you believe in telepathy? Well, I ought to. It's my business. Oh, no, no, not telegraphy. Mental telepathy. Like, well, suppose you have a thought. And suppose the thought's about someone who's in tune with you. And then over thousands of miles, that someone knows what you're thinking and they answer you. And it's all mental. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I send telegrams the normal way. Give my regards to your mother. He heard me. Uncle Charlie heard me. like it here in Santa Rosa, Mr. Otis. Nice little town. I'm sure it is. I got all your bags here ready to unload. I'll help you down, Mr. Otis. Here, let me take your arm. Thank you. That's it. I sure hope you feel better, Mr. Otis. Too bad you had to stay in your room all the way. There you are, sir. Thank you very much. Here, yeah, you've been very kind. Oh, thank you, Mr. Otis. Thank you, sir. Look, down there, I think that's him. Oh, I think it is, too. Yes, I think so. Are you... Are Why, you... young Charlie. Oh. <laughs> oh, gosh, at first I didn't know you. You look so sick standing there. Why, you aren't sick, are you? Me sick? Papa, Papa, here he is. Oh, I thought so. Why, Uncle Charlie, you aren't sick. That was the funniest thing, the way you were standing there. Come on, let's go. Mother's waiting at home. But that's enough talk about my travels. All that's past. Dinner's almost over, and we haven't talked at all about you folks. And say, I've been forgetting something all this time. These parcels on the sideboard here. A few things I brought along with me. Now then, here we are. These are for you, Emmy. One new and one old. Oh, Charles, you didn't have to think of me. Presents are for children, Charles. Of course they are. Here you are, Anne, Roger. Oh, thank you, Uncle Charles. What is it? It's sort of lumpy. Open up and see. And this is yours, Joe. For me, Charles? Oh, Joe, look. Oh, really, Charles, a fur scarf. It's Kalinsky, Mama, four skins. Oh, I wanted one all my life. Oh, and it's exactly right, Mama. It's what you should have. Open the little one, Emmy. Why, look at this. Say, I've never had a wristwatch. Fellows at the bank will think I'm quite a sport. I got a big brown bear. <laughs> look what I got. Oh, isn't it wonderful, children? Oh, he was so thanks. Why, so Charles. Charles, the portraits of mother and father in a leather case. Yes, Emmy. Charles, did you have these all along? All along. All these years, safe in a deposit box, stored away safe, no matter where I was. Grandpa and Grandma? Yes. Look, everybody. Let me see, Mama. Gee, 1888, it says. That's over 60 years ago. Oh, she was pretty, and he's sweet, isn't he? Everyone was pretty and sweet then, Charlie. The whole world. A wonderful world, not like the world today. It was great to be young then. But we're happy now, Uncle Charlie, now that you're here... Why, look at us. For once, we're all happy at the same time. And now for your little present, Charlie. Oh, I don't want anything. Right now, I have enough. Before you came, I didn't think I had anything, but now, I don't want another thing. I'll go get the coffee. Excuse Charlotte. me. Charlotte! She's crazy. She doesn't mean it, really. If you ask me, I think she's putting on. She's not crazy. Smartest girl in her class at school. Mm. she like this when she sees it. You folks just sit here and I'll take it to her. Well, tell her the sugar and cream are on the kitchen table, Charles. Jolly? I meant it. Please don't give me anything. Nothing? Why? I can't explain. You came here and Mother's happy and 
I'm glad that she named me after you and that she thinks we're both alike. I think we are, too. I know it. It would spoil things if you should give me anything. You're a strange girl, Charlie. Why would it spoil things? Because we're not just an uncle and a niece. There's something else. I know you. I know that you don't tell people a lot of things. I don't either. I have a feeling that inside you somewhere there's something nobody knows. Something nobody knows? Something secret and wonderful and... <laughs> I'll find it out. It's not good to find out too much, Charlie. But we're kind of like twins, don't you see? We have to know. Give me your hand, Charlie. Now, you wear this ring for me. Thank you. But you haven't looked at it. I don't have to look at it. No matter what you gave me, it'd be the same. Yeah, now, let me show it to you. It's a good emerald, a really good one. And good emeralds are the most beautiful things in the world. Why, why, look, Uncle Charlie, you've had something engraved on it. Oh, that's different. I haven't, but I will if you'd like me to. Oh, but you have, Uncle Charlie, you have. It's very faint. It's way down under the stone. T.S. from B.M. Why, they must be somebody's initials. The jeweler cheated me. It doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't. The jeweler cheated me. It's secondhand. The whole world is crooked. The whole rotten world. Give it back to me. But I like it this way. Someone else was probably happy with it. Give it back ring. to me. I'll have that taken off. No, it's perfect the way it is. Now you bring the sugar and cream and I'll carry the tray. Charlie. Come along. <laughs> Coffee? Not yet, thank you, Emmy. What is that tune I'm singing? Anybody know? Sing at the table, you marry a crazy husband. <laughs> Superstitions have been proved 100% wrong. <laughs> well, to finish what I was about to say, Emmy, I've been thinking about transferring some of my money out here from the East. Deposit it in Joe's bank, say, until I see what's what. I suppose you take money to your bank, Joe? <laughs> That's one thing we do, all right, Charles, rake in the dough. Can't promise to give it back, of course. Well, I'll go down tomorrow morning and open an account, 30 or 40,000, just to start things off right. Say, that's a lot of money. Mm. Oh, I can't get that tune out of my head. If somebody will tell me what it is, maybe I'll stop. It's a waltz, dear. Of course it's a waltz, but what waltz? <laughs> you know it's the funniest thing, but, but sometimes I think of a tune and I can't get it out of my head. And then pretty soon I hear somebody else whistling it or humming it, too. I think tunes jump from head to head. What is it, Uncle Charlie? I don't know. I know what it is. It's right on the tip of my tongue. It's a waltz, and it's Victor Herbert. Victor Herbert wasn't a waltz. He was the composer who composed operettas. It's the Blue Danny Waltz. Oh, of course. That's what it is. No. No, it isn't, Uncle Charlie. It's not the Blue Danube. It's the Merry Witch. Oh! Oh, now look what I did. A half a cup of coffee. I'm terribly sorry, Emmy. Hand me another napkin, Ann, will you? Golly. Oh, now it's nothing to make a fuss about. Charles, while we do the dishes, you go in the living room and stretch out on the sofa and read the evening paper. You look tired. Yes, you do that, Charles. I'm going to walk down to the corner and get some tobacco. Come on, Uncle Charlie. Lead a life of luxury. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> know if you'd like another cup of coffee or anything. No. Thank you, Roger. No. What's the matter, Uncle Charlie? Something bad in the paper? What? No, 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 no. I was just... Roger, look, did you ever make a house out of a newspaper? You see what I mean? First, you stretch them all out on the floor, see? Yeah. And you fold them like this, like a tent. Yeah, and then, then you... Look, now you cut out a door, see? See? It's the doorway. Well, now, what are you all up to in here? Why, Roger, that's Papa's paper. Well, it's my fault, Charlie. I, I was showing Roger a game. I never thought about the paper. Well, it's all right. Let's see. Page five, page one, page seven. Here's part two. But where's page three? Three and four, where is it? I never touched it. Uncle Charlie's the only one that touched it. Well, Papa may not notice if we fold it very neatly and very evenly. That's it, Charlie. Nobody will ever miss it. Uncle Charlie. Come in. I've brought your water, Uncle Charlie. You said you liked a pitcher of water and a glass by your bed. Oh, thank you, my dear. You're 
You're very thoughtful. Uncle Charlie, I know something. I know a secret that you don't think I know. What secret? Well, remember I said you couldn't hide anything away from me because I'd know? Well, now I know there was something in the evening paper about you. About me? In the evening paper? About you. Please show it to me. I won't tell a soul. How do you know there was something? Well, that's why you played that game with Roger. You didn't want us to know, so you tore the paper. So now that I know, you've got to tell me. Well, I guess you have me, but it wasn't about me. It was about someone I used to know. Oh, is this the page over here on the dresser? It's got a piece torn out of Charlie, it. Charlie, wait. That's none of your business. Oh. oh, Uncle Charlie, you're hurting me. Your hand. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Give me the paper. You hurt my wrist. Charlie, I didn't mean to. I must have grabbed you harder than I thought. I, I was just fooling about it. It was just some gossip, not too pretty, about someone I met up with once. Nothing for you to read. Just forget it. And, and don't look at me like that, Charlie. You have eyes like a child. And the piece in the paper was nothing, really. Just like a child. Have I? Good night. Good night, young Charlie. Good night, Uncle Charlie. Pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams, always. <laughs> Breakfast in bed. Such spoiling. Oh, Emmy, you're magnificent. You know, I really can't face the world in the morning. I must have coffee before I can speak. <laughs> what are you all up to this morning? Well, a young man called on us about an hour ago. Said his name was Graham, and he wants to interview everybody in the house. Interview everybody? Yeah, that's what he said. He's been sent around the country by a committee on an institute or something, and he's to pick out representative American families and ask them questions. It's kind of a poll. How'd he happen to pick this family? Oh, he said he looked around and asked around, and he decided we were the ones he wanted. Well, if he's going to ask a lot of questions, he can leave me out of it. Why, you'd have more to tell him than any of us, Charlie. He's going to take our pictures, too. Pictures? Yes. You see, there were really two young men. One takes the pictures. Oh, so there were two of them? No, oh, Mr. Graham was the nicest. He doesn't want us to dress up or anything. He wants us to act just the way we always do. Oh, Emmy, women are fools. They fall for anything. Why do you let two strangers come into your house and turn the place upside down? Why expose your family to a couple of snoopers? I thought you had more sense. Good Charles. Good morning, Uncle Charlie. My, isn't this grand? Good morning, Charlie. <laughs> well, the way Mr. Graham put it, Charles, it wasn't like snooping at all. It was our duty as citizens. Look here, Emmy, I won't have anything to do with it. I'm just a visitor, and my advice to you is to slam the door in his face. Oh, I couldn't do that. I think it's kind of exciting. And they'd take a photograph of you, and then we could have it. It would be free. No, thank you. I've never been photographed in my life, and I don't want to be. Why, Charles, what makes you talk that way? I had a picture of you. I gave it to Charlie. I tell you, there are none. Oh, I guess you've forgotten all about it. Get it, Charlie. Oh, that. It's over here on my desk. I think you were cute, Uncle Charlie. Let me see it. Here you are. See? Oh. Oh, I don't remember this at all. Well, you were nine, Charles. You had it taken the Christmas you got your bicycle. Uncle Charlie, you were beautiful. Oh, wasn't he, though? I always said Papa should never have bought him that bicycle. Mm -hmm. Charlie, he took it right out on the icy road and skidded into a streetcar. We thought he was going to die. I'm glad he didn't. Well, he almost did, let me tell you. He had a fractured skull and he was laid up so long. And when he got well, there was no holding him. It was though all that rest was too much for him, and he had to get into all sorts of mischief to blow off steam. The whole world is rotten. The whole world's changed. Oh, I can remember that Christmas day when this picture was taken. Mama wanted a picture of you with your curls. Did she? Then that very afternoon, you had your accident. And when the picture came a few days later, how Mama cried. She wondered if you'd ever look the same. She wondered if you'd ever be the same. Oh, what's the use of looking backward? What's the use of looking ahead? Today is the thing. That's my philosophy. Today, today, today. Well, Charles, if today is the thing, you better get your clothes on and get down to the bank. Joel will be waiting. He's arranged for you to meet Mr. Green. Mr. Green? He's the president of the bank. And don't be late back. The questionnaire man's coming at four o'clock. <laughs> $30,000, Mr. Oakley? 30 Maybe 40 Mr. Green. Indeed. Well, well. I thought I might settle down here for a while. It's a fine little town. Uh, we think so. Uh, what have you been doing, Mr. Oakley? Well, I suppose you'd call me a promoter. I've done a little bit of everything. You know, it's not hard to make money, Mr. Green. The only trouble I find is that once I make it, I'm not interested in it. Not interested in money? Well, you know as well as I do that there's plenty of money lying around waiting for someone to pick it up. Making money's a boring business. 
Shall we start with 40,000? Yes, well, well, yes, Mr. Oakley, if you'll just fill out this slip. Ah, uh, details. Well, I'm glad to see you're a man that understands details, Mr. Green. They are most important to me, most important. All the little details. Oh, dear. Harry, I wonder if you... Oh, dear, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were busy. Oh, we can come back. Uh, come in, Margaret, now that you're here. Come in. I am sorry, dear. Uh, this is Mr. Oakley, ladies. My wife, Mr. Oakley, and Mrs. Potter. Oh, you're Emma Newton's brother. We've heard so much about you. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Green and Miss Potter? Uh, Mrs. Potter. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, there was something about you that <laughs> made me think that... Yes. Uh, what did you want? Margaret. Oh, well, we were going shopping, Laura and I, and I only have five dollars, and I thought... Uh, that... uh, here you are, my dear. Thank you, Harry. There is something to being a widow, isn't there, Mr. Oakley? One doesn't have to ask a man for money anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, goodbye, Mr. Oakley. Mm. I'm so glad we met. Goodbye, Mr. Oakley. Goodbye, Mrs. Green and Miss Potter. Oh, Margaret, isn't he just as charming oh. as anything? Uh, now, Mr. Oakley, where were we? Attractive woman, that Mrs. Potter... Widow, is she? Yes, uh, he was the mm. potter of potter chain stores. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Yes, Mr. Green, as you say, where were we? This is my room here, gentlemen, but my Uncle Charlie's visiting us. And I've given it to him for as long as he stays. Can we have a look, Miss Newton? Mr. Saunders might be interested. Well, if you like. Thank you. Hey, nice room. You mind if I take a picture or two as long as your uncle isn't around? I sure don't want to disturb your uncle after what you said. Well, I suppose so. But I can't imagine anyone being interested in my room. I mean, it isn't really the way I'd like to have it. Oh, I like it fine. Worth a few shots. We'll stay out here in the hall, Miss Newton. Might as well let him work in peace. Besides, I'd like to talk to you. It's funny your survey happened to our family. Why did you pick us? Oh, we looked around, asked some questions, thought you were about what we wanted. And why not choose your family? You haven't got any skeletons in your closets, <laughs> have you? <laughs> of course we haven't. I wish we did have a few. We're pretty prosaic. You know, your picking us out as an average family gave me kind of a funny feeling. What kind of a funny feeling? Oh, I don't know. I guess I don't like to be an average girl in an average family. Oh, average families are the best. Look at me. I'm from an average family. <laughs> as average as ours? Sure. Besides, I don't think you're average. Oh. Oh, my Uncle Charlie, you scared me. I got the back stairs in the kitchen, Charlie. I'll throw in here and I better get one in the hall. Uh, Mr. Saunders has been taking pictures of my room. Well, my sister's just asked me to tell you she was ready for pictures in the kitchen, gentlemen, and I don't like to be photographed. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you for that roll of film. Oh, Uncle Charlie. Give it to me, please. Give it to him, Fred. Too bad. There's a picture of Mrs. Newton and the children on this roll. Thank you. I'm sorry to have troubled you, but that's the way it is. I'm sorry, too. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Graham. We want to help you in an important work, oh, but Oh, I... please. You've been very helpful. And uh, I'd like to ask another favor, if I may. Can I borrow you tonight for a walk around the town? I'd like to pick up a little atmosphere, and you know everybody. Why, of course. Anything I can do. Thanks. I'll call around about 6.30. You can show me the best restaurant in town, and we can have dinner. All right. See you then. Come on, Saunders. <laughs> Park, really, but it's better than just an empty town square. It's very pretty. <laughs> I can't get over your breaking your arm when you were ten, and my breaking my arm when I was ten in exactly the same place. Right at the elbow. <laughs> and my wanting to run away from home, and you're wanting to run away from oh, home. Oh, I didn't want to, really. It was just a gesture. I didn't want to either. <laughs> <laughs> want to sit down? Sure. <sighs> this is a peaceful sort of town. Yeah, it seems to be. I, I think you have an awfully interesting job, going into people's houses, taking pictures, asking a lot of questions. Why, just like an international spy. Yes. That tune. I know what you are, really. You're a detective. Yes, there's something the matter, and you're a detective. Charlie, listen. I don't want to listen. You're a detective. 
Why, you're not making a survey at all. You just lied to us. What do you want? What are you doing around here lying to us? You keep away from us. Charlie, come back here. Keep away. Look, Charlie, you've got to listen to me. Just wait until I tell them. Just wait until I tell my mother you lied to her. Charlie, you can't tell her. I'll tell her. You see, I'll tell everyone. I'm not afraid. Charlie, I don't want you to be afraid of me. You've got to trust me. Trust you when you've done nothing but lie. When you probably didn't want to take me out at all tonight the way I thought you did. When you probably only took me out to ask a lot of questions. Have I asked you a lot of questions? Have I? All right, I'm a detective. A pretty bad one, I guess. Now, won't you even listen to me? Why should I when you lied to me? I had to. You've just got to believe I had to. When I came here to this town to find a man, I hadn't counted on you. I hadn't counted on your mother or your family. Find a man? What man? There's a man loose in this country. We're after him. We don't know much about him. We don't even know what he looks like. Charlie, this man we want may be your uncle. I don't believe you. Get away from me and leave me alone. We're after one man. Your uncle may be that man. But in the east, there's another man who's being hunted, too. Hunted through Massachusetts and into Maine. He may be the man. My uncle hasn't done anything. Why don't they arrest that man in the east? Why don't you go away and leave us alone? If it weren't for you, you don't think I'd care when or how I caught up with your Uncle Charlie, do you? Because if he's the guy, I am going to catch up with him, Charlie. Remember that. If your Uncle Charlie's the man we want, we'll get him out of town quietly. We won't arrest him here. Arrest him here in town with Mother? I'm trying to tell you we won't. Charlie, you've got to help us. All right. I won't say anything. The parking lot's over this way. Take me home, please. Here we are. Charlie, he may not be the one. It may be the other guy, the one in the east. Of course. It's probably all a mistake. I hope I'm wrong. I never wanted to be wrong so much in all my life. Well, good night. Oh, this handle, it... Oh, you have to give it a good yank. Here. Thank you. Oh, something fell. What's this? Hmm? Oh, it's nothing. Just yesterday's paper. This car gets to be a regular goat's nest sometimes. Yesterday's paper? May I have it, please? Sure, you're welcome to it. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Charlie. I'll be in touch with you. Yesterday's paper. It was page three. Page three and four. Let me see. Record storms in Midwest. Edward Fairbairn appointed to new post. No, that couldn't be... Where is the Merry Widow murderer? Boston, Massachusetts, February 8th. The whereabouts of the so-called Merry Widow murderer, strong-handed strangler of three wealthy women, is a question baffling detectives today who are conducting a coast-to-coast search for it the killer. couldn't be Uncle Charlie. Trailing detectives are after two men, one of whom they are certain is the actual murderer. One was in the East, Jack said, in the East. The fact that all the victims were wealthy widows accounts for his being known to the police as the Merry Widow Murderer. His latest victim was Mrs. Barton Madison, the former musical comedy star known to audiences at the beginning of this century as the beautiful Thelma Shenley. My ring. The ring he gave me. T.S. from B.M., T.S. from B.M. Oh, no. No. Please, no. Well, come along, everybody. Dinner's ready. Okay. Well, where's our little Charlie? I've missed her all day. She'll be in the kitchen in a minute. She's getting some things in the kitchen. Well, she slept very late today. She was tired, I guess. She doesn't look quite herself. Here's the sauce, Mama. I nearly forgot about it. Well, here she is. Here's my girl. Well, Joe, well, I wonder how many hours you slept today. Sit right down, dear. You won't be able to sleep tonight. Nobody who sleeps oh, all I day. Oh, I slept all right. And I kept dreaming perfect nightmares about you, Uncle Charlie. Nightmares about me? About you. You were on a train... 
And I had a feeling you were running away from something. And when I saw you on the train, I felt terribly happy. Charlie, how could you feel happy about seeing your uncle on a train? Goodness knows I don't want him on a train. I hope he stays here forever. Well, I, I suppose he'll go sometime. I mean, we all realize he has to go sometime. We have to face facts. Yes. Yes, I like people who face facts. Well, I'm not going to face any such facts as those. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Charles. I promised Mrs. Green, the president of our club, that you'd talk to the ladies, and she wants to know what you're going to talk about. Well, what am I going to talk about? Lecturers usually give travel or current events, don't they? Oh, not current events. We get current events. Well, what sort of an audience would they be? Oh, women like myself, busy with our homes, most of us. Yes. Women keep busy in towns like this. In the cities, it's different. The cities are full of women. Middle-aged widows, their husbands dead. Husbands who have spent their lives making fortunes, working and working, and then they die and leave their money to their wives, their silly wives. And what do the wives do? These useless women. You see them in the hotels, the best hotels, by the thousands, eating the money, drinking the money, losing the money at bridge, playing all day and all night, just smelling of money. Proud of their jewelry, proud of nothing else. Horrible, faded, fat and greedy women. But they're alive. They're alive. They're human beings. Are they? Are they, Charlie? Are they human or are they fat, wheezing animals? And what happens to animals when they die, when they get too fat and too old? I seem to be making sort of a speech. Well, for heaven's sake, Charles, don't talk about women like that in front of my club. You'll be tarred and feathered. <laughs> and that nice Mrs. Potter is so anxious to have you there, too. She was asking me all about you. The Greens are bringing her here to a little party I'm having after the lecture. Excuse me, please, everybody. I'm not hungry at all. I'm going for a walk instead. Charlie! Where do you suppose she's going? Into town, I guess. Oh, it's nothing to get excited about, Charles. She often goes for walks. Maybe she's got a date with that young man. Well, I'm not hungry either. You all stay here and finish your dinner. I'll catch up with her. Charlie! Charlie, wait! Please go away. What's the matter, Charlie? What's the matter with you? Oh, please, you're hurting my arm again. Look, I've got to talk to you. Come along. Let's go in here, this little bar. Please, my arm. Well, come in here with me. I can't. I've never been in a place like this. Come on in. Why do you make me come in here? It's an awful place. What does it matter where we are? Let's sit over here, little table in the corner. Hello, Charlie. Hello. Oh, hello, Louise. Uncle Charlie, this is Louise Finch. Hello. Glad to meet you. This is my uncle. I was in Charlie's class in school. Gee, I sure was surprised to see you come in, Charlie. I never thought I'd see you here. I've been here two weeks. I lost my job at Kearns. What do you have, Charlie? Oh, uh, I'll have a chocolate milkshake. We haven't got anything like that. Bring her a ginger ale. I'll have a double brandy. Brandy? We may have some. Never heard of anybody wanting brandy. I'll see. Well, Charlie? Well? You think you know something. That young fella told you something. Jack? Why should he know anything about you? Now, look, Charlie. Something's come between us. I don't want that to happen. We're like twins, you said so yourself. Give me your hand. Don't touch me, Uncle Charlie. What did he tell you? What did that boy tell you? He's got nothing to do with it. I hope he never knows anything about you. Charlie, you're a pretty understanding sort of girl. Now, if you've heard some little things about me, I... Well, I guess you're a woman of the world enough to over overlook them. I guess I've done some pretty foolish things. Made some pretty foolish mistakes. Nothing serious. Just foolish. How could you do things like that? You're my uncle. You're my mother's brother. We thought you were the most wonderful man in the world. Charlie, what do you know? Here's your ring back, Uncle Charlie. Huh. I'm sorry I was so long. We're awful busy. Oh, whose ring? Ain't it beautiful? Oh, I could just die for a ring like that. Yes, sir, for a ring like that, I'd just about die. I love jewelry, real jewelry. You notice I didn't even have to ask if it was real. You can tell. I can. Bring me another double brandy. Sure. Gee, I'd just die for a ring like that. Someone will. Will what? Die. Someone did. 
I... Oh. Sit down. Sit down. You think you know something, don't you? Or what do you know? You're just an ordinary little girl living in an ordinary little town. You wake up every morning of your life. You know perfectly well that there's nothing in the world to trouble you. You go through your ordinary little day, and at night you sleep your untroubled, ordinary little sleep, filled with peaceful, stupid dreams. And I brought you nightmares, did I? Charlie, how do you know what the world is like? Do you know the world is a foul sty? Do you know if you ripped the fronts off houses, you'd find swine? The world's a hell. What does it matter what happens in it? Wake up, Charlie! Oh, please. Please. Charlie, you've got to help me. Help you? Yes. There's an end of the running a man can do. You'll never know what it's like to be so tired. I was going to... Well, then I got the idea of coming out here. It's my last chance, Charlie. Give it to me. Graham and the other fellow, they don't know. There's a man in the East. They suspect him, too. And if they get him, why, I... Oh, Charlie, give me this last chance. Take your chance and go. I'll go, Charlie. I'll go. Just give me a few days. Think of your mother. It'll kill your mother. Yes, it would kill my mother. Oh, take your few days and... and then get away from here. From church, I see. You're all looking very pleased. How was church, Charlie? Did you count the house? Turn anybody away? No. Seat's enough for everyone. Well, I'm glad to hear it. The show's had such a long run, I thought maybe attendance might be falling off. Anything special on the noon broadcasts, Charles? No, I haven't been listening, Emmy. Joe has. I've been out on the back porch. Nothing special, but they said they'd caught that fellow. Did Roger go upstairs? The fellow they call the Merry Widow Murderer. Mama, did Roger... What did you say, Papa? They caught that Strangler fellow. Oh, they did, did they? Where? Up in Maine, Portland, Maine. Didn't catch him exactly. He was running from police at the airport. They were about to nab him when he ran plunk into the propeller of an airplane. Cut him to pieces. They identified him by his clothes. Shirts were all initials C, O, apostrophe H. Pretty fancy having your shirts initialed. It must have been an Irish fellow, C-O apostrophe A. Well, he deserved it. Never cared much for reading about that case. Come help with lunch, Charlie. As for me, I, uh, I think I'll go upstairs and wash up. I'm hungry. Oh, Charlie, uh, that young fellow from the survey was around asking for you. He was? Yep. Said he'd call around again after lunch. Well, I really don't know when I've been so hungry. See you at the lunch table, Charlie. <laughs> I came along while you were out in the front yard, Charlie. It's more private out here. Yes, I know. I came out to wait for you. Papa said you were coming back after lunch. Well, we got a wire from Maine. They called us off the job. I'm just coming up for air. Me too. Now that it's over, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I want to pretend that the whole dreadful thing never happened. You won't have to pretend much. Nothing did happen. Oh, look, here are Mother's gloves. She must have dropped them. Oh, mother in her gloves. She's always losing things. <laughs> What's the matter? I was laughing. It's been so long since I laughed. I like it when you laugh. And I like it when you don't. I guess I like you whatever you do. I guess I like you. I'm glad. I like you, too. Funny how you happen to meet someone and like them and... like them. Isn't it, Charlie? Yes, it is. I'd like us to be friends... I know that we are friends. I'd like to have that to think about. Nothing more? I don't know, Jack. I just don't know yet. All right. But I'd like to come back. Oh, please do. Please come back. Well, what are you two doing standing out here in the middle of the lawn? When I was your age, we sat in the parlor. Hello, Mr. Oakley. I was saying goodbye to Charlie. You all finished here, Mr. Graham? All finished. But I'll be back. You'll be seeing me around. Oh? Uh, not on business, though. Well, I can understand you're coming back. Charlie's a fine girl. She's the thing I love most in the world. Really? Yes, I mean it. Well, have a nice trip, Mr. Graham, but don't take any more photographs without permission. Rights of man, you know, freedom. We'll have a talk about freedom someday, Mr. Oakley. 
Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Graham. Goodbye, Charlie. For now. Goodbye. You like to go for a walk, Charlie? When are you leaving, Uncle Charlie? Oh, come now. That other business, it's all over. I'd like to forget it. We're all happy here, and, and I'm going to build a new house for you folks. Give it to you as a present. When are you leaving? I'm not going, you see. I'm not going. I want to settle down. Live in a place where people know me, have some money in the bank, some sort of business, be part of the family. I see. The most sensible thing for you to do is to be friends with me. I can do a lot for you, Charlie. I can do a lot for all of you. No, not you. We don't want anything from you. Oh, I wish I'd told my mother about you. I wish I had. What could you tell? Who'd believe you? A waltz running through your head? You don't like the initials in a ring and you connect it all up with a newspaper clipping. And now you haven't even got the ring. I don't know what became of it. Well, you have it. I gave it to you in that little bar that night. And I gave it back to you. No. No, you didn't at all. Yes, I did, Charlie. I don't want you here, Uncle Charlie. You and your lies and your fears and, and your evil. I don't want you to touch my mother. So go away. I'm warning you. Go away or I'll kill you myself. You see, that's the way I feel about you. what you're going to wear for your uncle's lecture at the club meeting tonight? I'm not going to go, Mama. What's that, dear? Why, you're joking. No, I've heard Uncle Charlie's speech. He was rehearsing it on the porch this afternoon, and anyway, somebody has to stay and get things ready for the party. Oh, but we're all getting dressed up, dear, and everything. Your father's going to wear his tuxedo, and I have the new dress Uncle Charlie bought me. I know, but I'd rather stay home and have everything ready for the party when you all get back. Please, Mama, I'd like it better that way. Uh, all right, dear. Did you know that Uncle Charlie got some champagne for tonight? Three bottles. Yes, I know. Now, now, Mr. Oakley, I thought champagne was only for battleships. <laughs> Not tonight, Mr. Green. I'd like to propose a toast to... Well, where did young Charlie go? Yeah, she disappeared a moment ago. Well, I guess she's out in the kitchen for a moment, Mrs. Potter. Will you have another sandwich? Oh, thank you, Emmy. No, I have to remember my figure, you know. Well, then how about you, Mrs. Green? What would you like? Oh, I'll have just one more little one, Emmy. Uh, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd like to propose a toast myself. Uh, to our distinguished visitor, uh, to the man who has made the best speech heard in this town for years. To that very good fellow, Mr. Charles Oakley. <laughs> uh, we don't get many speakers of your caliber, Mr. Oakley. Yes, isn't he just wonderful? Why, thank you, Mrs. Potter. I particularly appreciate that from you. Why, here's Charlie now. Where have you been, for goodness sake, dear? Well, I nearly forgot my ring. I took it off in the kitchen while I was fixing things. Oh, yes, Charlie, show everybody your ring. It was a present to young Charlie from her uncle, you see. It's an emerald, a real one. Yes, Uncle Charlie's been keeping it for me. I nearly lost it last week, but I remembered it tonight and went up and got it while you were all at the lecture. Isn't it beautiful, everybody? Oh, isn't, that isn't it beautiful, Uncle Charlie? Yes. Yes, it is. Good emeralds are the most beautiful thing in the world. <clears throat> Charlie, uh, you're uh, just in time for my toast. A farewell toast. I hate to break the news to you like this, but tomorrow I must leave Santa Rosa. Why, Charles? Oh, not forever, Emmy. Well, if that isn't the strangest coincidence. Why, I was planning to go to San Francisco myself tomorrow morning. Well, is anything wrong, Charles? Oh, Emmy, darling, I didn't mean to spoil your fun tonight. But I got a letter today, that's all, and I, well, I have to catch the early morning train. Oh, but I can't bear it if you go, Charles. Oh, Emmy, I'll be back. Well, you see, everybody, we were so close growing up, and then Charles went away, and I got married, and then, well, you know how it is. You sort of forget you're you. You're your husband's wife. Yes, Mama, that's what you are. But you're you, too. Uh, we'll be looking for you, Mr. Oakley. We feel you are one of us, uh, don't we, Margaret? Oh, indeed we do. And I want to thank you on behalf of our club members. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Green. You've all been very kind. <laughs> You the 
gentleman in room B? I am. Well, there's a Mrs. Potter in room F in car 142. Want to see you after we pull out, sir. Oh, thanks. And, uh, oh, Porter, there's one more bag of mine. I think it got taken into the next car by mistake. Will you get it, please? Ask around, see who has it. It's a big yellow Gladstone. Yellow? Uh, yes, sir. I'll go back and look. Gee, the train's going to start. I don't want to get carried away. Oh, boy, maybe it's too late. Maybe I'll have to go along. Oh, there's plenty of time, children. You run along and we'll follow. Race you to the platform, man. Oh, you can run if you want to. I'm a lady, and ladies Charlie, don't just fall. a minute. Give me your hand. Please. You know what I think about you. I want you to know that I think you were right to make me leave, Charlie. Best for your mother, best for all of us. You saw what happened to her last night. She's not very strong, you know, and I, I don't think she could stand the shock. I remember once when she was a little girl, she... Oh, the train's moving now. Oh, don't be silly. There's lots of time. <clears throat> Listen, Charlie, I want you to forget all about me. Forget that I ever came to Santa Rosa. Your hands. Please let me get the door open, Uncle Charlie. The train's really moving now. I know it is, and we'd better get the door open. Let me go, Uncle Charlie. No, no, my dear, no, I won't. I'm going to help oh. you forget me. I've got to do this, Charlie, so long as you know what you do about me. Let me go. Let's get the outside door open. Two. Here, oh. this way. Oh. Not yet, Charlie. Let it get a little faster. A little faster. Oh. And there's another train oh. coming along the other track. You can meet it. Charlie, you can meet it. Soon now. No. Soon. Now. Grab him, soldiers. Grab him. Uh. Ah! has gained and lost a son, a son that she can be proud of, brave, generous, kindly, with all of the splendid dignity of five... I'm glad you were able to come, Jack, and thanks for standing outside here with me. I, I couldn't bear it inside the church. I couldn't have faced it at all without someone who knew. I did no more. I couldn't tell you. I know. He thought the world was a horrible place. He couldn't have been very happy ever. No. He didn't trust people. He seemed to hate them. He hated the whole world. You know, he said that people like us had no idea what the world was really like. Well, it's not quite as bad as he thought. But it needs a lot of watching. Seems to go crazy every now and then. So like your Uncle Charlie. The memory of our loved ones, the beauty of their souls, the sweetness of their characters, live on with us forever. again the immortal tale, a terribly strange death. Jack Westcott was the best friend I ever had. He was the gayest of people. That was until we left America. I was writing a book about historic murder cases and had come to Paris to do some research work. Jack was fascinated with my work, strangely fascinated. Almost horribly so. He enjoyed finding twisted minds and probing them. His hunger for crime was bound to end in tragedy. On the last evening of our visit in Paris, 
We were walking on the left bank of the same river when Jack noticed a crowd gathered about our old friend, the head of the Paris police force, Inspector Duval. I was in a hurry to return to the hotel to finish writing my murder manuscript. The deadline was in the morning. But Jack insisted. What's the excitement all about, Duval? Well, hello, Mr. Westcott. Still looking for ancient murders, Mr. Manning? Not tonight, Duval. Ancient or otherwise. <laughs> Stick around, Mr. Manning. I'll show you a murder the likes of which you've never seen before. Okay, boys. Drag it out of the river. What is it, Inspector? A corpse, Mr. Westcott. A corpse that's been squashed thin as a piece of paper. Oh, let's see it. Oh, what do you mean, thin as a piece of paper? Hey, bring it over here, boys. Right under the gaslight. <laughs> Horrible-looking thing, isn't it? Horrible and fascinating. It looks like it got squeezed in a giant press. We've had an epidemic of these corpses lately. Any idea who's doing it? Not even a vague notion, Mr. Ma... Hey. Hey, you. You, the fat man. You mean me, Inspector? Yes, I mean you, fat man. How come you're always around when we pull a corpse out of the river? Why? I, uh, I enjoy murder. You enjoy it? You enjoy murder? It appeals to my sense of the artistic. Oh, it does. Well, there's something fascinating about these bodies. Uh, something for a connoisseur alone to appreciate. The symmetry of the remains. The beautifully flawless flatness of the corpse. Uh, the hollow in the stomach. Lying in this puddle of gaslight, this mass of flesh and bones uh, makes a nice picture. I should enjoy painting this uh, if I could paint. I know what you mean, fat man, but uh, wouldn't you prefer probing the mind of a man who conceived this crime? A man's mind is uh, his secret self. Well, enjoy the ghastly spectacle, my friend. Enjoy it. Good evening, gentlemen. All right, men. Take the body down to the morgue and try and find out who it is. Come on, Burke. I'd like to follow that fat man. In heaven's name, why? He's nothing but a psychopathic case. I want to satisfy a hunch. Well, if you're such a good detective, why don't you join Scotland Yard? Well, I might, Burke. I might at that. Where the devil has that gross piece of flesh disappeared to now? He was right in front of us until we turned this corner. Now well, we've lost him, Jack. And I don't wonder. We've passed through every side street in the whole city. If you ask me, he knows he was being followed. Good. If he knows, he'll show his hand sooner. Now, the only place he could have gone around here is into the back door of this house. I wonder what house this is. It's a gloomy dump. Let's go back to the hotel, Jack. I've got to finish that manuscript tonight. It's like a public bar to me. The La Belle Tavern. Are you coming with me, Burke, or are you going home? I'm with you, old boy. I brought you to Paris, and by heaven, I'm going to return you to America. Now, this must be the doorbell. Here goes. And, Burke, no matter what I do tonight, don't worry. Come in, gentlemen. Come in. Perfectly right, fat man. Those two Americans did follow you. They're sitting at the bar inside. The Americans value their lives so slightly. Amazing, isn't it, Cecilia? Their lives. Our lives. They might be cops. I don't want to get my neck in a noose. To be quite candid, I am not interested in your neck. You're so impatient, and impatience is an evil ascribed to the very young. It might be a pity... If you are not allowed time to cure yourself of that evil... Don't threaten me, you fat pig! <gasps> you pig! I'd hope to slap some sense into that lovely but empty head. Obviously, my stupid pigeon, those two Americans are wealthy. They would enjoy our roulette table. If you would show them to it, remember, I'll talk to the croupier... And he will take care of the wheel of fate. If you don't do your part well, you face a lifetime in jail. What happens if they get wise? Room 16? But of course. <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> I knew you'd understand. <clears throat> yeah. I understand. 
<laughs> There's something so gay about Americans, I always say. I hope you boys don't mind if I stick around. Well, Miss... I'm... Not at all, Miss. Not at all. You can call me Cecilia. How about another drink? Oh, that's fine. Three more of the same, bartender. What do you do for a living, Cecilia? Oh, I... I model. In a dress shop. I don't believe you, Cecilia. Jack, stop ribbing the girl. She's a good kid. Well, I'm on the level. I'm interested in it. Here's the drink. Thanks. Why do I interest you? Well, because you're fairly easy to figure out. <laughs> Am I? Why? You really want me to tell you? Sure I do. Well, here's mud in your eye. You say you two say... Oh. Potent stuff, Jack. Potent stuff tastes like cyanide. Well, Cecilia, I'd say you're a poor girl who lives in the slums. But you're pretty. Mm. Prettier than anybody in your entire neighborhood. Well, let's see... And then you must have met a man. What of it? I'm no saint. You promised you a lot of doodabs, and suddenly you found you committed your first crime. Let's say murder. What'd she do? Set her mother on fire? <laughs> oh, well, for that, let's have three more drinks. Bartender, three more. Well, now, let's say it really was murder. The second murder wasn't so hard. And the third was easy, wasn't it? I never had nothing to do with a murder. Well, for the sake of argument, let's say you have. But inside of you, all the time, is this wanting to be liked, wanting to be on the level. But your so-called friends, they don't trust you, Cecilia. Someday they'll double-cross you. I hear the drinks. Thank you. Nobody will ever double-cross me. Well, here's mud in your eye. Drink up, boy. Is there anything else to do around here? You seen the gambling rooms? Gambling rooms? Ah, that's me. Who runs those gambling rooms, Cecilia? I don't know. One of your friends? A fat man, perhaps, with a long nose? I don't know the owner. Gosh, you're real nice. <laughs> Is the fat man in the back room now? Probably. Gambles here a lot. Do you... Do you rip play? Sure. Well, come on, Jack. We'll see who's right. My books or your instincts. Number 21 wins. Jack, the fat man's in the corner of the room. Yeah, I saw him, Burke. And he saw you, old boy. Don't think he didn't. Come on, boys. Let's play. Money, money, money. Place your bets, gentlemen. They'll make some room for us over here. Come on. Okay. Hello, Cecilia. Hello, Monty Laureate. You playing again? I thought you lost every cent you owned last night. A desperate man finds desperate ways to raise money. Mm, even murder, eh? You heard about it. Perhaps. And perhaps not. I'd like you to meet some new friends of mine, Monty. This is Jack Westcott and Burke Manning. Monty Lauriard. How do you do? Money, Please money, 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 gentlemen. Place your bets. I bet 30 francs on odd. I'll bet 100 francs on number 13. Good boy, Jack. The play is dead. <laughs> round and round the little ball goes. Where she stops, nobody knows. Hey, Jack, I feel a little dizzy. You've had too much to drink, pal, and those drinks were strong. Number 13 wins. What? I won! Good for you, American. Lucky for you. I won the first time I ever played here, but never again. Money, 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 money. That was the first time Jack won on that incredible evening. But as the ball spun, his winnings increased. The table seemed to have gone crazy. Jack became gambling drunk. The croupier seemed desperate as that wheel spun round and round, each time increasing Jack's winnings. The room was tense with excitement, and even the little thin loser, Lawyer, seemed surprised. Monsieur Westcott, your luck is phenomenal. You've won 30 times. 30 times. Jack, you've won a fortune, man. Stop now before it's too late. Leave him alone, Burke. Let him play if he wants to. Sure, let me play if I want to. I want to break the bank. Careful, monsieur. Let me warn you. Careful. Jack, it's almost midnight, and I've got a lot of work to do tonight. Please, let's go. And remember the fat man. The fat man be hanged. Here, Jack. Have another drink. <laughs> Thanks. Is it? Jack, be sensible. Ah, stop being an old Andy, Burke. I'll see you later at the hotel. Make the book have a bloody ending. I'm in the mood for a good murder tonight. Remember, Jack, I warned you. Goodbye. Money, 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 gentlemen. Place your bet. I, uh... I told the croupier you wanted to see him back here, fat man, but it wasn't the croupier's fault the American broke the bank. That is for me to decide. Uh, where is the American now? Outside. Buying drinks for the house. Good, good. That ought to keep him busy. You... You called for me, monsieur? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I'll need you too, Cecilia. Uh, shut the door. I don't like to frighten our patrons. I'm... 
I'm sorry about the wheel, Monsieur, but it was broken and I... I couldn't control it. That is unfortunate for you. What are you going to do, Monsieur? Come here. Don't put your fat hands on me, fat man. Let me... Don't fight the fat man. You can't move, can you, croupier? Because if you move, my arm will break your neck. <laughs> Call my men, Cecilia. I might need a little aid with this stupid fool. What are you going to do, fat man? Have his brains pressed out of his body in room 16. His mind is no good where it is now. No, no, monsieur. Please, monsieur. Not room 16. Monsieur Laurier. We'll probably be luckier if we don't ask questions. I want another drink. Jack, listen to me. Put on your hat and coat and leave this place. You're being watched all the time. Who's watching me? Hello, Jack. Oh, have a drink. No, Jack. You've had enough to drink. Leave this place right away. She's right, Jack. You must leave. I'll see you home personally. Come on, then. Oh, no, you don't, Monty Laurier. I know your tricks. The last man you saw home was found with a dagger in his breast. How come you're so interested in me, Cecilia? Because you're the first person who ever treats me decent. Oh, please go home. All right, Sooner or later, every woman develops some mother complex over me. Now, I don't want to be mothered. Who is trying to mother you, my friend? Oh, hello, fat man. Cecilius. Ah, oh, she's developed a rather latent maternal instinct. I think a maternal instinct is out of place tonight. After all, uh, tonight's a night for celebration. Yeah, the fat man's right. Celebration. Bartender, open a bottle of champagne. Bartender, a champagne. Uh, champagne for Monsieur Westcott. Uh, won't you join us, Cecilia? Yeah. Of course I will. Here is the champagne, Monsieur. Uh, won't you drink with us, Monsieur Lauriard? No, thank you, fat man. I don't think so. I never enjoyed toasting to death. Death? <laughs> Open the bottle, bartender. Good night, Jack. And good luck. Good night. Good night, good night, good night, good night. Here's the handkerchief, fat man. Oh, Jack, your money is all tied safely in your handkerchief. Thank you, friend. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, I put the handkerchief. It would be wisest to tie it uh, to your belt. I, I feel dizzy, fat man. Oh, you need a cup of good hot coffee. That will straighten you right out. Uh, Cecilia, go in the kitchen and fix our friend a cup of coffee. But I, I really... Don't tell me, my little pigeon, that your hearing is failing you. I'll get it right away. I'm glad we're alone, fat man. I want a chance to talk to you. Talk away, Jack. Uh, tell me confidentially. Why do you enjoy seeing a mutilated body dragged out of the river? There's beauty in death. In the act of death? Or in the recovery of a body after life has left it? In both. Then do you enjoy committing a crime? Perhaps. Perhaps it would be pleasant to watch a man die, slowly, very slowly, in order to see life leave the body. Say that uh, you and I watched uh, a murder by pressure. What would happen? I'm interested, that man. What would happen? The face is the first part affected. It would turn red, and the victim would probably feel hot blood pounding in his brain, pounding like steel hammers. Mm Mm-hmm. Then his eyes would feel sore, as if the fluid creating sight were ebbing slowly away. That would be painful? Painful but glorious. His face would discolor. The pressure on his chest would be so great he... He tried to scream, cry out, but he couldn't. He wouldn't be able to move, not a limb, not a muscle. He'd be paralyzed. 
I'd see to that. And in that moment, all the horror that is in man's mind would be indelibly imprinted on the brain until a sudden crushing noise would blot out thought. And what would that crushing noise be? The pulverizing of the human bone. Here's the coffee, fat man. Ah, let me see it. Hmm. Tastes all right. Here you are, Jack. This will fix you. I... No, I don't think I want any. If you'll pardon me, I... I'm so dizzy. So frightfully dizzy. Oh, of course you are. Here, Jack, drink it. Drink it, my friend. My good, good friend. If you don't want to drink it, that, Jack, don't, don't. Now open your mouth, my friend. It will sober you very quickly. No, I... Open your mouth. No. There. Now, how do you feel? I... I'm sick. I'm sick. It's dope, isn't it? It's dope. It's living. Oh, our friend Jack is asleep, Cecilia. Call the bartender. I think our friend will spend the night with us in room 16. all over Paris for you, monsieur. You've been looking for me? Yes, I've called every hotel in the city trying to find you. I know you don't remember me, but I met you earlier this evening at the LaBelle Tavern. My name's Lauriard of the Paris Police Force. Uh, yes, yes, of course. I want you to come in. Who is uh, Mr. Westcott? I had to leave him at the tavern. He wouldn't listen to me. You see, monsieur, I've been assigned to watch that tavern. It's been under suspicion for several weeks. Oh, great Scott, man. Where's Jack now? At the tavern. He's carrying an enormous amount of money on his person. I know the fat man will never allow him to leave with that money. Why don't you raid the den? Unfortunately, we can't. We have no proof. As a matter of fact, they might not harm him at all. But just in case, I thought it might be a wise idea for you to go down there. You can go to the door and ask for... Yes? What do you want? You're the bartender, aren't you? I am not Napoleon's grandma. What do you want? My friend Jack Westcott hasn't come back to the hotel as yet. We've been waiting for him, and I thought that he probably decided to spend the night here at your place, and I... Your friend is not here. Go home, American, before you get yourself in more trouble than you can handle. Who was it? The other American asking about his friend. Where are you going? Upstairs. To take Monsieur Westcott a candle, like the fat man told me. Be sure the fat man told you, or else... I'm sure. Very sure. Jack. Jack, I... I brought your candle. Are you asleep? Wake up, Jack. Please wake up. Please. Maybe if I shake him. Wake up. Oh, I hate to slap you, but your life depends on it. Mm. Oh, what is it? Wake up, wake up. <gasps> Jack. Jack. Hmm. Luckily, he's still asleep. Come, Cecilia. Let our friend sleep. I'm so sick. So dizzy and sick. Why didn't she let me sleep? Oh, I feel paralyzed. I, I can't move at all. Just as if I'm drugged. Maybe if I concentrate on the room, I'll go to sleep. Funny. Funny that a French gambling house should have a bedroom. What is an old English four-poster bed doing in a French room anyway? What a heavy canopy over my head. So solid looking. Almost as if it were made of steel. The mattress is so hard. I must concentrate on something. The picture above my head. It's just even with the canopy. Oh, an evil-looking Spaniard. With five feathers in his head. Hark! The eyes moved. I'm certain of it. The eyes moved. I wonder if I dare look up again. I, I was sure there were five feathers. Now there are only four. 
four feathers. Four feathers. Now three feathers. I wonder who's outside my door. I'm trying to sleep. No, no, look at the picture. What? The feathers have disappeared. I can barely even see the face. is being lowered on me. That's what it is. The canopy. It can't move. The paper thin corpse. Oh, I, I gotta move. It's coming close. 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 Oh, the squash me. Oh, I must move. I, I can't do it. It's almost down. Halfway down. Oh, I... I... <laughs> Just to crawl out of bed. Oh, if I get a crawl, I'm going to crawl out of here. I, I, just... oh. Oh. I'm safe. It's safer than that horrible contraption. Oh, I'm not a out of here. The window. Just open the window slowly. I'll crawl to the window. Oh. I can push the window open slowly. Very slowly. That's not going in by now. Listen to me, men. Push the window open. Oh, it's stuck. Be sure and deliver the money back to me. Up uh, there. Uh, I'm not opening wide enough to crawl through. You can raise the canopy now. Let's go in, gentlemen. Help! Help somebody! Get Help me! Get the hand to push it! Help me! Help somebody! I've got him. Help! Open the window! Oh, if the bed didn't work the first time, it would have I've weighed the means of making it work the second, and perhaps it would be more pleasant to watch life ebb out in front of me. No, no. Place him carefully on the bed. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Good. This ought to prove most enjoyable, Mr. Weston. It's a pity you haven't my detached viewpoint. Let me go. Put him in. Then lower the canopy. No, no, no. 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 This way, Bert. Up this oh. way. Hurry, Mr. Lurie. I want you to the bed over. Cecilia, you fool. Look. Get Jack out of that bed. Jack, Jack, boy, here. Hold on to me. I'll drag you out. Don't you put your hand on me, Lurie. Watch into there. Let's take care of the bottom. Oh. I'm all right, Bert. Don't worry about me. I'll just see you. I'll help her. Let me go, Cecilia. Don't push me. Help me, Lurie. Inspector Duval, that's the story. Lauriard and Burke were waiting outside all the time. They saw me at the window, and Cecilia let them in. Mm, close shave, eh? A lucky escape. Lauriard and I have pulled him out of the bed just in time, and Cecilia pushed the fat man under the canopy as it closed down. It must have been a horrible sight, Burke. Well, what about Cecilia, Inspector? What would they do to her? Unfortunately, the police can't find her. <laughs> and I've instructed them not to look too hard. <laughs> Give me a penny, mademoiselle. Just a penny for an old lady. 
I'll tell you a story if you'll give me a penny, monsieur. Sorry, Gypsy, not today. How about you, madame? Me? How about a penny for my story? Well, Just uh... a penny for a story. A story you won't forget. I never could resist a story. It's a deal. You tell the story and I'll give you the penny. Well, we'd better sit down on the front steps of the museum here. Now, the story starts in an attic of an old pension. The story is of two lovers who were sitting together in an old attic in a two-gable building where the wind softly shook the old shutters as it blew by. The girl was beautiful, and those two were in love. And she was telling him the story of the vendetta. Jenny, my darling, tell me about the vendetta. It was so long ago, Louis, but I'll never forget the fires and the flames. Sometimes at night I still think of myself as that little girl in Corsica, sitting with her mother in the living room. I can still see our sworn enemies, the Porter family, breaking in, pouring kerosene on our rugs and see the fire start. Those fires which were meant as our funeral pyre. I can still hear my mother scream before she died. Somehow, my father saved my life and told me to hide in the wastelands and wait for him. And then there was more fire, more flames, and the vendetta was settled. The Porter family was dead. And then we came to Paris, to the pension next door. I remember the ugly white stone building, the long, rickety flight of stairs to the three-room flat on the third floor. I remember the landlady, who was so kind and showed us to our rooms, talking in that empty hallway. You'll like it here, Monsieur de Piombo. You and your little girl. Pretty child, isn't she? Watch out for the stairs. Thank you. I'll be careful, Madame Manet. We're all one happy family here. A German family lives on this floor, and a young newlywed couple lives on this floor. And guess who owns the building next door? Monsieur Servin. He's an artist and runs an exclusive school for young women who are interested in the art. Well, these are your quarters. Your room's in the back. The child's room is just to the left. You have your own cooking facilities if you wish to use them. Yes, you told us. Well, I guess you want to be alone to make friends with your new quarters. Rooms are like people. Have to be treated with kindness. Be happy. Are you tired, Jenny? Very, very tired. Father, are we going to see Mother again? You took her from us, Jenny. But the porters have paid for it. With their lives. All of them. You're all I have left, Jenny. You're all I have left in the world. You will be a little queen someday. I'll make you a queen, Jenny. And Paris will be at your feet. You have such lovely black hair, Jenny. Such lovely, warm, Black hair, darling. Never leave me. Father, darling, I'll never leave you. How could I? We belong together. And so you and your father lived in the pension? And you were happy, Jim? Oh, so happy, Louis. You've no idea. Well, when I was 20 years old, I started to paint. Our landlady showed my painting to Monsieur Servin, and Monsieur granted me a scholarship in his school. My easel was in the corner of the studio, and when I climbed on a chair, I could peer through the skylight into Monsieur Servin's attic across the way near the gable. The attic always fascinated me. It was dark and lonely, and struck a responsive chord somewhere inside me. And then last week, I saw you there, darling. And I knew you were wounded. I started to paint you. I stood on the chair looking at you. Laurie was singing behind me, and Amelia was talking too much. The little chime clock on the wall chattered, too. They say the soldier escaped somewhere in this neighborhood. But they'll get him. There's no doubt of that. After all, he deserves to die. Every Bonaparte soldier deserves to die. After all, who are they? Nothing but a lot of cutthroats and Corsicans. Amelia, what a cruel thing to say. 
Think of our darling Ginevra. Oh, honestly, Laurie, you make me sick. Hmm. What are you doing standing on a chair, Ginevra? I I was seeing something in my mind's eye. You were talking about Napoleon, Amelia. I'm interested in your views. Oh, of course. You're a Corsican. Are you for or against Napoleon? Since Napoleon's been banished, it doesn't make much difference, does it? Well, maybe not. Except there's a soldier of Napoleon's army hiding out in this district. The police might be interested in you, Ginevra, if you're a sympathizer. If somebody were to tell them about you. Amelia, stop it. Let's see what you're painting, Ginevra. Oh, no, no, Laura, oh, please. I, darling, I... it's a lovely piece of work. Who is he? Who is who? This man Ginevra's painting. A oh, uh, man? Well, we didn't know. Mademoiselle, would you please return to your easels? No artist ever gave anything to art who supplied the world with gossip. We were just admiring the Corsican's work, Monsieur Sauvain. She's painting a portrait of a young man. Uh-huh. Well, Mademoiselle Amelia, I'm sure if you worked as diligently as Mademoiselle Ginevra, somebody would admire your work. It is four o'clock, ladies. Time for you to go home. I'm only half finished, Monsieur. Four o'clock, Mademoiselle Laurie. Your family will worry. Naturally, Laurie. Come along and stop being super conscientious. Good night, Ginevra. Oh, wait for me. I'll be right along. Mademoiselle Ginevra. Oh, yes, monsieur. Would you mind staying after class? Of course not, monsieur. Good night, monsieur Sauvain. Good, Good night, Good night, monsieur Good night, Sauvain. mademoiselle. You'll find Mademoiselle Ginevra very interesting to talk to, monsieur Sauvain. Especially if you ask her why she stands on a chair looking in an attic window. Good night, monsieur Sauvain. Good night, mademoiselle Amelia. I'm sorry, monsieur. I caused you so much trouble. That is a fine painting, Ginevra. How long have you known the soldier has been hiding in my attic? Just today. How much has Mademoiselle Amelia seen of him? Just this painting. Monsieur, please take me to him. Nobody knows he's up there but me. He's wounded and he looks so lonely. Your father would never forgive me if I do. And I'd never forgive you if you don't. Please, monsieur. Nobody will ever know, I swear it. Please, Monsieur Savant. Please. And so he brought me to the attic. And I met you and loved you from the first time I saw you two weeks ago, Louis. Oh, I, I know all the words that rhyme with your name. I know all the funny little wrinkles in your face. And the way you smile and the way you talk. Oh, Jenny. Jenny, darling, darling, you don't know what you're saying. I'm a hunted man. If I'm caught, I'll be hung. If you were killed, I'd be by your side. I'm sick and wounded. And you know so little about me. I know everything about you. We're fellow Corsicans. You're a brave soldier, and I love, love, love you. Oh, where you go, I shall go. And your people shall be my people. Jenny, I wanted to tell you. I wanted to tell you so many times. Oh, darling, darling. Don't stop me, please, darling. We can't be married. Don't you understand? I love you. I love you so much. Oh, Louis. Father can help you leave the country and I can join you later. And we'll return to Corsica. Corsica, Jenny. Warm sun and green meadows and the yellow pasture land. Oh. Oh, Oh, darling, you'll like Corsica so very much like it. Tempestuous and warm. And your eyes are brown like the trees in the fall. And when you're happy, they're brown with red flames. Those are the fires of a vendetta, Louis. And when you're sad, the light dies. Like the sun on the ocean. I love you. I love you, oh, Jenny. If only I were brave enough to own you... I'd own you in a little bit of Corsica in a world of our own. Oh, don't make it any more difficult for me than it is. What's wrong, Jenny? Look at the skylight in the studio. I could have sworn I saw somebody at the skylight window. Nothing more than the cleaning woman, Jenny. Oh, my little darling. My darling, Jenny. Jenny for Bella. Bella, Bella, Jenny. What are you doing standing on the chair looking out the skylight window, Amelia? Oh, what are you looking at? It, you know very well what I'm looking at, Laurie. 
You've known all along about Ginevra and her lover and their secret rendezvous, haven't you? What if I have? My father, as head of the Paris police force, will be very much interested in finding this escaped soldier. If you help the soldier escape, I'll tell my father you helped him to escape. They'll put you in jail, Laurie. In a dark hole of a jail with rats and roaches. And they'll forget about you and let me go, Amelia. If you don't keep your mouth shut. My arm. What are you going to do, Amelia? Wait and see, Laurie. And if you want to stay out of jail, you keep your mouth shut. I think I'd better see Ginevra's father. Monsieur de Piombo? Yes? I'm Amelia Ferrar, a schoolmate of your daughter's. Oh, please come in, mademoiselle. My daughter is late from school, but I'm sure she'll be home soon. Well, I... I didn't come here to talk to your daughter, monsieur. I came to talk to you. A sort of ugly thing happened at our school lately, and... Well, it's sort of difficult to explain, but... Well, Monsieur Sauvain has been allowing an escaped soldier to hide in his attic. <laughs> Not so bad. The rascal, how could he? Well, every day, Ginevra and this soldier see each other, and I hear they intend to marry. It's the scandal of the school, monsieur, and, well, if he's arrested, Ginevra will be in trouble, and... Are you positive of this, mademoiselle? Oh, yes, and I'm worried for her. You see, my father is head of the Paris police, and I found out this escaped soldier is a fellow Corsican of yours, and... Well, you probably know him. He's parading under the name of Louis D'Angelo. But in reality, his name is Luigi Porter. Youngest son of the Porter family and the only survivor of a tragic fire which occurred in Corsica 15 years ago. Luigi Porter. <laughs> I'm sure Ginevra can take care of herself. Well, shall I report him to the police? No, maybe it won't be necessary for 24 hours. No, no, I think I'll wait. Good day, Monsieur de Piombo. Ginevra. Ginevra, Bella. Not a porter. Oh, no, Ginevra, me. Not. Not marrying Luigi Porter. Not my own daughter. <laughs> be married to a porter. She must die by my hand by the terms of the vendetta. doing in my father's apartment. Don't you wish you knew? Tell me, Amelia, or I... We told the Corsicans were a... True, that was until now. Don't speak so loud. What do you know about it? What do you know? Everything. I know that your Corsican sick and peasant blood you have. <gasps> oh, you be sorry, Ginevra. I'm very sorry for this. Amelia. Stop following me. I must know the truth. Did you tell my father about... Meeting a lover in secret? Yes. It's time somebody stopped you. Who did you say this secret lover of mine was? I didn't know you knew. He... I thought you at least had lost. Did you tell my father? Well, I told your father. Goodbye, little princess. Heard someone arguing <laughs> out here. Oh, what's <laughs> this? Oh, poor baby. <laughs> Mademoiselle, don't <laughs> cry. If somebody hurt our feelings, you'll... <laughs> Madame, would you do me a favor? Go upstairs to my father. Let me out on the errand. Please, please, madame. Poor child, are you in trouble? Please, please, for the love of heaven, go upstairs and tell my father you sent me out. And make the lie good. Make him believe it. 
You must make him believe it, madame. Please, please, go upstairs now. Go upstairs right this minute. Mind, Monsieur de Piombo, if Ginevra went on this little errand for me. Just a few blocks away to the butcher, and I, I've hurt my foot. Naturally, your foot. Uh, uh, stubbed the toe. For a stubbed toe, you walk very well. Thank you, monsieur. Very well indeed. Uh, I, I think I'd better go down uh, Don't. To... Please don't. I'd much rather you wait up here, Madame Monet, so that I may see this parcel Ginevra is to bring you. But, but, monsieur... I said we'll wait up here, madame. Six o'clock. We'll wait till seven, madame. Till seven. She's not here by then. You and I will find her ourselves. I had to warn you, Louis. You're in such danger. Don't you understand? Father will kill you with the vendetta returns. Eugenie, Eugenie... Luigi or Louis, it makes no difference to me. Love knows no name. And I love you, Luigi Porter, with my whole heart. But if we're married, you'll become a porter. And by the terms of a vendetta, as long as the Piomba lives, all porters must die. If you become my wife, you must die as well as I. Without you, Louis, I wouldn't be alive. My life, my love. We'll take our chance. God, if only Mr. Selvan is right. If only he can get us out of the country at midnight. You must believe it. Darling, as soon as the priest arrives and we're married, I'll return home and wait. I'll wait until midnight. Be careful, darling. Be careful. Nothing can go wrong, Luigi. The carriage will be waiting and Selvan has our passports already. How can you get out of the house without your father suspecting? I'll find a way somehow. I... Oh. Oh. Mr. Selvan. You frightened me. I'm sorry, my dear... But the priest is waiting for you. Darling Ginevra, take my arm, my sweet. Oh. Lead the way, Monsieur Servin. Father, I'm sorry I'm so late, Father. Are you angry with me? How could I be, Felicia? Tea is ready, Ginevra. Been ready a long time waiting for you. I'm so sorry. Shall I warm the water? It's not necessary. Come, Carissima. Sit by the window with me. As you did when you were a little girl. Very little girl. Of course. How gay the table looks, Father. Almost as if we were celebrating something. Candlesticks, the best tea plate. Sit down, darling. Here, next to me. And the very best teapot. And the old Corsican knife. It's a lovely knife. I've always loved it. What are we going to carve with it? You've no cake. Your tea, Ginevra. Thank you. If I knew you'd leave me for some man or other. I've always known that, Jenny. Come, Carissima. Sit close to me. As you did when you were a little girl. But, Father... You're still my little girl. Father, you I... You draw away from me. Are you afraid of me? No, Father, no, darling, no. My little princess. My beautiful Ginevra. Carissima. With your heavy, long, black hair. Such heavy, warm, black hair. Father, the hair is dark. Father, the hair is thick and fragrant. For the head is beautiful. But yours, Jenny, yours is Corsica. Corsica. Don't look at me, Ginevra Cara. Cara, Cara, look straight ahead out the window. Yes, Father. What do you see out there? Trees and grass. And people laughing, happy people. A boy and a girl and a baby. And an old man. A lonely old man, Cara. There's no old man out there, Father. Father, what are you reaching for? The knife on the table. Why? You and the knife are the only two things left to me from Corsica. No, don't turn around. Keep looking out the window, Ginevra. Keep telling me what you see, my darling Carissima. Why, Father? Are the boy and the girl happy? Father! Are they, Ginevra? Are they happy, darling? Father! 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 
I'll hold you in my arms, my darling, and the pain will go away. I waited for you for two long hours. I stood by the window watching and waiting. I saw Savan leave and return with the priest. Oh, Cara, Cara, Janine. Then you came home. Not my carissima. Not my darling. Oh, Father, the pain. The pain now. You came back to me. The wife of Luigi Porter. Your mother's murderer. You were piombo to become a porter. The pain, Father. The pain. <laughs> Goodbye, Ginebra. Your hair. Your warm, black hair. The knife. There. Draw it out so slowly. And my life for your life. The life of a piombo for the life of a porter. Carissima. Carmilla. Carmilla. You'll not be alone. Not alone in death. Jenny, we've waited so long. Jenny? Jenny, my darling, what's happened to... She's dead. Both of them. And dead. Oh, how could dead hates come out of the past and murder the only beauty in my life? Oh, Jenny, my darling, darling Jenny. My wife for five short hours. The knife. Yes, that's the way. Yes. The knife. Here. Where it'll be sure. Goodbye, my Jenny. Luigi. Luigi. Jenny. I'm coming to meet you. I hear your voice. Luigi. What have you done? Luigi. I'm coming, Jenny. Luigi. Oh, Luigi, could you wait? I'm not going to die, Luigi. I'm not going to die. Jenny didn't die. She lay for months in the hospital, trying to die, not caring to make any effort to do anything. The doctors made her live. She had no will to, and she hasn't since. She hasn't sinned. What happened to her, Gypsy? What did she do? She lived in memories. But who cares? Who cares about Ginevra now? She might be wandering the streets. An old woman. An old woman telling stories for pennies. Here, Gypsy. Here's your penny. Thank you, madame. Thank you. A story? A story for a penny? Just a penny, please. Just a penny. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard the immortal tale, The Vendetta. Bellkeeper, toll the bell.
breathless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. I was down on the waterfront looking for the old whaling vessel, Grampus. Captain Bernard was in charge, and though I hadn't seen the old captain in more than ten years, I still felt he was a pretty good friend of mine. I could remember him telling Dad and myself some pretty wild tales. I drank it all in, main rig, compass, and anchor. Maybe I never would have seen the old captain and his son, Weston, if I hadn't been visiting some friends in Boston. I was reading the shipping news one morning, and there it was. Benjamin Bernard. Experienced whalers wanted to man vessel Grampus, sailing July 13th, 1 a.m., 1881. Well, I packed my digs, slung them over my shoulder, took a lungful of salt air, and, well, six hours before sailing time, I was looking for the ship. It was dark as I walked down the waterfront, and I stopped the stranger. Yeah, bud? What do you want? I'm looking for a whaler known as the Grampus, and I think I'm lost. There it is, right in front of you. What's the matter, can't you read? Yeah, it seems that way. Thanks, fella. Uh, do you happen to know if Captain Bernard's on board? Yeah, he's there. You shipping out on her? I'm looking for a job. I'm pretty green, but I'm an old friend of his. So... I'm an old friend of his, too. I was out on his last voyage. I wouldn't ship out again under that yellow curve. I was to stop first. When Dirk Peters says, don't go, don't go. What's the matter? Is the ship haunted or something? Nothing's the matter with the ship. The captain's nuts. Are you sure you're talking about the same man I am? There's only one Captain Bernard, and that's him. He and his son both. Two of a kind. Don't take my word for it. Ask any man that was aboard the Grampus last trip. Ask Sanford Allen, our second mate. Talk to the cook, little Tony Matsale and Sale. Ask him. Captain got playful and cut little Tony's arm off. Look, I'll take you aboard. I've been trying to collect my scratch ever since we landed two weeks ago, and I get word tonight it's ready. Uh, watch out for the loose boards on the gangplank. Yeah, I see what you mean. I'm right behind you. I don't think this ship's sailing tonight, Mr. Peters. Look at that sky. A ah, little squall on bother Bernard. Human life's cheap. Climb over the gun. What's fastest? All right. Uh, it's a dirty-looking ship. Captain Bernard! Captain Bernard! Uh, I guess he's in the cabin now. Follow me. Uh, that doesn't sound like a little squall, does it, Mr. Peters? Yeah? Oh, incidentally, my name's Gordon Pym. Everybody's got a name. My name is like that, I guess. Now we get on the passageway here. Captain Bernard, I... All right, men. Uh... Take Mr. Peters and his friend and put them in iron. What? What? Uh, you dirty swine, you double cocker. Yeah, look up, Peters. Take them down to the hold. Until we sail. Aye, aye, then we'll see what you have to say, Mr. Why well, been in Shanghai, Mr. Pym? Shanghai! Four in the morning. Been aboard three hours, Mr. Pym. Your friend the captain ought to come below any minute with a pep talk. Now that we're too far at sea to swim back. Wait a minute. Allen. Sanford Allen. Is that you in the corner? Yeah. Kind of cozy, ain't it? All of us together here like this, huh? What'd they do? Slug you too? Yeah, with the old payroll gag. Come up and get your pay. And they slug you. Eh. Guess who else is here? Tony? Yeah. Tony, how's it going, Tony? I stick at a knife and there's a barely someday. That's what the Tony Monteo do someday. Stick of the knife. Yeah, you better not stick of the knife or you get swinging the head on the gallows. They call that mutiny, Tony. Oh, uh, meet Mr. Allen, Tony. This is Pim, Gordon Pim. Hi, Hello. Pim. Oh. How long are we out for, do you know, Allen? Sure. Six months. Oh, listen to Tony, Peters. Listen to Tony. We stick together this time, and off. He cut off my arm. Someday I cut off his head. Ah, shut up. It's a lot of gab. Well, uh, that's life, I guess. The, the captain says for you to go on deck. Well, 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 if it ain't the kid. 
What you doing aboard ship, Weston? Flying sailor? Mr. Peters, I I didn't know that... I, I'm sorry that... Sorry. He's sorry. You didn't know that we was going to get shanghaied when you come down and tell us the taser rolls made out. You lying, sniveling yellow pig. Well, honestly, ah, I... I forget it. You're in the same boat. Oh, well, uh, here's a friend of yours, Weston. At least, that's what he says. Friend of mine? I have no friends. No friends at all. I... Watch out, Mr. Monteo. Don't touch me. No, they not touch you. I don't want to get my hands dirty. We don't want no dirt in our food, huh, Tony? I... I can't help what Father does. I never wanted to be a sailor anyway. You know that, Mr. Peters. You know that. I hate the sea. Hate the doggone sea. Ah, oh, leave the kid alone. Come on, Alan, before the captain begins to howl like a bull. Hello, Weston. You don't remember me, do you? I... No. No, I... I don't. The name's Gordon Pym. I used to live next door to you in Nantucket ten years ago. You remember? Gordon. How did you get here? I came aboard looking for a job, and I got one, but not the kind I'm looking for. Oh, I hadn't any idea, Gordon. Gordon, wait till you see Father. Wait. He's so changed. All of us are so changed. You'll see. We walked slowly up to the deck, and we lined up. Two lines, ten men. Ten of the toughest, dirtiest-looking men I've ever seen. Captain Bernard kept moving his hand back and forth, sort of a nervous habit, and then started to stand muster. He didn't recognize me, and I didn't mention our old friendship. As the days went by, he seemed to take a kind of joy in making a fool out of me. But then he didn't treat his own son any better. As for Peters, he hated him and wanted to get something on him. But Peters was smart and stayed out of trouble. He was the only man who wasn't flogged during those first 40 days at sea. One night, we called the ten-man crew to a secret meeting and advised them never to try and talk to the captain. Well, a storm was brewing on the 42nd day of the journey, and I was called into the captain's cabin. I opened the door. You call for me, captain? Yes, Mr. Pym. I called for you. Shut the door behind you. You're just standing there like an idiot. My son tells me that you're giving out free advice these days. Gordon, I didn't. I didn't. I, I swear. Shut up. You sniveling swine. Calling you my son makes me ill. Father. <laughs> now, Mr. Pym. I heard you've been advising the men to obey me blindly because you think I'm an idiot mind. Captain Bernard, I said nothing of the kind. Don't lie to me, Mr. Pym. I've known you for many years. Oh, so you do remember. I couldn't very well forget, could I? Despite my idiot mind. I tried to treat you as I treated the other men. You've taken advantage of me. Whispering behind my back. Trying to turn my son against me. Plotting with Mr. Peters. And I've none of this on board my ship. Gordon, he's making it up. I, I never said it. Are I, you I never said calling it. me a liar, Weston? No. No. You I... see, Mr. Pimp? My son denies it now. But I checked his story through our cook. I don't you admit it, Mr. Pimp. I thought I was helping. That's what I told him, Gordon. Shut up. Since when have I asked for your help? Answer me, Mr. Pimp. Answer me. Well, you didn't, sir, but... But what? What did Mr. Peter say to you about my idiot mind? He said nothing at all, sir. Nothing, is it? No, sir. Tell me the truth. It is the truth, Captain Bernard. Liar! I'll cut your lying tongue out with my own hands. What did Peter say? Nothing, sir. Nothing. Leave him alone, Father. He's telling the truth. Don't hurt him. He's my friend. My only friend. The only one I ever had. I leave him alone. Since you love this friend, my son, I'll allow him the pleasure of trying to make a man out of you. Mr. Pym, you'll take this neverling son of mine and tie him securely to the mainmast. No, Father. For the no. Hours. no. Then when he's securely no. tied, you will report to deck for 40 lashings until I get the truth about Peters out of you. Yeah, but it's suicide for a man to be tied to the mainmast in this weather. If anything Captain... happens to him, Mr. Gordon, you'll pay for it with your life. So be sure he's tied securely. (laughs) 
Those were the captain's orders, and we obeyed him. The wind was screaming through the sails like an insane witch on a broomstick, but Weston and I climbed to the cross trees of the mainmast. It was a tough climb, and I think he knew then it was the end for him, but he was afraid to disobey. When we reached the cross trees, I lashed Weston's arms and legs firmly, hoping he could survive the storm. By the time he was made fast, I patted his hair and tried to soothe that poor lost boy. The last I remember of him was his tear-streaked face and the look in his eye. I waved goodbye to him and climbed slowly and carefully below to report for 40 lashes. Captain Bernard, Mr. Pym reporting, sir. Take off your shirt. Yes, sir. Place your hands behind the whipping post and hang on securely, Mr. Pym. And think care. Try to remember the words Mr. Peter said about my idiot mind. Yes, sir. The mainmast, Captain Bernard. It's the mainmast. I'm going for the mainmast. He's trapping. Captain Bernard, and you killed him. You dare say that to me. You murdered Yes, I warned you of this, but you wouldn't listen. I'll say it. I'll say you're insane. Beat it. Beat it. Throw this man in iron. Are you talking to me, Captain Bernard? Throw this man in. Take your hand. Help me, Peters. Take this man hand. isn't going to captain the ship any longer. This is only Mr. Pym. Do you realize that? Do you want to swing on the gallows, Mr. Peters? I can't hear you, Captain Bernard. Ain't that a shame? I just can't hear you at all. course is set. Well, I know, Gordon. I thought we'd tell him when they got here. I mean, we got to work fast. This calm ain't going to last, and we won't be able to steer no course at all with the main must gone. Hey, what's this special meeting about? Oh, oh, look, Alan. Oh, look at the captain. Yeah, hey, look at him. Did you? Yes, Mr. Allen. It's a mutiny. Oh, Are you with me? I copy the head off. No. Shut up, Tony. Come I on. ain't getting mixed up in no mutiny. Oh, is this your idea, Gordon? Yeah, it's my idea, all of us. If any man swings around here, it'll be me, so listen to me. You should have asked us, Gordon. We don't like getting dragged into something like this. Now listen to me, man. Nobody will swing for this if you use your heads. Nobody has to know this is mutiny. Sure, he's all right. We'll kill the captain. Tony Montreal copies the head off. And then we say he used to die. No. no, Tony. We can make this look like a shipwreck. The captain gets put in a lifeboat and set adrift. No, no, Tony, tell me that. Shut up, Tony. Go on, Gordon. Now, we all know the captain's nuts. In two or three days alone on the ocean, he'll be a babbling idiot. Idiots don't talk sense even if they're found. And even if he is found, he'll look like a shipwreck victim. What about the boat? We're going to scuttle her. Get off in lifeboats when we're near land. Within two days, we'll be ten miles off Cape True. We can row to safety, and it'll be up to you men to keep quiet. Now, are you with me, men? No. Yeah, we're with you. We're with you. All right. All right, let's go. And work fast, you monkeys, because we're in for a whale of a blow tonight. I was so smart. Smarter than anybody. You could see it then. I had the whole thing planned perfectly from beginning to end. We lowered the captain in a lifeboat, gave him some biscuits, a compass, and a jug of water. But I didn't figure on the storm that was to come. But the storm broke soon after in all its mad, screaming fury. We couldn't control the grampus. She was like a wounded animal, and I thought for a minute she'd sink by herself that night. There were eight men left then, being the kid and the captain was gone... We had to lash ourselves to the deck to keep from being swept overboard. But during the night, four of the men were lost. It seemed to me that the ocean was fighting back the mutiny. Water poured into the ship. The entire belly of the ship was waterlogged, and only the top deck was riding above the ocean. There were three lifeboats on the Grampus before the storm, but we lost them during the night. And then, toward morning, 
Alan screamed out, You blasted fool, Gordon! We can't scuttle this ship even if we want to now. What do you mean we can't scuttle it? It didn't sink, did it, Mr. Peters? Ah, oh, shut up. The hold of this boat is filled with empty oil casks, isn't it, Mr. Peters? Yes, Alan. I forgot about that. Well, what's the difference? Difference? You land lover, them empty oil casks is full of air. They'll act like a balloon and keep this rotten whaler from sinking. Is that true, Mr. Peters? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, we can set the ship on fire. What good will that do? We're burnt alive. Only man say no set the ship on fire. There's no life about. Yes, Trey. Ah, shut up, all of you. Let me think. <sighs> Just gonna have to set tight and wait. Wait for what, Peters? Wait and pray we get saved. Maybe a ship will pass. By. You'll hang, Peters, if we're saved. You and Gordon will hang. I had nothing to do with the mutiny. Me and Tony's free and clear. Ain't we, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, nothing to do with the non-mutiny. Just wait. Wait. Wait and pray. We did wait and pray. Waited for 13 horrible days without food or water. 13 days. And then one morning... Alan began to complain as usual. Oh, thirsty. So thirsty. How many of us are left, Gordon? It's not light yet, Peters. I don't know. How do you feel, Gordon? I'm not sure. Take it easy, kid. The sun will come up shortly. Alan. Yeah. Where's little Tony? Tony! He isn't around. But it's only both of you. There's just three of us left. None of us can last very long floating around on a... on a derelict ship. None of us. But there's a chance. There's always a chance we can be saved. If we can last. What are you getting at, Alan? One of us will have to die so the... so the others can live. One of us must. No. No, Alan, if we all die here first. Maybe you won't, but I will. You were the ringleader, Gordon. You started this thing. You'd hang if we got the land, so would you, Peters. But I'd be free. I got a knife. Put that knife down. Alan's right, Gordon. If any of us is going to live... One of us has got to die. Oh, Peters, no, it's better to die yeah, than... Gordon. I know what I'm saying. Alan's right. It's two against one. Yeah, two against one. We're going to choose for the privilege. There are three pieces of wood. Take them, Gordon. Hold them in your hand. The man who gets the shortest stick is the victim. Is that level with you, Alan? Sure. All right. Put your knife right here in the middle. Okay. There it is. Okay. Choose, Alan. This one. It's short. It's my turn now. There. Yours is the long one. Who is the shortest mite of Gordon's? Let's say. Gordon? Yeah. It's you, Alan. No. No. No, I won't. I'm the one that should live. I'm innocent. Give me that knife. Let go of it, Alan. Oh! Dead, Peters? Yeah. I just... I... What's the matter with you? Are you all right? Oh, I'll be all right. I'll always double-cross. Alan wounded you badly, Peters. Oh. I'll get some salt water and wash the blood off you. That'll keep the wound clean. It's too deep, Gordon. Huck. Huck ahead. Huck, Gordon. I see the outline of land ahead. Land! No, it's just a mirage, Peter. You think it's land? No. Look. Look straight ahead. You're right. Land. Land ahead. We'll be saved, Peter. 
Here it is. Peters was dead. Peters and Allen lay side by side. They climbed over the gunwale of that ship and started to land. I don't know how I ever made it. I couldn't swim four miles in good condition, yet I swam four miles after 13 days of no food or water. I climbed out of the water, wet and tired, and fell exhausted on the beach. I don't remember what happened after that. I was in a native village of some sort, I knew, and the native women had taken me in and cared for me until I was well. They thought I'd been shipwrecked. They would have kept on taking it, too, if it hadn't been for the first day I was well enough to walk around. I stopped in at the settlement's only inn to figure things out. And as I opened the door... What do you mean there's a derelict ship out there, huh? I mean what I say. All the grampus. This old loon keeps saying he was once the captain of that ship. Oh, loon. I'm crazy, huh? You men think I'm crazy. But I'll prove I'm sane. There was no shipwreck. It was mutiny. Mutiny. And my son was killed. He did it. Yes, he did it. Mutiny. And he did it. There he is. Right there. Standing at the door. Look at him. Don't let him get away. Don't let me get away. Hey, mister. You mustn't get away. Mister, come over here. Talking to me? Yeah. Come on over here to this table, stranger. This old loon claims he knows you. Yes, I know you. Don't I? Then answer me. You were hired on board the Krampus and led a mutiny against me in your swing for it. I was picked up three days after you put me in that rowboat. I stayed alive for one reason and one reason only. To watch your body swing from the gallows. Tell these men the truth. Speak up, man. Speak up. Are you a Gordon Pym? I demand an answer. Are you a Gordon Pym? Well, mister, are you? It's your word against his. Tell the truth. Are you a Gordon Pym? Frankly, I... Don't know who I am. I guess I'm just something washed up out of the sea. Yeah, I'm just somebody washed up out of the sea. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard... Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pitt. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard in Reef the Wild Wind with John Carradine. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. All drama is not staged by man. What earthly showman can match the suspense of a storm at sea? Of a hurricane tossing trees like matches, or the blinding flash of a lightning bolt. Nature on the loose has a terrible power and a terrible beauty. It's some of this that I tried to capture on the screen and reap the wild wind. Because this powerful love and adventure story, adapted from the Saturday Evening Post novel, is also a saga of man's unending contest with the forces of nature. The fine acting of Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard accounted for a good deal of the success of this picture, this paramount work. And tonight, they co-star in the Lux Radio Theater. Suppose you were the casting director on a picture like this, and I called you in and said, we'll need a hundred beautiful girls for the scene we're shooting tomorrow morning. That's a pretty tall order, even in a place where so many girls know about Lux Toilet Soap. How would you go about choosing the hundred girls? Would you pick a hundred blondes or a hundred brunettes or a hundred with blue eyes? I don't think so. They should represent all types of beauty. And if they're going before my camera, there's one thing they'd all have to have, and that's a beautiful complexion. Lux Toilet Soap points in that direction, and millions of women are on the right road. Our cast are in their places now. The lights are up, and the curtain rises on Reap the Wild Wind, starring Ray Milland as Steve Tolliver... And Paulette Goddard as Luxie Claiborne, with John Carradine as King Cutler. In 1840, America's lifeline was the sea. Great sailing ships linked the busy states of New England with the rich Mississippi Valley. But along this lane of commerce lay the shark like teeth of the Florida Keys where savage hurricanes came screaming out of the Caribbean to drive tall ships onto the destroying shoals. Here, storm-riding men in frail schooners, the salvage masters of Key West, stood guard beside America's lifeline. They reaped the harvest of the wild wind, fighting the hurricanes to save lives and cargo from the wrecked vessels. But here also, drawn by tales of great salvage profits, appeared lawless captains, who destroyed for their own gain the ships they were pledged to save. One of these vessels was the Southern Cross, bound north from Havana. Back to shore! Back to shore! What boat is it? What boat? The Southern Cross. She's on Satan Shoal, driven hard and breaking up fast. The Southern Cross founded on the reef and sank to her grave. In a courtroom at Key West, a captain stands trial for the death of a gallant vessel, murdered on Satan's show. This court will remain quiet. Captain John Stewart is on trial here for the gravest offense known to the sea. Except that no loss of life has been shown, this man, if guilty, might well hang. Proceed with your case, Mr. Cutler. Captain Stewart, there is just one more question. You have heard the prosecution assert that you deliberately drove the Southern Cross onto the reef at Satan Shoal. For the last time, is this true? No, it is not. Thank you, Captain Stewart. Your Honor, I move that this case be dismissed. We admit the defendant's error, but you cannot convict a captain for bad seamanship. Your Honor, we will show that behind the bad seamanship lay criminal conspiracy. One moment, please. What is your connection with this case? I am assisting the prosecution, Your Honor. Do you have the authority to cross-examine a witness in this court? Yes, sir. Your name? Stephen Tolliver. If Your Honor, please. Mr. Tolliver is here from Charleston. He is a member of the bar and a practicing attorney. I might add to that, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Cutler, 
I might add that my worthy opponent, Mr. Stephen Tolliver, is also the sea lawyer for the Devereux line, the owners of the Southern Cross. I submit that his interest in this case is purely personal. My interest lies in bringing criminals to justice and in ridding the Florida Keys of captains who wreck their commands and divide the profits with the salvages. With the court's permission, I should like to question Captain Stewart. Proceed, Mr. Tolliver. Thank you. Captain Stewart, on February the 18th, you assumed command of the Southern Cross in Havana, did you not? I did. Tell me, Captain, on the night before that, did you or did you not talk to King Cutler, the same man who is now conducting your defense? Sure, I talked to King Cutler. I've talked to him plenty of times, and so have you. What you talk about? That's my business. Captain Stewart, there are other able skippers with ships on the bottom, but you were the first to stand in defense of the pirate wreckers who haunt these keys. I don't ask what circumstance drove you to join these men whom you must despise, but I will ask the court for leniency in your behalf if you'll join with me in the destruction of these criminals. Tell us who's behind the wrecking of the Southern Cross. I'm not hiding behind anybody, Tolliver. They're trying to hang King Cutler, hang him for some other wreck. Nobody gave any orders on the Southern Cross but me. You admit giving the order that drove that ship at top speed through thick fog to shore destruction? I was their skipper. You were also the captain of the Jubilee, weren't you? I was. And the Jubilee was wrecked too, was it not? Yes. On October the 6th, 1839. Just four months before the wreck of the Southern Cross. Yes. Now, one thing more, please. When the Southern Cross piled up on Satan's Shoal, is it not true that King Cutler's schooner, the Falcon, was standing by within hailing distance? I object, Your Honor. Is it not true? Weren't King Cutler and his brother, Dan Cutler, on the Falcon just off the shoal? Yes, they were. Thank you. That's all. Your Honor, I object. My ship was not the only one laying off the reef when the Southern Cross went down. The Claiborne was there, too, and Steve Tolliver was aboard her. Your Honor, if this man Tolliver is going to go on as prosecutor... The part he himself played in this disaster cannot be ignored. Mr. Tolliver, just why were you waiting beside the reef that sank the Southern Cross? It is in the testimony that the Claiborne fell becalmed. Becalmed, when the wind held till dawn. The Claiborne sailed all night, yet it was only 15 miles on its course. Why? Mr. Tolliver doesn't dare to answer, because the only living man who could have foretold that wreck is the man who planned it. He was lying there off Satan's shoal to get the cargo off a ship he himself had wrecked. Her cargo has not been touched. No, Your Honor. Only because no diver will go down. Your Honor, I demand an answer. Why was Stephen Tolliver at that reef? Mr. Tolliver, will you answer? No, I will not. Of course he won't answer. He can't. If you please, Your Honor, I can tell you why Mr. Tolliver won't answer that question. Silence! Silence! What is this, please? My name is Loxy Claiborne, Your Honor. The Claiborne is my boat, and I was on board that morning also. Your Honor, Miss Claiborne cannot testify unless she's called. Mr. Tolliver, do you wish Miss Claiborne sworn as your witness? I do not. But you've been charged with something you didn't do. Your Honor, there is nothing to be gained by calling her. I will call Miss Claiborne myself, as a witness for the court. Take the stand, Miss Claiborne. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you give shall be the truth and nothing but the truth, so help your God? Yes. State your name. Loxy Claiborne. Be seated, please. Miss Claiborne... You have heard all the testimony at this trial? Yes, Your Honor. And are you acquainted with the accused, Captain John Stewart? Yes, I am. How long have you known him, please? I, I first saw him in October of last year, the morning the Jubilee was wrecked. The Jubilee? That was the first ship that Captain Stewart drove on the rocks? Yes. Under what circumstances did you meet Captain Stewart? I went out to the wreck with Captain Philpot. You mean you went out as a salvager? Yes, Your Honor. My father was a salvage captain. But a woman, a girl. Well, well, go on, please. The morning the Jubilee founded, I was on the balcony with a spyglass. I could see her smashing up on Sambo Key. Her mainmast had snapped and she sloped on her beam ends. And the waves were grinding her hard against the rocks. Captain Philpot came running to the house... He had our salvage schooner ready and waiting. Oh, hi, Loxy. Can you sight her? Yes, she's on Sambo Key. What ship? Looks like the Jubilee of the Devereux Line. The Jubilee? Why, her cargo's dead rich. Come on, gal. Captain Phil, I'm worried about the crew. The crew? There ain't no money salvaging the crew. I'll see you on board. I won't be a minute. Soon as I change my clothes. You're not going after that wreck, are you? Of course I am, Cousin Drusilla. For mercy sake. Now, bring Loxie. along my petticoat, Drusilla. Oh, Mom Mariah, help me rig for wrecking. Now, Miss Loxy, you know what way your mama thinks about you going out to them wrecks. Now, give me my sea boots, quick. Loxy, 
Loxy, what are you doing? Don't get in my way, Mommy. Loxy, I won't allow you to go. I forbid it. The cutlers won't pick the bones of this wreck if I can help it. Loxy, what's your cousin Drusilla going to tell the family about you when she gets back to Havana? Anything she likes. Cousin Loxy, I think you're so brave going out to that wreck. Brave? She's just pig-headed. Oh, if only your father were alive. If father were alive, I wouldn't be running the salvage business. Throw me that sou'wester, Drusilla. There she lies, Loxy. See her? Yes, and I see the Falcon, too. The Cutler brothers are there before us. Why, them folks so rats, they must have knowed. No man alive can foretell a wreck unless he finds it himself. We'll get no part of her cargo, Captain Phil. Cutler and his brother are boarding her now. Then we'll board her ourselves. Heave to! Go the dory! We're boarding the Jubilee! Strike right, Cutler! King Cutler! Hang on, Loxy. Ahoy, King Cutler! What do you want, Phil Pot? Get off this ship. We want salvage shares in this vessel, Cutler. Oh, ho, ho. you don't say. You're a little late, Miss Claiborne. I'm taking charge of the cargo. You can take the crew. Why, there ain't no pay for that, you benighted blowfish. Oh, take them anyway, Captain Phil. Cutler'd let them drown. All right. One, Captain Phil Pot. Late again, huh? Listen, Dan, you and your brother seem to be mighty sharp at reaching these wrecks. Uh, we get up early, Captain. You folks taking the crew off? Yes, we are. Well, there's the captain laying over there in the scuppers. What's the matter with him? Got a wallop on the head, Miss Loxy. He's out clean. He's had a wallop, all right. Look at his head. Oh, he's coming around a little. Lava, Lava. Lie still, mister. We're taking off your crew. Who? Who are you? What are you doing here? I'll be here just as long as you need me. Yeah? I hope that'll be a long time. That was the first time I saw Captain Stewart. We took him ashore and carried him to our house. It was a week before he was well enough to see anyone, and his first visitor was Captain Philpot. He'd come to talk about the wreck. I tell you, son, that fella Cutler'd sink his own grandmother to salvage the gold in her teeth. You're not saying he pushed that reef in front of my ship, are you, Captain Phil? No, I'm saying he's a bad Yankee. I'm a good one. How'd you get knocked out the morning of the wreck? I... I don't know. A lookout called Breakers ahead, and I started to give an order, and that's all I remember. Uh-huh. That's when somebody stepped up behind you with a belaying pin and then drove the Jubilee out of the reef. If I thought that wreck was planned, I'd make a topsail out of Cutler's hide. Well, you hark to me, Sonny. That shark Cutler... Now, no more bilge talk, Captain Phil. You up anchor and let him rest. He needs oh, it. Oh, sure. Just leaving, Loxie. Morning, Captain Stewart. Morning, Captain. Now, you get to sleep. Do you hear me? All right. Tell me, is uh, is your room? Yes. Oh, does it bother you being in a lady's bedroom? My cousin Drusilla's in the guest room. Bother me? <laughs> Took me a long time to be sure I wasn't in heaven. I feel like a hulk putting you to so much trouble. You stop looking at me and get some rest. Uh, just remembering where I saw you before. Under a sou'wester? No, you sort of came out of that storm like one of Mother Carey's chickens. Only you were good luck for me. Will you please close your eyes? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And if you want me, I'll be right outside the door. Well, I'll rest easy knowing that. <laughs> Just sing out. I will. Don't worry. Cousin Loxy, is he better? Oh, he's coming along fine, Drusilla. Oh, he's mighty handsome, isn't he? A man like that would rather lose his life than his ship. Loxy, why do you all hate King Cutler so? Because he needs hanging a little. Cousin Loxy? Well, he does. But his brother's different, isn't he? Different front name, that's all. What are you studying about Dan Cutler for? Oh, I'm not. Really, I'm not. I thought girls raised in Havana never even looked at men till they were married to them. Loxie, did anyone say anything about getting married? No, Drusilla, and I hope nobody ever will. Not to a seagoing rat like Dan Cutler. And Captain Stewart got on his feet again. He left the house. But I used to meet him often down on the docks. He was waiting sailing orders from Charleston. One evening, just at sunset, I saw him on the deck of the Arcturus. They were storing cargo in the hold and making her ready for sea. Loxie! Loxie, here! Oh, Jack! Jack! 
You left your spy glass at our house, and I brought it down to you. Thanks. I've been meaning to come over and thank your mother for all the bother. Oh, you'd better not. Mother's making a heap of to-do about you and me. They're planning to ship me off to visit Aunt Henrietta. I got my orders, too. I sail tonight. A month at sea, and then Charleston, where I showed down with Steve Culliver. Company. He loves me about as much as the devil loves holy water. Oh, but he doesn't sound very dangerous. No, he wouldn't be. Except he holds the power of influence with Commodore Devereaux. You see, Loxie, there's just three things I want out of life. One is to command the Southern Cross steam. And with the Southern Cross under me, I'd get my second wish. Because the man who commands in steam will be head of Devereaux and company someday. Will you have to wear a stovepipe hat, Jack? Well, <laughs> Steve Tolliver looks all right in one. He means to be head of the company himself. Now that I've lost the Jubilee, he'll crack down with everything he's got to break me. Break you? That's a man-sized job. I promise you, he won't do it. You see, I found something in these keys worth fighting for. Nights on watch, I'll see you like this, Loxie. With your hair catching fire in the sunset. That look in your eyes ten fathoms deep. What was the third thing you wanted, Jack? You think I'm going to say you, don't you? Oh, aren't you? Yes. Oh, Jack. You're in my blood, Loxy. Same as the sea. I'm coming back for you. You won't have to come back. I'll be waiting for you in Charleston. They're not going to break you, Jack. And you're going to have the Southern Cross. After Jack sailed, I went to Charleston. At a tea party there, I met Steve Tolliver. He was everything Jack had told me, or so I thought then, a Charleston dandy with lace cuffs and a fancy silk cravat. When we were introduced, I noticed that he carried a tiny black dog in his arms. I thought it very strange. <clears throat> Miss Loxy Claver, Mr. Stephen Tolliver. Charmed, Miss Loxy. How do you do? Oh, excuse me, Romulus. Miss Loxy Claver, Mr. Romulus Tolliver. <laughs> Miss Loxley. <laughs> a talking dog? Well, I never. Yes, and speaks pointedly good English, don't you think, Miss Clavin? You're not a very good ventriloquist, Mr. Tolliver. I saw your lips move. No, Romulus, did you hear? She doesn't believe you can talk. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, I don't mind. I think she's lovely anyhow. <laughs> what a wonderful pair of performing dogs. You know, Mr. Tolliver, I've heard a great deal about you. Oh, yes? Where? In Key West. Well, we're flattered. You're jumping at conclusions, Mr. Tolliver. Sorry. And uh, who's been telling you about me? One of the finest men I ever met, Captain Jack Stewart. I found out then that Stephen Tolliver was the real head of the Devereaux line, and I made it my business to be friendly with him. I saw him every day for weeks. We went out walking together and for picnics along the river. Loxy, have I ever told you that you were very beautiful? Yes, why? Oh? Well, there's... Uh... Steve, there's something I most specially want to talk to you about. You took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, Romulus generally does that. Well, I'm a little worried about Romulus. He's been a changed dog ever since he met you. Oh, don't, Steve. This is really important. It's about the Southern Cross. What I have to say is much more important than the Southern Cross. Oh, but she's the newest ship in the line. Yes, I know, and she's steam and all. But she's hardly fitted for a honeymoon. Honeymoon? Oh, but, Steve, you don't mean... Yes, I do, Loxie. When you walked into Mrs. Mottram's tea party, it was like all the winds of the Caribbean getting together at the same time. I was shipwrecked, Loxie. Oh, but, Steve, I... my whole life is Key West. This is another world to me. There's only one world, Loxy, inhabited by two people. But, Steve, listen, I... Mr. Tolliver! Mr. Tolliver! Oh, here's trouble on horseback. What is it, Bixby? Anything wrong? Mr. Tolliver, sir, Commodore Devereaux says, can you come to the counting house at once, sir? Captain Jack Stewart has just landed in Charleston. What happened in the counting house that day, I learned long afterwards... Jack Stewart standing before the Commodore and his sailing masters, and Lieutenant Farragut of the United States Navy. Behind him on a shelf stood the models of all the Devereaux boats that had gone to the bottom. Rotten Row, it was called, a line of crippled ships leaning against the wall. Don't talk to us apparently when you've got no proof. In short, Captain Stewart, you were not only unconscious when your ship struck, but you don't even know what hit you. I've already said, Commodore Devereaux. I'm not I... interested in excuses. I'm interested in performance. 
Take up the muddle of your command, sir. Put her in a rotten row. Go on, put her with the rest of the fine ships that you and your kind have sent to rot on the bottom. Commodore, you can cat all me both ways. But if you'll just give me a chance Choke to... Choke your Get out, man. I'm only asking her, sir, to give I me a... I said get out. Very well, sir. Weren't you a little hard on him, Commodore? Hard on him? Steve, that parroting Jack Stewart has cost us one of our It wasn't Jack Stewart who cost us the Jubilee, sir. It was the Florida Reefs. Am I to remove the reefs or the captains who can't miss them? Well, perhaps you should remove the Key West pirate wreckers who swarm those reefs like a school of killer whales. And get rid of the man who's behind them all, King Cutler. Cutler or no Cutler, I'll get my ships through. I have to hire and fire every captain on the line. Gentlemen, I asked Lieutenant Farragut to sit with us today... Hoping the United States Navy may give us protection against Cutler and his kind. Gentlemen, the Navy is more anxious than you are to blast those vultures out of the keys. Good. But you present no evidence against this man Cutler. Give us proof of deliberate wrecking, and we'll do the rest. Proof? No one dares testify against Cutler. We sent men down there to find witnesses. What became of them, Steve? I don't know, sir, but I suggest that you send one man more. Who, for instance? Well, me, for instance. You? Why, Tolliver, you wouldn't last 15 minutes in that pirate's mess. I know Cutler, Steve. Why you wouldn't stand any more trench than a rat in a tar barrel? Wait, gentlemen. I say, let Tolliver go if he wants to. Confound it, if they kill him, then he's not the man for the job. <laughs> That's very aptly put, sir. Perhaps Jack Stewart could sail south with me. The Southern Cross is refitting at Havana. You mean you give the Southern Cross to the man who just lost us the Jubilee? Oh. Gentlemen, we're in business. Captain Stewart has increased the earnings of every vessel he's commanded. I personally don't like him, but he gets the most out of a ship. And then throws it away on a Florida reef. I expect to get proof that Cutler, not Stewart, wrecked the Jubilee. Very well. Ormsby, order Captain Stewart to proceed to Key West immediately as mate of the Pelican. There he will set ashore without pay to wait orders. But that's unfair. Oh, you'll have his papers in your pocket. If you find proof that clears him, give him the Southern Cross. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. You do nothing of the sort. Let him sweat on the beach and see how he takes it. And my personal opinion of you is that you're a young fool. Thank you, sir. And what's more, I'll give odds that you'll never leave Key West alive. Oh, but I have to, sir. You see, uh, I expect to be married very soon. After a brief intermission, Ray Milland, Paulette Goddard, and John Carradine will bring us Act Two of Reap the Wild Wind. Now, here's Libby Collins, and she's going to tell you what you would see if you met this lovely young star. Well, Mr. Kennedy, when I first met Veronica Lake, I was impressed with how frank and unaffected she is. After I got over being dazzled by her blonde young beauty, of course. You, you thought her really beautiful, huh? Decidedly. She has such delicate, transparent-looking skin. She's a Lux girl, of course. You mean a girl who uses Lux toilet soap every single day? Yes, that and more. Veronica's a girl who feels active lather facials with Lux soap are really a wonderful beauty aid. Really give delicate skin the protection, the gentle, cherishing care it needs. She says, this care's easy. All you do is smooth the Lux soap lather well into your skin. Rinse with warm water... Splash with cold and pat with a soft towel to dry. And one look at Veronica would convince any woman that the care she uses really does the trick. Well, thanks, Libby. You've certainly convinced me. And I think that a 30 day trial of Hollywood's beauty care will convince any woman who hasn't tried it that Lux toilet soap can help skin to look smoother, fresher, lovelier. Why not get some Lux toilet soap tomorrow? Use it faithfully and see. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Same Time, Same Station, the best of old-time radio. And I'm your host, Jerry Hendigas. And now let's get back to Reap the Wild Wind. Act Two of Reap the Wild Wind, starring Ray Land as Steve and Paulette Goddard as Luxie, with John Carradine as King Cutler. In the 
crowded courtroom at Key West, Loxie Claiborne tells her story. A tale of the raging sea and the wild wind, and the men who draw ships to their doom on the reefs. Of this crime, Captain Jack Stewart stands accused. It is of him she speaks. I learned that night that Jack Stewart had lost his rating as a captain. He came to a ball my aunt was giving, and I saw his eyes flashing as he moved across the room. Jack, tell me, how did it go with the Commodore? They got me busted flat in a haddock. Oh, but your new command. Aren't they going to give you the Southern Cross? The Southern Cross? <laughs> I'm second mate on the Pelican. We sail within the hour for Key West. They're beaching me there till I dry rot. Oh, no, Jack. Nobody's going to break us up that easy, and that's what he's trying to do. He? Who? You just wait here a minute, will you? Mr. Tolliver's bitten off just a little bit more than he's going to be able to chew. This couldn't have been a better night to say what I had to say, Loxie. Anything you have to say to me, it better be fast, Mr. Tolliver. I'm leaving for Key West in the morning. You are? So am I. But before I go, I want to tell you that what you've done is the most cowardly thing I've ever heard of. What? You think you're mighty clever, don't you? Putting Jack off on an old tub and beaching him in Key West as if he were a... Oh, easy, easy now. What really happened was that I... What really happened was that you saw I loved Jack Stewart. No. No, I didn't see that. Oh, yes, you did, and you're right. I do love him, and I'm going to marry him. That's enough. In the first place, you're not in love with him. In the second, I intend to marry you myself. You? Do you think, after knowing one real man like Jack Stewart, that a girl would even look at a popinjay like you? If I played up to you so you wouldn't break Jack, that's all. So you'd give him command of the Southern Cross and no other reason. Oh, I see. That's very enlightening, Miss Loxie. What are you taking your gloves off for? I take it you prefer the rough ways of your Key West pirates. Well, we'll see. Well, what are you going to do? Something your folks should have done to you more often when you were a child. Take you across my knee and spank the living daylights out of Don't you. Don't you put your hands on me! Stay next to me, will you? <laughs> go on, scream! Oh, oh, let me go! Oh, this doesn't hurt me nearly as much as it hurts you. Oh. There you are. And Why, don't you... forget, we're still going to be married. When the ship docked in Key West, my cousin Drusilla was there to meet me. Welcome home, Loxley. Did you have a good time in Charleston? She looked very happy, and I noticed then that she was wearing a new shawl. It was a beautiful piece of India silk. Isn't it lovely? It, it was a gift. Loxley and Steve Tolliver aboard. We heard he was coming. Steve Tolliver had made the trip with me. He was coming down the gangplank in all his lace and frills and the lapdog barking at the people on the dock. Suddenly a boom swung over his head and a huge barrel hung there. It couldn't have been an accident. It seemed to follow him along the dock. I tried to scream and warn him, and then the rope broke. The barrel hurtled toward him through the air. Steve, Steve, are you hurt? Let's see. No, I don't think so. But the barrel of molasses came near being flavored with Tolliver. Steve, listen to me. That wasn't an accident. That rope was cut by one of Cutler's men. They know you're here. Well, thanks for the warning, Miss Loxie. Romulus, I guess you've made an impression at last. I was only worried about the dog. Well, we're both very grateful. Your mother's waiting for you, Loxie. Oh, thanks, Captain Phil. You all right, Mr. Tolliver? Oh, just a little splattered with molasses. Well, that was a close call, my friend. Let me congratulate you. Uh, Mr. Tolliver, this here is Mr. King Cutler. You two men maybe uh, heard about one another? Oh, yes. It's Oliver, eh? Well, well. As one lawyer to another, let me welcome you to Key West. Thank you. That was quite a welcome. I saw it. Unpardonable. Yes, terrible waste of molasses. Uh, I didn't know you practiced law, Mr. Cutler, although I've heard of your uh, other practices. Thank you. I hope I can make your visit to the Keys interesting. I'm sure you'll do your best, Mr. Cutler. Good day. Good day. Captain, you happen to know some nice, quiet nook where I could sleep without any molasses? I guess so. Come on aboard my sponge boat. But you better leave word who to notify in case there's any, uh, uh, suddenness. Listen, Loxie, those voodoo drums... 
They've been going all night. Mom Mariah? Yes, Miss Lassie? Mom Mariah, what are the voodoo drums beating for tonight? Long about dusk, I see something. Couldn't be in this world or the next. It was shaped like Miss Drusilla, and it was traipsing along the edge of the jungle with a demon. Only the demon make himself look like Dan Cutler. Mom Mariah, that's ridiculous. Of course, Miss Drusilla. The drums do that. Drusilla, look at me. Loxy, I wish I didn't have to go back to Havana tomorrow. Are you meeting Dan Cutler on the sly? Are you? Yes. When did you see him last? This evening. He gave me this shawl. He wanted to see me wearing it. Oh, Drusilla, honey. You love Jack, don't you? You know what it's like to love a man so much that nothing else matters. Well, that's the way I love Dan. And I'm going to marry him. Drusilla, I'm a pretty poor one to be giving advice, but you go on back to Havana and ask your mother about it first. Won't make any difference what she says. I'm coming back, Loxy, on the first boat I can get. Drusilla, you... Oh, Mom Mariah, close the windows. Those drums will drive me mad. You can't shut out the voodoo drums, child. They're talking of trouble. Trouble and pain. Fighting and dying and... What do you mean? Who's in trouble? Oh, all I know is what the darkies say. And they say Steve Tolliver's the one. Steve? Well, what about him? What is it you know, Mom Mariah? Tell me. Oh, they say Cutler's sending some men to Captain Phil's sponge boat. They say they're taking Steve Tolliver off and selling him to a whaler. A whaler? Oh, Mom Mariah, we've got to warn them, do you hear? I can't go out in no voodoo night and none of the other darkies. Either. All right, I'll go myself. No, child, no. Get me a lantern, Mom Mariah. No, your mama would tell me if she knows. Cousin Loxley, you can't. Don't tell Mommy where I've gone. Miss Loxley, don't go out into a voodoo night. Don't go out, child. Loxley. Oh, Jack. What's your course, lady? Jack, we've got to get down to Captain Phil's old boat. Steve's in trouble. Steve Tolliver? What do you care what happens to him? Oh, you ninny, this is no time to be jealous. Come on. We reached Captain Phil's boat in time to warn them. And then the Shanghai crew came aboard. But I guess they weren't expecting the reception they got. The fight didn't last long. Jack and Steve and Captain Phil were too much for them, and the crimping crew got off, those who could anyway. Does your arm hurt, Jack? Yeah, a little. The sailor brought you to a right lively party, Miss Luxie. Uh, hey, uh, Tolliver, help me pass a line around this carrion shark. He's coming too. Right there. Jack. Yes? But that, that paper that fell out of Steve Tolliver's pocket, did you see it? Look. What is it? It has your name on it, Jack. My name? I guess if it's about you, we can read it. Well, the hauling, Captain. Jack, look at this. It's your appointment. The Southern Cross. Oh, Jack, your captain. Captain, let me see. <clears throat> That's what it is, all right. Why didn't Tolliver tell me? I don't know. Go below, Captain. Tolliver. Who's going to command the Southern Cross? What? Oh. This is my appointment, isn't it? Yes. How long have you been carrying it? Since I left Charleston. Commodore Devereaux gave you that appointment to give to Jack. Why didn't you give it to him? I had my reasons. And I know what they were, too, why you'd stoop to anything. Oh, yes? Yes. Oh. Land of love. I'll bet that's the quickest Steve Tolliver ever went to sleep in his life. Come on, Lotsey. I'll row you home before I call on Mr. Cutler. State your business, Captain Stewart. All right, Cutler. I was aboard that sponge boat tonight when you sent your men on that crimping job. My men. That's all the proof the government needs on who sunk the Jubilee. Except you haven't got any proof, have you? Where's Tolliver? He's still on board. Oh, yes? Too bad. Maybe I can agree with you on that. What's the matter? Don't you like your new boss? Tolliver won't boss the Devereaux line. I got command of the Southern Cross right here in my pocket. Yes? Well, I've got a statch here that says different. Commodore Devereaux is dead. Steve Dolliver's the new head of the company. What? You stood on your last quarter deck, Stuart. Tolliver won't even let a lobster crate take you aboard. You'll sleep on the beach and scratch for food. And Loxie Claiborne will stick by you. 
She'll sew your filthy rags together if you ask her to. Only you won't ask her. You're slow in the head, but you're more of a man than that. Steve Toller will marry her after a while. She'll be raising his kids. Shut right? up about her. I'll tear that jaw out of your face. <laughs> All right, Stuart. But you're finished, and you know it. I'm not finished yet. You'll never make another penny on the sea, boy. Listen. You know what cargo the Southern Cross carries from Havana? Teak, ivory, spices, silks, and indigo. And you get me to Havana before she sails? Yes. Why? I'll show you how to get rich in one night. Get your records out to meet me at Satan's Shoal. I'm going to pile up the Southern Cross. Steve Tolliver suspected that Jack Stewart had made a deal with Cutler. The next day he commandeered my boat, the Claiborne, and headed out to sea. I was on board. I demanded that he turn about and make for Key West. Keep her on her course. This is piracy. Stand away from that wheel. She stays on her course. I'm acting under federal authority. You've done everything you could to down Jack Stewart. Now you're racing to Havana to break him. You believe in Jack above all things on earth, don't you? I'll always believe in him. Come here, Larkson. And I'll never forgive you, Captain Phil, for helping. Honey, you've got to know the truth. Jack made a deal with Cutler, and he's going to wreck the Southern Cross. Did Jack tell you that himself? No, he didn't. Well, I wouldn't believe it even if he had. Oh, Steve, won't you put back, please? No. Jack Stewart will never sail in command of the Southern Cross. Oh, but that's ruin. How will he ever get another command? He'll never command so much as a mud scow in this world or the next once I reach Havana. Then you'll never reach Havana. Loxie, put down that axe. Come about or I'll part the hand. No, Loxie. You'll wreck her. Will you put back? Not while she floats. All right, then. Loxie! I reckon you won't stop the Southern Cross now, Mr. Tolliver. I had crippled the Claiborne. She lay drifting for hours while the fog closed in around us. The wind fell and we stood becalmed, just off Satan's shoals. If the Southern Cross goes down, you'll be guilty of barratry, Miss Loxing. The Southern Cross isn't going down, Mr. Tolliver. Captain Stewart's in command. Ladesman, what's the word? No bottom, sir. Well, we missed it by a split hair. Missed what? I wasn't going to say nothing to you folks, but we pretty near drifted onto Satan's show. That's the worst pack of reefs around here anywhere. Oh, that horn's driving me crazy. Near all the time, but never gets here. I never heard a horn like that. It sounds like something out of the bottom of the sea. That horn's worked by steam. It's a Southern Cross. The Southern Cross? Well, suppose it is. Jack knows what he's doing. He can pick a channel. Listen. I suppose you know what boat that is, too, eh? That's Cutler's boat. Yes. Cutler. You don't need to smell the bait to know somebody's gone fishing. Oh, but the steamer's safe. She's got power. Wind or no wind. She's not drifting around helpless like a cracker box like us. No bottom, sir. Yeah. Marky. What is it? You're here? That's her engines. The Southern Cross. I must see her. You'll be seeing her soon enough. She's coming closer. That's the falcon leading her on. If only this fog would lift. Listen, she's pounding hard. She's got full steam up. Full steam in these waters? There she rises. Playing straight for the reef. It's the Southern Cross, all right. Oh, no, Steve. No, it can't be. Give me that horn, Sam. You'll never stop her now. She's almost on the reef. She's going to strike. Down with her head. She's a killed ship. Yeah. There ain't nothing left now but to get her people off. There's one thing left. To arrest the man who murdered his own command. Stand by your boat, Tackle. Blow it away. Blow it away. Well, Stuart's done the job, Loxie. He's killed the Southern Cross. Oh, Captain Phil. Why didn't he kill me instead? In just a moment, Ray Milland, Paulette Goddard, and John Carradine will return in Act Three of Reap the Wild Wind. And now, 
Here's a sound familiar to many of our boys today. Well, it takes tons of smokeless powder to keep those big guns booming. The big guns that help our fighting men to victory. And right in your own kitchen, Mrs. America, you can help supply that ammunition. How? By saving every ounce of precious fats, the source of glycerin, which is needed to make explosives. Glycerin is needed, too, to make many vital medical supplies. But fat is so hard to get nowadays. I need it all for cooking. The government asks you to save and turn in only waste fats, those left from cooking. Drippings from meat pans, leftover vegetable oils and shortenings. Even the grease skimmed from soup or stew is needed. But we have such a small family. What I'd have left over would hardly matter. Almost any home kitchen can contribute at least a tablespoonful a day, and that small amount will add up to a pound a month. And if every housewife in America turned in only a pound of waste cooking fats a month, it would make 540 million pounds of smokeless powder a year. Goodness, I had no idea. I guess I can help then. Tell me, Mr. Kennedy, what do I do with the fat after I've saved it? Strain the liquid fat into a clean, smooth-edged can. Glass or paper containers are not practical. And when the can is full, take it to your meat dealer, who will pay you cash for each pound. Just about 21 days after you've turned it in, the fat will be on its way to the munitions plant or to the medical supply manufacturers. This is a vital service nearly every woman can perform for her country. Something real and important she can do for that boy she knows out fighting on the battle line. Remember, all waste fats and greases that are a product of cooking are usable. And should you have any difficulty in disposing of the fats, advise your local salvage committee. Begin tomorrow this urgent patriotic service. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. After the final curtain, we'll take you behind the scenes with our stars. But now here's the curtain for Act Three of Reap the Wild Wind, starring Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard with John Carradine. Slowly but surely, the testimony given by Loxie Claiborne is weaving a net of evidence a net which is drawing tighter and tighter about the men who wreck ships on the Florida Keys. The court is silent, hanging breathlessly on her every word. That's why Steve Tolliver lay off Satan's show when the Southern Cross went down, because the Claiborne was becalmed. I disabled her. I think that's all, Your Honor. Have you any questions, Mr. Tolliver? None. Mr. Cutler? I certainly have, Your Honor. So, Miss Claiborne, you disabled this vessel, virtually knocked her apart with your own little hands. Oh, no, gentlemen, what you've heard is a girl caught hopelessly between two men who fought over her as dogs fight over a bone. You want to object? Sustained. Didn't you play these men one against the other, encouraging each in turn? Isn't that why they're both hopelessly entangled in this disaster? I won't answer that. You won't answer. <laughs> gentlemen... Isn't it obvious to you that this girl is trying to protect Steve Tolliver? And why? Because she knows that Tolliver had entered into a conspiracy to wreck the Southern Cross. What man on board was responsible for the death of that ship, we do not know. But certainly, Captain Jack Stewart had no knowledge of it. Then why did he order his stokers driven under the whip? Why did he, in a heavy fog, demand more and more steam until the Southern Cross was tearing ahead at full speed straight for the reef? That has not been shown. I'll show it now. Your Honor, there was a Barbados freeman called Salt Meat served as stoker aboard the Southern Cross. I should like him called as a witness of the prosecution. Your name is Salt Meat? Aye, sir. You know Captain Stewart's voice, don't you? Well, I reckon I does. Didn't you hear him order full speed? Why, uh... Object! Sustained. You were in the stoke hole at the time of the wreck, were you not? No, sir. I was in the orlop. You were in the orlop? In the hold of the ship? Yes, sir. That's where I was when the steamer she smashed against that reef. And I heard that dying scream. You heard what? The ship, sir. She screamed like a woman. <laughs> You mean you heard tearing timbers and escaping steam? Twenty years, I know the sea like I knows day from dark. 
But I never heard no sound like that, except when a woman died. Was there a woman aboard the Southern Cross? No, sir. I think she'd go ashore before we sail. Who? A lady would talk to the captain in Havana. A lady? What did she look like? Well, I don't rightly remember how she was dressed, but she was wearing a mighty pretty shawl. A shawl? What kind of a shawl? I don't know, but it was mighty pretty, kind of red and yellow. Your Honor, I request permission to interrupt this testimony and recall Jack Stewart to the stand. Granted. Captain Stewart, did the Southern Cross carry passengers? No. But a woman came aboard just before you cast off in Havana. What of it? She didn't sail. Are you sure of that? She might have stowed away in the hold. She wouldn't have stowed away. Then you knew her. Yes, I knew her. Jack, was it Drusilla? Yes, it was Drusilla. Oh, Jack. Who screamed? Who screamed, Stewart? And keep out of this. If that scream was Drusilla, Stewart, I'll tear the throat out of you. And shut up, you fool. Order! Order in this court! Your Honor, I call Dan Cutler to the stand. You were Dan Cutler? Yes. King Cutler's brother. Yes. You loved Drusilla Alston, didn't you? Yes. And you were going to be married? Yes. She promised to come back to you soon from Havana, didn't she? On what ship? First one she could get. And that happened to be the Southern Cross. We heard the Falcons call through the fog. Your boat, Dan, waiting like a bird of prey for the Southern Cross, which you knew would strike, didn't you? Don't answer that. But you did not know that your sweetheart was aboard that doomed ship, did you? I don't believe she's down there. We don't know, Dan. But some woman is down there, under ten fathoms of green water, all alone in a dead ship, where the shark and the giant squid moved through the shadows. It wasn't the ship that screamed, Dan. It was a woman. Maybe Drusilla. And you know the men who were responsible, don't you? Don't answer. If Drusilla's under that sea, I'll see the men hung who put her there. Even your own brother? Even my own brother. Your Honor, please... All day we've heard the prosecution present a mass of lying insinuations. Now I challenge Mr. Tolliver himself to dive to the sunken hull, to bring up the proof he claims is there. Mr. Cutler, such a dive is impossible. If murder has been done, this court must know it. I cannot order men to almost certain death. You don't have to. That dive isn't impossible. I'll make it myself. You will, Captain Stewart. If Tolliver will come down with me. Mr. Tolliver would be a madman to accept. Perhaps, Your Honor, but I have no choice. I move that this court be adjourned to the wreck of the Southern Cross. Stuart, are you ready? All set, Cutler. Tighten the bolts on the helmet. Listen, Stuart. If that girl is down there, come back alone. Do you understand? Yes. Do you have your knife? Yes. Well, use it. Remember... Come back alone. Steve, Steve, listen to me before it's too late. Don't make this dive, Steve. Please don't go down there. I have to, Loxy. If Priscilla's there in that wreck, we've got to know. Watch yourself, Steve. Keep an eye on Stuart. Don't worry. Steve, if if Priscilla is down there, you will see her shawl, yellow and red. I hope we don't see it, Loxy. Ready, Captain Phil. Good luck, Steve. And try to forgive me. What's delaying you, Tolliver? Nothing. Bolt the faceplate home. Lower away. How far down are they, Captain Phil? Ten fathoms. Must be on the wreck by now. Are they still taking out line? No, sir. They've stopped. Stop. They're there, Laxie. Oh, Steve. Steve, be careful. Be careful, Steve. Watch yourself. Keep an eye on Stuart. Keep an eye on him. There's the wreck. Move slowly. Don't pull your line. Keep an eye on Stuart. Watch him. If the girl is there, come back alone. Come back alone. Remember... There's the hatch. Move slowly. Down the ladder. Into the hold. Watch Stuart. Watch him. If the girl is there, come back alone. 
There's the cargo. If Priscilla was aboard, she... What's that? Behind that chest. Floating up in the current. There again. It's a shore. A red and yellow shore. Priscilla's shore. So? Stuart sees a door. He's coming this way. If the girl is there, come back alone. There's a knife in his hand. Watch him. Be careful. Come back alone. Watch him. Use your knife. Use your... Wait. Get back. Go back. Quick. He stopped. Why? Why did he stop? Tolliver. Behind you. Look behind you. It's a squid. A giant squid. Get back. Get out of the way. Don't you sue it. A squid, you fool. He's pop. What's the matter with him down there? Are you getting any signals? No, sir. Not for the last couple of minutes. I can feel what's happening. I don't know. Start bringing them up. Taking your slack. I, I can't, sir. What? The lines are fouled. Both of them. Get out of my way. Let me at those lines. Oh, there's ink coming up in the hatches. Ink? That's a giant squid. Squid? Where? A giant squid. The ink's coming up right over the wreck. Captain Phil, get them up. They'll both be killed down there. Get them up. Keep those pumps working. We can't budge the line, sir. Are they taking any slack? No, sir. Not an inch. Cutler. Is that ink still coming up? The hatch is black with it. Pass those lines over the winches. Captain Phil, bud. One of the lifelines is carried away. One of them's lost down there. Keep both the pumps working anyhow. Have you got that line over the winch? Yes. Wait, wait. One of them's coming up. They're slacking the line. Which one's coming up? Who is it? We can't tell you. All together, you men. Get on that line. He, Paul. He, Paul. I can see him. I can see a body. He's off now. He's off. Don't smash him again the hull. I can see his helmet. Here he comes. Lift him in. Lift him in. Phil, who is it? Which one is it? Get back, you men. Get back. It's Steve Tolliver. Oh, Steve. Get that face plate off him. Get it off. Yeah, there we are. Oh. He's badly hurt. Looks to me like that squid tore him up a bit. Wait. Where's Jack Stewart? Did you get him up? No. His lifeline parted. He's gone. He could have got away. He came back to help me. He stayed down to save my life. It cost him his own. Steve, did you find... with Drusilla? I brought the shawl. That's the shawl I gave her. Look at it, King. You did this. Shut up, Dan. That wreck was yours. You put her on the rocks the same as you did a hundred others. Shut your mouth or I'll shut it for you. I'll shut up when I see you hung and not before. No, you won't see it. Mm-hmm. Now get back. Get the shut down. Don't anybody move a step. Get him there. Grab him. Oh, no, you don't. I'll kill the first man who... Well, that's the first time I knew that pistol of mine would shoot. Looks like a good job, Captain. Cutler's dead. Steve, come here. It's Dan. He's... Dan? Dan Tutler? Can you hear me? King. King wrecked the Jubilee. And the Southern Cross, too. Tell... Tell Lucilla... I've got a pretty shawl for her. Well, Romulus, you glad to be getting back to Charleston? And how you like your new mistress, Miss Loxy Tolliver? Dog, what's the matter, dog? Is you busted? No. Not me. I just shot. Man, thanks, Romulus. But thanks, <laughs> <laughs> They seem to be having a little trouble getting acquainted. As I remember it, darling, so did we. Curtain comes down, the lights come up. 
And thanks to Ray Milland and Paulette Goddard, we reaped a hurricane of good acting tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, C.B. I have a very embarrassing question to ask. A fellow I know says that there never was a giant squid anywhere near as big as the one you had in Reap the Wild Wind. How about it? Oh, oh. Well, I've been defending that poor little giant squid ever since the picture came out, Ray. Actually, several have been found much larger than the one we used. Ours had a tentacle spread of 60 feet. One was killed in the waters off St. Augustine that was twice as large, 120 feet. Sounds like one of the sea monsters the sailors were afraid of when Columbus crossed the ocean. <laughs> well, there's, <coughs> there's been at least one instance of, of a giant squid attacking a boat, Paulette. A fishing smack in the North Atlantic. So perhaps the superstitious sailors weren't so far wrong after all. Well, after wrestling around underwater in a diving suit with that squid for about two weeks, I can testify that he was a hard-working actor, C.B. <laughs> Any actor that works for DeMille is a hard-working actor. <laughs> <laughs> Just a minute, Paulette. Don't blame me. You got yourself into it. Back there when I was trying to cast the half-breed girl in Northwest Mounted Police. Oh, yes. That was when she borrowed that buckskin outfit from the costume department and went into your office and said, uh, what did you say? How you like, huh? <laughs> I guess he did, huh? <laughs> well, what could I do, huh? <laughs> I'm going to give you our next uh, director a little advice. No, I'll give you some advice, Mr. DeMille. Something you should watch out for. You see, you aren't being fair to your audience unless you make sure that every woman knows what a grand complexion care luck soap is. I use it both at home and in my dressing room at the studio, so I know. Well, after all the Technicolor film I've shot of you, Paulette, I know all about you and luck soap. Now let me tell you about next week. Yeah, who'll be here, CB? Next Monday night, Brain, our stars will be... Ronald Coleman. And with him, we'll have Otto Kruger and Edna Best. The play is the Broadway stage success, Libel. One of the strangest stories I've ever come across. You'll hear Ronald Coleman as a veteran of the First World War, faced with the almost impossible task of proving, against the doubts of his friends and even his wife, that he is himself. It's a great part for Ronald Coleman and a great play for all of us. Well, count me in as a listener, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, mate. That was an exciting voyage. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Coleman, Otto Kruger, and Edna Best in Libel. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. John Carradine is currently seen in the MGM picture Reunion in France. Heard in tonight's play were Fred McKay as Jack, Norman Field as Phil Pot, Lois Collier as Drusilla, Jack Mather as Dan, Lillian Randolph as Mum Mariah, and Stanley Farrar, Griff Barnett, Bruce Payne, Leo Cleary, Crayon Denton, Regina Wallace, Art Gilmore, Charlotte Treadway, Earl Keane, and Horace Willard. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Ronald Coleman, Edna Best, and Otto Kruger in Libel. Was it? Nobody knows. But the house was haunted by something or somebody. The boarders here at Mrs. Dimity's boarding house didn't believe in ghosts either, myself included. But we were curious about them. And that's why we voted to move into the old brownstone house on 49th Street. And once we were in, we were still convinced that ghosts don't venture abroad in a New York tenement building. The only one who wasn't quite convinced that ghosts exist only in storybooks was old Mrs. Dimity herself. But her favorite rumor, young, handsome Ned Saunders, and myself, uh, I'm Dr. Hammond, we refused to believe the ghostly nonsense. Ann Mitchell, the young sculptress who lived there, was frankly curious, while the Countess Harkavy, a fortune teller of some renown and 
a psychic of questionable fame, was delighted at the idea of living in a haunted house. That was in a business way, of course. It was around 11 o'clock at night when the boarders who were then assembled in that dark, dreary living room first heard what some claimed was a ghostly presence. Listen to that, Dr. Hammond. I hear it, Ned. It's an uncommon sort of sound for the wind. That is not the wind, Dr. Hammond. It is the cries from the spirit world. I feel it in the marrow of my bones. No, oh, say, Countess, can't you feel things in a more comfortable place? Bone structures always struck me as a most uncomfortable place to have a feeling going on. Listen, all of you. Listen. Oh, skip it. Ned, will you pass me that magazine on the shelf next to you? I think any kind of reading will be preferable to listening to old psychic years rambling. Sure, thanks. There you are, dear. You really think this house is haunted, Countess? Yes, I do. It would be a fortunate thing for your business if the United States of America could be made ghost conscious. Dr. Hammond, you will live to regret that remark. The Countess will take you seriously. I am serious. And talking of taking things seriously, when are you going to start taking me seriously, Anne? When you start to make a living, Ned. Oh, someday I hope I won't have to try and sell my sculptures. All art is conceived out of the fires of struggle. Well, I'm tired of struggling. Oh, if I could just create something out of the ordinary for an art exhibit, I could make a couple of hundred dollars. I've been working three months for an idea, and I haven't done a thing. My poor dear Anne, as long as you doubt the extraordinary, how can you create it? She's got you there, Anne. Yes, she has, Dr. Okay. Hammond. Well, what would you suggest as a good subject for Anne to sculpt, Countess? Well, a denizen of the other world, perhaps? Oh, sure. That's rather a hot place for a girl to venture in order to sculpt the devil, isn't it? Don't speak so lightly of his satanic highness. No one knows where the devil's hand may be next. How about sculpting me, Anne? I'm an extraordinary young man. That you are, darling. Extraordinarily broke, at any rate. Oh, the woes of the world revolve on that ugly stuff called money. People take money much too seriously, Ned. Well, frankly, Dr. Hammond, if I had some of it, I wouldn't take it at all seriously. I'd scatter it around the world like a veritable windmill. Oh, frivolity. That's your trouble, my dear friends. Frivolity. You feed on it. Here in this very house is a poor earthbound spirit. And yet you ignore it. Come, Countess, you don't expect us to take it seriously. I expect... Expect nothing. What do you expect us to do? Call the spirit in and ask him to sit for me? Possibly, Anne. Possibly. Come, come, Countess. You're joking. I have never been more serious in my life. I think we ought to hold a seance and command the spirits to enter the room. That would be interesting, at least scientifically so. Oh, nonsense, Doctor. Besides, Mrs. Dimity would never stand for it. Ever since she moved us into this house, she's been scared stiff of the very idea of spirits. Have you seen the amulet she's been wearing? Yes. <laughs> she carries it around like a sword. Why don't we ask her? <laughs> oh, we were just talking about you, Mrs. Dimity. Oh, dear. I tell you, I, I just can't stand being alone in my room. I just know something was in there with me, Anna. I just know it. The spirits probably have been attracted to you, Mrs. Dimity. I've always felt you're strongly psychic. Oh, don't say it, Countess. Don't even think about it. It was all a mistake moving into this house. All a mistake. I've just never been as nervous. Dr. Hammond, feel my pulse. Feel it. It's practically non-pulse, so to speak. <laughs> well, I wouldn't take it seriously, Mrs. Dimity. We all know there are no such things as spirits. You see, we've been talking about the ghost for so long that at times we half believe, but that's purely imagination. It wasn't imagination at all, Dr. Hammond. You know very well there are only five of us living here. You four were downstairs and I was alone upstairs and, oh, I did hear footsteps in the hall. I opened the door and I felt something cold touch me. Ah, you see, I knew it. Oh, yes, but... Oh, oh. it came from upstairs. Listen, all of you. Ah, and was that also the wind, Dr. Hammond? I don't know, Countess. What do you think, Ned? Well, I think the Countess' idea of a seance is a good practical suggestion. I'm all for it. A seance? Oh, dear. Uh, yes, let's give it a try. Uh, well, we're all agreed. Yes, it's all on, Ned. I think it's a good You're idea. in charge, Countess. Now tell us what to do. Well, now, for the first thing, bring your chairs into a circle, please. Oh, dear. I think I'm on back. You know, I'm just going to give it. Now, hold hands. Will someone turn off the light? I'll get it switched. Good. Now we're in the dark. Oh, Quiet, please. Quiet while I summon the spirit. Yes. 
It is midnight, O oh spirit, midnight. Enter the portals of our room and speak to us. Speak to us. We are gathered to commune with you who have passed on. Withhold not your secrets. Speak. Speak. It is I, Countess Harkavy, asking you to descend to this mortal plane. Answer me. Answer me. If, uh, if my Uncle Ezekiel's in the room and wants to talk to me, I'd talk to him, Countess. Yes. Mrs. Dimity. Ned, stop squeezing my hand. I'm not squeezing your hand, eh? Huh? Well, whatever you're doing, stop doing it. I'm not doing it. anything. Ouch, doggone it. What's the matter with you, Anne? Oh, you're so coy, pinching me now. I'm not pinching you. My hands are in my lap. Well, who's ever sitting next to me? Stop it. Dr. Hammond. I'm sitting across from you, Anne. Mrs. Dimity. Oh, dear. I wouldn't have the courage to squeeze anybody's hand at this point. Ouch. Well, whoever it is, turn on the light, somebody. Turn on the light. No. Somebody's got hold of my no, hand. No, don't turn on the light. The spirits have entered the room and are attracted to you, Anne. To you. Oh, please, please, turn on the lights, please. I'll do it, Anne, I'll do it. Oh, but then, Joel, then... Oh, but then... Oh, who? There's nobody sitting next to you. That's a vacant chair. But I felt it. Anne, did you imagine it? Imagine what? Did somebody squeeze my hand? I imagine nothing. Look. Look at my hand. And tell me that's imagination. What's it, darling? What? Dr. Hammond, look. Hmm? Her hand is bruised. Hmm. Yes, it is. Pretty badly bruised. Countess, where were you sitting? Exactly where I'm sitting now, Dr. Hammond, but I haven't moved. You had your chance to do something extraordinary, Anne, but you must it. A pity is all I can say. A great pity. The seance is ruined. But, Countess, wait a minute. What for? To try another seance and have you become hysterical all over again? Good night. Doctor. Mr. Hammond, is it possible that I really was holding the hand of something or... Anything's possible, Anne, but not very probable. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I said not very probable, Mrs. Dimothy. I think perhaps the Countess has been playing a trick on all of us. It's a cute trick, Doctor. A pretty difficult one. If she wasn't playing a trick, she shouldn't have been so upset when you turned on the lights, Mid. Oh, Doctor, I think you've got a point there. Nothing like a good dash of logic to take the cold chills out of my spine. Well, how could the Countess do it, Doctor? Well, Mrs. Dimmer, the psychic phenomena is the Countess's business. After all, she makes a living out of calling imaginary spooks from the outer world. I don't think it's very nice of us to try and pry into her secrets. I hope you're right, Doctor. I do hope you're right. Well, I wouldn't worry, Mrs. Dimmer. Well... I'm going upstairs to bed. I've had enough spooks to last me for years. Oh, wait for me, Mrs. Dimity. I'll go up with you. Oh, good night, Ned. Good night, Anne. Good night, Dr. Hammond. See you in the morning. Good night, my dear. And don't worry about the spooks. They're purely harmless make-believe. Oh, dear. I'll never sleep a weekend. Well, Doctor, what's the tongue-in-the-cheek look? Oh, Ned, I'm afraid we've had our first touch of real psychic phenomena tonight. But you just said... I didn't want to frighten the women. And you believe this house is haunted? Haunted? Mm, well, I don't like the phrase, but in essence, that's the idea. I was wondering if you'd be interested in trying an experiment with me tonight. Certainly, Doctor, anything. But suppose you and I spend the next few nights down here. We'll turn off the lights and wait. Just wait. Perhaps we can invite some trouble. We waited that night through without sleeping, but nothing extraordinary happened, except for the fact that Mrs. Dimity's rocking chair kept rocking all night long, creaking and squeaking as it moved. But the wind could have been responsible for that. The next night and the next and the one after that, we kept our nightly vigil, creeping up to our rooms like thieves just before daylight broke, so that nobody would suspect our secret experiment. On the fifth night of our wait, we heard the rocking chair creaking... Creaking, creaking. Doctor. Yes, Miss? That rocking chair couldn't be moved by wind tonight. There isn't a breath of air stirring. I noticed that, Ned. I wonder... Listen. Yes, the creaking stopped. Same as usual. I'll try to get some sleep. I can't. I'm as nervous as a cat over this whole thing. Yes, I'm jittery, too. Ouch, let me... What's the matter, Ned? I don't know. Somebody attacked me. Help me, Doctor. 
Help me. I, I, it's got its arms around my throat. Here, yeah, I feel it. We'll find out who this ghost is in a short time. Here, I've got his arms, Ned. My throat. Let go of my throat. There. It's there. Can you hang him for the lawn, Doctor? I think so. But he's as strong as an ox. No, you don't. You know me, Doctor? His voice. Certainly doesn't sound human. Turn on the lights, Ned, while I hang on to him. You'll find out who this practical prankster is. I'm afraid to let him go, Doctor. I can handle him, Ned. You turn on the lights. Hurry, Ned. Hurry. Oh, good. Hey, Doc. Go ahead. Doctor, where is he? He's right in front of me. I've got him by the arms. I'm... I'm hanging on to it. Well, this is amazing. Amazing, Doctor. Well, I we can't see it. It's invisible. Uh, help me, Ned. He's trying to escape. Help me. I can only see him. There we are. I've got it. I've got it. What is it, Doctor? What is this thing? I didn't know as I held the grisly thing in my arms. It struggled and sobbed and moaned exactly as a beast would struggle and moan. An invisible beast. That was the horror of it. An invisible beast. I sent Ned to the basement of the old brownstone to get some stout rope. At least we could prevent this horror from escaping. That's what I thought then. Well, Ned returned shortly from the basement and opened the door. Here you are, Dr. Hammond. Well, quickly, Ned, bind his legs. I... I can't hang on to it much longer. Not as young as I used to be. All right, Dr. Almanac. Somehow, I... try to hold him on the floor. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, there you are, Ned. Now, quickly. Its feet are still for a minute. There. I got the rope about them. Uh, Look. Huh? A perfect loop around nothing but empty air. Hold him and I'll bind the rope around. Go oh, quickly, Ned. There we are. That covers his feet. And I'll bring it up here and around his legs. Uh, here, give me the rope and I'll bind his hands. All right. I'm getting him bound up like an Egyptian mummy. There, that does it. Ah, what a relief to be able to let that awful thing go. All right, I'll take the rope now, Doctor, and bind it to the chair. He won't get away now, I'll guarantee you that. It isn't very large, is it? No, about the size of a small boy. Yeah, but what is it? Have you ever encountered anything like this before? Well, frankly, Ned, never. Look at my hands, bitten and bruised. I wonder if I'll ever be able to move them again. What are we going to do with the darn thing now? I don't think that's our responsibility, Ned. I think we'd better call the boarders together and let them in on the secret. Would you like me to get them, Doctor? Uh, yes, wake them up. But don't tell them why. Just ask them to come down here, and I'll throw this rug over the chair so that they won't see the ropes right away. Ah, uh, don't ask them any questions, everybody. Dr. Hammond will explain everything. Come in, Countess. Come in, everybody. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Dimity. I'll explain it in a minute. Explain it, Dr. Hammond? Uh, sit down, everybody, please. Uh, no, Mrs. Dimity, not in the rocking chair. Oh, dear me. I'm afraid we're in for a revelation this evening. Uh, Ned, please close the door. Right. Strange are the ways of the world. Yes, Countess. The ways of the world are very strange. Mrs. Dimity and the Countess has been correct about this house. There is something in it. Oh, what do you mean? There's nothing to be frightened of, Mrs. Dimity. Oh, spirits are often kind. Indeed, they're friendlier than many mortals. This isn't exactly a spirit, Countess. What do you mean? Exactly what I say. It's a beast of some kind. Oh, the doctor, is it in this room? <laughs> Mrs. Dimity, please. Yes, ma'am, it's in this room, in that rocking chair. I threw a rug over it. Oh, unfortunate spirit. If you wish, Countess, remove the rug. Yes, of course. Why, where, where is it? It's there. You can see the ropes being held in place by it. What kind of a hoax are you trying to play on me, Dr. Hammond? It is not a hoax. There's a living, breathing something bound in that chair. But it's invisible. Oh, why, why, that's incredible. It's more than incredible. Would, uh, would you mind if I touched it? I don't see why I should. It's not my beast. The problem is, what are we going to do with it? 
What do you suggest, Mrs. Dimity? Mrs. Dimity! Oh, she's fainted, Dr. Hammond. I'll get a smelling salt right here in the desk drawer. <gasps> oh, I felt it. I felt it, Anne. I felt it. A captured spirit. I must tell my co-worker, Dr. Zarkoff, right away. He'll be so thrilled. So thrilled. I'm not sure that we ought to tell anybody about it. Are you, Dr. Hammond? Ned's quite right. We should not. Oh, but Dr. Zarkoff is the only living person constantly in touch with the spiritual night and day. Day and night, constantly. The smelling salt should be in here someplace. Oh, here they are. Until we find out exactly what it is, I don't think we ought to divulge the secret. Heaven knows what we've stumbled into. You're right, Ned. Here, Mrs. Dimity, take a deep breath of this. And how do you suppose going about finding out what it is? Breathe deeply, Mrs. Dimity. Oh. Well, I was thinking it might be possible for Anne to make a plaster cast on it. Oh, that's a gay idea, Ned. Breathe deeply, Mrs. Dimity. You'll be all right. That's quite a good idea, as a matter of fact. Oh, no, you'll hold it while I make a cast, huh? If it happens to bite me with a pair of invisible teeth, that'll be my word. No. No, being a doctor, I shall use a little chloroform and put it to sleep for a while. We'll be able to make a perfect cast. Mr. Dimity, are you all right? Oh, I'll never be all right again. Well, Anne, are you willing to give it a try? Oh, I suppose so, Ned. I'll prepare the plaster right away. <laughs> There we are, Anne. The chloroform has worked perfectly. Whatever it is, it's asleep. Before you start with the plaster, I should like to listen to his heart with the stethoscope. Certainly, Doctor. Uh-huh. Hmm. Normal. A little faster than is normal for a human being, but maybe we're not dealing with a human being. Yes, Doctor, that's very possible. Ned, would you hand me that container near you? Certainly, Anne. There you are. Thanks, Ned. Well, Dr. Hammond, are you ready? Yes, Anne, whenever you are. Oh, we might as well start. It's two o'clock. We ought to be through by seven. And so Anne started to work to cover that invisible form with moist plaster. We watched her spellbound. The hideousness of the rough object that soon met our eyes was appalling. Anne's hands shook perceptibly as she forced herself to complete what she had started. Minutes changed into hours. The mold was completed, and we had a rough idea of this figure. Then Anne allowed the mold to dry. By morning, we had a rough facsimile of the invisible beast. How can I describe what it looked like, when it looked like nothing so much as a demon out of hell itself? Yes, shaped like a man with long, sinewy arms, but it was small, only four feet or so high. Its muscular development was amazing, and the face, the face looked like a cannibal, a demon. Cruel, tiny eyes, a tiny nose, and a twisted, long, a horribly long mouth, and sharp, shiny teeth. The first rays of light broke through the window, and I realized that the effects of the chloroform were wearing off. And... Ah! Watch out, ladies, away. I got him, Doctor. You better help me. Yes, of course. Here. Here, we'll Hold him together. Uh, and, and... Yes, Dr. Hammond. We'll hold him down, and you bind his legs with the cord. Yeah. Get that rope around his legs. Ah, oh, good girl, Anne. That's it. Your arm, darling, it's bleeding. Don't mind my arm. Find the leg. Okay. Hurry up, Anne. Uh, that's the girl. Now slip the rope around him and pull it good and tight. All right. There we are. Give me the rope, Anne. I'll secure his arm. Ned, look at your arm. Oh, Doctor, he's deadly bitten. Don't bother about me now, darling. We can't let this beast loose on the man. That face you've done, Anne, looks like the face of a man eater. Yeah, it does. Give me a hand, Dr. Hammond. We'll put it back in the chair yeah. and tie it. Yeah. Clean it now. One, two, lift. <sighs> There. Now, try the darn thing. What do you think we ought to do with it now? I don't know. You're the doctor. Well? I think we all need some sleep. First, I'll tend to that arm of yours, Ned, and then we'll leave the thing here for a while. Doctor, do you think we dare leave it here quite safely? Well, judging from the way Ned's got it tied up, I think so. Not even a spirit could get out of those ropes. Come on, Ned. I want to take a look at that arm of yours. I'll leave the little statue in here till morning. You know, Doctor, it makes an interesting study, doesn't it? Yes, quite an interesting one. Extraordinary piece of work, one might say. Well, good night, Anne. Come on, Ned, let's get that arm bent. We'll all think more clearly in the morning. We thought we could think more clearly after some sleep. And so the days went by. Ned and Anne and I stayed with that invisible beast constantly. I took test after test. Its heart condition, its breathing, every test I took baffled me completely. 
For this invisible beast reacted to every test exactly as a reptile would react. Or to be more specific, a python. A type of snake which swallows an animal or a man whole and then digests it. As the days passed, we realized that since this was living matter, it must eat. We tempted it with every kind of food imaginable. Tried force feeding it. But the animal never swallowed one bite of food. And then one evening, all of us were collected in the living room when those horrible sounds started. Oh, I tell you, Ned, I, I, it's hungry. And darling, we've tried feeding. But you've got to get it out of this house. I can't take it any longer. That <laughs> famous spirit will evoke the anger of the gods. My advice to you is to let it go. That's not very good advice, Countess. Whatever this is, it would be fairly dangerous news. There anything we can feed it. It must be suffering horribly, Doctor. No food or water for two weeks. Yes, Anne, there is something we can feed it, but unfortunately or fortunately, we can't. What are you talking about, Doctor? Human flesh, Ned. This creature is a man-eater. An invisible man-eater. There's only one thing for us to do. Call the police and the medical society and turn it over to them. There's nothing more we can do. Oh, you'll regret this, Doctor. You'll regret it. You can't evoke the anger of the spirit world without payment in full. And will you make the call? Certainly, Doctor. I'll go with you, darling. Don't tell them anything about it. Just ask them to come over here immediately. And so, gentlemen, Anne called you and brought you over here. I've told you the complete story of the monster from the very beginning. Well, Dr. Hammond, as a member of the police force, I don't mean to doubt you. But where is this invisible monster? It died of hunger ten minutes before you arrived, Sergeant. Well, where is it? On the floor, here, next to my foot. Huh? You can feel it even if you can't see it. Here, put your hand down here. All right. Uh, Sergeant, feel this. It feels like a dead man. Yeah, I tell you, it does. Oh, right. <laughs> sure, Doctor. What kind of a trick are you trying to play on it? Trick, Sergeant? Take my word for it, it's no trick. You felt it yourself. Ah, uh, many people know how to make a mass of material appear invisible. Chemistry can give you a lot of explanations of that kind of a hoax. It's no hoax, gentlemen, on my word of honor. It's no hoax. Ah, uh, tell us a better story. Come on, boys, let's get out of here. We enjoyed your fairy tale, Doctor, but we can't swallow that one but whole. But gentlemen, ask any one of us in this room. I swear to you, it's the truth. Look in the corner at that statuette. That's an exact replica of the invisible beast. Ah, now I get it. You're trying to get some free publicity for the art exhibition at the museum. No, gentlemen. I made that plan to cast myself from the invisible monster. Dr. Hammond's telling you the truth. Oh, yeah? Well, if it's the truth, what was it? What was it? Frankly, gentlemen, I don't know what it was. From the time-worn pages of the past, you have heard, what was it? Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Edward Arnold in Laura Ingalls Wilder's The Long Winter on the Hallmark Playhouse. Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our dramatization of a story by Laura Ingalls Wilder called The Long Winter. Have you ever stepped from a transcontinental train onto the platform of some railway station when the temperature is 40 below? Even a few minutes of it is something you'll never forget if it's a new experience, but perhaps it isn't. 
Perhaps you've been living in a place like that this winter. Well, the characters of our story lived in the Dakotas many years ago. Indeed, they were the kind of people who founded the Dakotas. A fine breed. And to play one of them in our leading role tonight, we have chosen a fine actor, Edward Arnold. And now a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of The Long Winter. May we remind you once again that for every occasion important to your friends and loved ones, there are Hallmark Cards to carry your thoughts across the miles, across the years, or merely across the way. A Hallmark Card says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And that identifying hallmark on the back says that you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse presenting The Long Winter, starring Edward Arnold. Laura made her way toward the old buffalo wallow south of the Ingalls claim shanty. She could hear the cheerful whirring sound of the mowing machine. The car was cutting the thick and tall blue stem grass for hay. The sky was high and quivering with heat over the shimmering Dakota prairie. In early August, it was hard to believe that wind and snow and ice could ever drive the sun out of the sky, wither the grass, and freeze the pond. Sam, whoa, David, whoa, whoa, whoa. I brought you a jug of water, Pa. Sure, thank you, Laura. Fresh from the well. I pumped it myself. Uh, that's my big girl. <sighs> that's fine. That just hits the spot. Phew, the sun almost makes you want to want a bunch of sprouts in your hat to make shade. I don't see how you stand it, Pa. Oh. A man works better when he's warmed up, half pint. Well, I'd better get on the move. Lots of mowing yet to be done before sundown. Oh, Pa, mm. look. There's a haycock you didn't pick up. There is? Where? Over there. In the tall grass. Oh, oh by the pond there? <laughs> well, that isn't a haycock, child. That's a muskrat house. It is? Yeah, let's have a closer look at it, shall we? The horses will stand. Oh, I'd on. like to. Gee, Big, isn't it? Bigger than me. Mm, and bigger around than the two of us could reach. Oh, my, my, we're going to have a hard winter, Laura. How do you know, Pa? Well, the colder the winter will be, the thicker the muskrats build the walls of their houses. You know, I never saw a muskrat's house built heavier than this one. But, Pa, how can the muskrats know about the winter going to be cold? Well, I don't know how they know, but they do. God tells them, I suppose. Then why doesn't God tell us? Well, because we're not animals. We're humans. And we've got to take care of ourselves. But I thought God takes care of us. Oh, he does, my dear. He does. He gives us the sunshine and the rain and the land. But we have to clear the land and plow it. And we have to sow the wheat and tend it. And harvest it and make it into bread for our use. And other men make other things. They work in shops and factories. Some plan and invent, some supervise and manage. And all together, we have built a great nation here in America. But each of us as an individual can do as it pleases. Will they? Can't muskrats do what they please? <laughs> no, my dear. Just look at that muskrat house. Now, muskrats have to build that kind of a house. They always have and they always will. But folks build all kinds of houses. And if their houses don't keep out the weather, it's their lookout. Man's free and independent. Oh. Well, come along now, little half pine. Come along. Your mother will be wondering what's become of you. And i got to make hay while the sun shines. Lots of hay. We're going to have a long winter. <laughs> Doesn't it, Ma? No reason why it should. Do you think it's going to snow, Ma? Well, if it does, it'll be the first time I ever heard of a blizzard in September, Carrie. Pa said it was going to be a hard winter. Not winter yet. Take a look at that pie in the oven, Laura. It's beginning to brown, Ma. Looks good. I've never heard of green pumpkin pie before. Well, the frost killed most of the pumpkins before they could ripen. And we wouldn't do much if we didn't do things that nobody ever heard of before. 
Is Pa going to shoot a wild goose for Sunday dinner, Ma? Yes, John. Maybe you won't get a goose. Maybe you'll get some ducks. Goose or ducks, one or the other. The pond's full of them this time of year. Pa! Hello, Daddy. Oh, come over by the stove, Charles. That wind must be rough. Yeah, it is, it is. I walked into town. Got your piece of salt pork for Sunday. Charles, what's the matter? Hmm? I don't know, my dear, but there's not a goose or a duck on the pond. And it seems that every living thing that runs or swims is hidden away somewhere. Maybe God told them like he did the muskrat. What did God tell the muskrats, Pa? Never mind now, Carrie, child. Supper's ready and your father's hungry, no doubt. Uh, Caroline, we're moving to town as soon as we can. Why? I've, sure. I've got to haul the hay into town first for the horses of the car and the heifer. If I hurry, I can haul one more load in before dark. Oh, goodness, you just came in. But there's no time to lose, my dear. This house is nothing but a claim shanty. It doesn't keep out the cold. Our store building in town is good and tight and warm, and the stable is, too. And as long as the trains keep running, we'll be a whole lot safer there. Oh, now, Charles, you're not going to haul a load of hay before supper. <laughs> oh, supper will wait, Caroline, but I'm afraid the weather won't. <laughs> it is. Like a cloud, almost. Dropping down. Yes, the snow is beautiful, all right, but just the same. I'm glad it didn't come till we got moved into town. But there's no telling when I can get the rest of the hay hauled in. Well, let's see now. Your father and I'll have the room at the head of the stairs. You girls can have the front room. I wish we had a place like this out in the claim. Well, you could be glad we have it in town, where a train comes every day with coal and supplies. <laughs> is to be in town. We haven't been out of the house hardly in a month. Now, Laura. Are you Jiminy Crickets? Oh, I'm oh, must be 40 below or better out there. <laughs> pa, your whiskers are all white, so you look like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I had to dig my way into the stable again. The snow's piled up high in the door since noon. Here, Laura, take the pail, will you? Oh, sir. I'm afraid there isn't much milk in what there is froze solid before I get it, could get it in the house. Well, let's be thankful for the little there is. There'll be less before there's more. <laughs> Don't look too bright, my dear. There's no coal left at the lumber yard. Folks burn so much in this cold weather, and old, old Eli didn't have much on hand. What are we going to do, Charlie? Oh, we're lucky, Caroline. Why? Because because we got lots of hay, and we'll burn that. Burn hay in the cook stove? Pal? Sure. Why not? How, Paul? Well, we'll twist it. Uh, we'll twist the hay into sticks. It's not easy, I can tell you. But it'll help out till the trains get through. Come on, Laura, I'll show you. Well, there isn't a drop of kerosene in town. The Loftus hasn't got a bit of meat or flour left in the store. A month or a while will let me have his his last bucket full of wheat, though. Well, we'll just have to make that do. Laura, child, fetch in a couple of handfuls of beans. Fill a few left in the barrel. And five potatoes. Plenty of them, thank goodness. All right, Ma. You know, I wish there was a grist mill in town. Uh, you you can't just boil the wheat, can you, dear? Oh, well, but, Charles, we have got a grist mill. We oh, have? Yes? Sure. Hand me that old coffee grinder. We'll get along until the train gets through. Oh, my dear. <laughs> You're wonderful. <laughs> yes, we'll get along. Together, I know we will. Oh, did you find out 
about the train? Is it coming through tomorrow? Uh, there'll be no train till spring. <laughs> Not till the warm winds come. Till the Chinook starts blowing. Charles. As fast as they clear the track into the, 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 the Tracy City cut, it fills in again. The crew has given up. Oh, but they can't do that. Well, we'll starve. A breeze to this. Now, now, Caroline. We've been through harder times than this together. We've always made out. Like you've always said, it takes courage to open up a new country. And faith in the Lord. You should carry. Hand me my fiddle there. Here you are, Pa. Now, now then, uh, I want you to sing, all of you. Sing like you've never sung before. We want the Lord to know that the Ingalls have courage and faith. The Lord our rock in him we hide. Shelter in the time of storm. Secure wherever may be tied. A shelter in the time of just a moment, we'll return to the second act of The Long Winter, starring Edward Arnold. Around my house these last few weeks, I've heard a lot of talk about purple. It seems that's one of the big colors of fashion this spring, and all the ladies are planning on a hat of either lilac, orchid, or violet, or maybe all three. Anyway, when I went down to select my Easter cards, knowing that Hallmark cards always reflect the latest fashions, I fully expected to see purple bunnies. So I was really pleased when I found whole counters of beautiful Hallmark Easter cards in every color imaginable. I welcomed the delicate spring sky blues and pinks of the Easter bunny's ears, the creamy whites and waxy greens of the gardenias as you welcome the first sunny day of spring. And I know that when my wife receives the pink and white Easter card I selected for her, it will make her eyes all the brighter under her new purple hat because the words inside the card say something extra special. And that Hallmark in the back means something, too. To her, just as to your family and friends, that hallmark on the back of Easter cards, as it does on other cards you send, means you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of The Long Winter, starring Edward Arnold. Pioneers who settled our Midwestern prairies were tough. They were determined, and they had faith. Charles Ingalls and his family were of this breed and blood, but even they found the Dakotan winter a challenge, the long winter that seemed as if it would never end. There's an extra potato, Charles. They're not big ones, but you must keep up your strength. But, Caroline, I've already had mine. Well, is it to save it, then? We don't want it, do we, girls? Oh, no, thank no, you, Ma. Ma. Truly, I don't want it. Oh, sure. Well, in that case, uh, well, how's the potato barrel holding out? Oh, there must be almost a bushel there. But the wheat's almost all gone, isn't it? Oh, we'll manage somehow. Already it's the end of January, then February is a short month. And March will be spring. Yeah, there's nothing like pork grease to bring out the flavor in a potato. I'm afraid that's the last of the salt pork, Charles. And you know, Caroline, Loftus was telling me he heard there's a settler 18 or 20 miles south or southeast of here raised 300 bushels of wheat last summer. And he's wintering in his claim shanty. Oh, Charles, you're not going to... Well, Loftus says he'd buy the wheat if somebody could go after it. He's the only man in town who's got the money to pay for it. I hope you're not thinking of starting out on such a wild goose chase. Well, a man might do it. With a couple of days of clear weather and a snowfall to hold up the sled? No. Oh, no, Charles, no. A blizzard might come up any time. And there are no roads, no marks of any kind. Mm, well. Charles, where are you going? Oh, I'm going over to Loftus' store. The Wilder brothers will probably be there and maybe some of the others. I won't be long. Blizzard is letting 
up some. Might be clear tomorrow. Hey, Loftus, are you still willing to put up the money for that settler's wheat? I said I would, didn't I? Don't know who's to go after it, though. I will. What? Well, there's folks starving in this town, Almanzo. Now, at 40 miles. We haven't had more than one clear day at a time since this thing started. Hey, you'd be lucky to make it in a day. Well, you're a storekeeper, Royal. A farmer has to take chances, and I'm a farmer. There's no telling when this weather will let up and folks in this town have to eat in the meantime. Ingalls is right, Royal. I'm going with him. All right, now, wait a minute, Elmo. Need time. Count out your money, Loftus. Got it right here. Three hundred dollars. I'll pay up to a dollar and a half a bushel. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to pay whatever we can get the wheat for. We appreciate your town spirit, though, Loftus. Now, we'll get as much as we can for as little as we can. <laughs> if you can get through. And if you can find a settler. And if he's got the wheat, and if he'll sell. We'll take that chance. Uh, there'll be no charge for hauling. Am I right, Almanzo? Right. When do we leave, Engel? Just before sunup, as the weather clears. It's starting to snow again, Ma. Not the first time it snowed this winter. But Pa isn't back. Standing by the window won't bring him back, child. And there's still an hour or so before dark. What if he doesn't make it, Ma? Now, now, girl, girl. You wouldn't want your pa to see you like this, would you? You'll be all right now. I know it. But you can't even see the stores across the street, Ma. And out on the prairie. We won't talk about it anymore. Come on, girl. Now, if you'll sit by the stove here, I'll, I'll read you some verses. That'll help pass the time till Pa gets back. That's it. Smile. Now, then, let's see. Oh, here's one. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of his home. When I can read my title clear to mansions in the sky, I'll bid farewell to every fear. And wipe my weeping eyes. <laughs> Light's getting so poor, I can't see to read anymore. <laughs> Potatoes must be about done anyway. Well, we'll set the table, girls. Father will be hungry when he gets back. He's frozen, I'll bet. Maybe I'd better get some more hay sticks for the fire. Shall I, Ma? Yes, as long as you don't have to twist any more of them. Oh, no. Pa twisted a lot of them last night, remember? Yes. yes. Ma! Bushels at a dollar twenty-five a bushel. Loftus, some of the men are unloading it now. Everybody's anxious to buy. It. Oh, a dollar twenty-five a bushel. I guess two bushels will be about all we can afford. Oh, but that'll see us through, though, Caroline. I'll go get it the first thing in the morning. <laughs> uh, thanks to Loftus, nobody will have to starve around here now, even if the trains don't come through till next yeah. May. Thanks to you and Almanzo Wilder too. Who do you suppose that is? You stay by the fire there. I'll see. Good evening, Miss Ingalls. Your husband here? Well, yes, he's just... What is it, Fuller? Hello, Ingalls. Uh-huh. Did you charge Loftus anything for hauling that wheat? Almanzo Wilder says he didn't. No, I didn't charge him a cent. Why? Well, Loftus is charging $3 a bushel for that wheat. He what? How much wheat do you got left, Ingalls? Caroline. Laura ground up the last of us this morning. Uh, those two loaves of bread is all there is. Come on, Fuller. You get the Wilder boys. We'll have a talk with Loftus right now. Let me handle this. Well, Loftus, 
Three dollars a bushel is what I said. My wheat, isn't it? I paid good, hard money for it. Mm, you paid a dollar and a quarter a bushel. That's my business. Yeah, we show you whose business it is. Look, you can so much as touch my property, and I'll have the law on you. And wheat's mine. And I got a right to charge any price I wanted for it. That's right, Loftus, you have. This is a free country, and every man's got a right to do as he pleases with his own property. But remember, Alonzo, and I didn't charge you a cent for hauling that wheat. Well, why didn't you? I stood ready to pay any reasonable charge for hauling. But three dollars a bushel. Engels and I didn't make that trip to skin a profit off folks that are hungry. Alonzo is right, Loftus. You know, there's not enough money in the mint to pay for that trip. We didn't make it for you. We made it for my wife and our two little girls and for all the other folks in this town who need that wheat to keep alive. Look at it this way, Loftus. We're all in this thing together. We've all got the same purpose. There's lots of land here for everybody. The soil is rich, we know that. But what chance could one have man have alone in a Dakota prairie? Against the wind, the snow, the rain, and the drought? Together we can lick it. And we are licking it, Loftus. We're building wealth and strength here. Not for ourselves, but for all America. So that those who come after us will have richer lives. More abundance, greater security. Good heavens, Loftus, you're one of us. You're not a selfish man. You're a free, independent American. Living in a great democracy. Working in a great cause. Not for yourself alone, but for all men. I can't put it any plainer, Loftus. Or more honestly. You, uh... You can buy the wheat for just what it cost me, dollar twenty-five bushel. Gary, are you awake, Gary? Yes. I have been. The snow is melting on the roof. Look, it's running down in power. What does it mean, Laura? The Chinook is blowing. Come on. Come on. Laura, the Chinook is blowing. The Chinook is blowing. Yes, I know, girls. I know. Spring has come at last. And huh? breakfast is all ready. You can sit down just the way you are. In our 90s, Ma? Sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> well, girls, we beat old winter at last, didn't we? Here it is spring, and none of us lost or starved or frozen. Just potatoes and bread, Charles. Not much to celebrate, huh? Oh, it'll taste different this morning because we know that the trains will be coming through soon. How you ever manage with so little, my dear, I'll never know. You're a real wonder, girl. And I've got a lot to be thankful for. I'll bet the muskrats are glad the winter's over, too. Will God tell the muskrats that spring is here, Paul? Oh, I bet he whispered in their little ears better than a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> we thank thee, dear Lord, for all the many blessings received at thy hands, for the land you have given us to work, and for the happiness we enjoy as a family. Bless our nation. Our home and our life, and this food to our use. We ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hilton will return in a moment. Uh, I guess it had to happen, but it still came as something of a shock when I answered the phone just before broadcast time. The voice at the other end said, uh, don't you Hallmark folks make a card to send to the income tax man? Well, about the nearest I could come to answering that request with its association to greenbacks was to suggest taking a look at the bright greens decorating the gay Hallmark St. Patrick's Day cards and leave it to the charm of the Irish to cast away the worries and cares of this week in March. You'll find these eye-twinkling Irish cards at the store where you buy Hallmark cards. And while you're there, why not select those Easter cards you want to send? They are lovely. 
And you can find one that helps you say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. See these and all the other Hallmark cards when you want to remember your friends or share a smile with them. On special days or any days, a Hallmark card is warmly received. For remember, that Hallmark on the back tells in its own way, you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Whenever your name appears in the cast, Eddie, the audience can always expect a great performance, and tonight was no exception. Thanks for being with us. Well, it's always great to appear on the Hallmark Playhouse, Jimmy, and I enjoyed it very much tonight. And, Eddie, we're all aware of your acting ability, but probably very few of our listeners know that you're a pretty fine cook, too. <laughs> Haven't you got some cooking hints to pass on to our audience? Well, as you know, Jimmy, I, I do like to cook exciting and different dishes, so I always begin with a good recipe. I use the best of ingredients and then see to it that I put in the right thing at the right time, <laughs> but oh, wait a minute. That sounds like the recipe the Hallmark folks use when they make their Hallmark cards. The right words at the right time and the whole served in beautiful surroundings. I guess that's a recipe for many of the things that give us pleasure. <laughs> it surely is. And speaking of pleasures, I think we have a special treat in store for our listeners next Thursday night, Eddie. On Hallmark Playhouse, that's not unusual, Jimmy. And what have you planned for next week? Our story will be John Sedge's The Long Love, a very warm portrait of an American marriage and the problems encountered. And for our star, we have that popular young actor, Van Johnson. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Axel Grunberg. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Edward Arnold will soon be seen in the Paramount picture Dear Brett. The role of Caroline tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle. Anne Whitfield was Laura. Norma Jean Nilsson was Carrie. Also in our cast were Ted Osborne, Lamont Johnson, Sam Edwards, and Parley Bear. This is Frank Gross saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Van Johnson in John Sedge's The Long Love. And the week following, Margaret Irwin's Elizabeth, Captive Princess, starring Anne Baxter. And in the weeks to follow, Francis Parkinson Kai's Joy Street on the Hallmark Playhouse. again the immortal tale Frankenstein. The wind howling outside my lonely home is my only companion. All else is quiet here. As I sit by my window in the parlor, writing this document for the scientific world. 
Be warned, you doctors and scientists who come after me. Be warned that man must not experiment with the secrets of life. My experiences started in the University of Manchester, where I was studying natural history. It was after class, May 22nd, 1818, that Professor Waldman, my close dear friend Henry Clerval, and myself were in the laboratory of the university. Victor Frankenstein, your persistence amazes me. Someday I shall sit at your feet and allow you to teach me. Thank you, Professor Warman. But the whole subject of the structure of man has always been too clouded in mysticism. Well, frankly, Victor, I prefer mysticism. Well, that's because you're a mystic, Henry. Why, Henry is no more a mystic than I am. He just loves to avoid arduous work. Oh, translating that means I'm lazy, eh, Professor? Well, if you prefer to put it that way, I rather think of you as a student whose nervous structure does not take kindly to natural history. <laughs> the professor is kinder to you than you are to yourself, Henry. Well, if I worked as hard as you do, Victor, I should probably wear that same gaunt, sleepless look that you carry about. Well, my experiment will be finished tonight. And then I'll manage the eight hours sleep that other men manage. The secret experiment will be finished tonight, huh? Well, then, will you tell us just exactly what you're doing in the basement at home? I'll tell the entire world. As a matter of fact, I, I stayed after class this afternoon, Professor Waldman, to ask you to join me this evening in the basement of our place to watch the completion of my work. Oh, well, how about me? I don't think I dare invite more than one, Henry. And the professor is more interested in this type of procedure than, than you are. I shall be delighted, Victor. Just the best friend who never knows what's going on in his own home, that's all. It's not that, Henry. But I thought you'd entertain Elizabeth for me, while the professor and I were at work. Entertaining Elizabeth would be a delightful favor, old boy. You know, I think you trust me too much with her. Have you ever met Victor's fiance, Professor Waldman? She's one of the most charming... Yes... Elizabeth was one of the most charming, beautiful women I'd ever known. I had been in love with her from childhood. But even my love for Elizabeth couldn't dim my passionate zeal for the work I was doing. It was eight o'clock that evening. Henry, Elizabeth, and I were seated in the parlor. Elizabeth was saying... I'd be so glad, Victor, darling, when all this is over. If you only knew how tired you look. The minute my work is done, successfully or unsuccessfully, I promise you, Elizabeth... We'll be married and, and off to Switzerland before Henry has time to lock up this place. But first, we find out about the secret in the basement. Henry is being eaten up by curiosity. I don't blame him. I'm suffering pangs of what's it all about, too. Well, you'll both know soon. I wonder where Professor Warman is. He's late. He'll be here soon, Victor. Stop pacing the floor, sweetheart. I think I'll start my work downstairs. Send the professor down when he arrives, will you, darling? We'll come down ourselves and take a look around. Or will I turn into a pillar of salt for peeking? Nobody ever turned into a pillar of salt for peeking, Beth. It was for looking back. Oh, nothing like a good practical working knowledge of the Bible for scientific experiments. <laughs> Starts the night off right. Yes, I thought jokingly of that paragraph from the Bible then. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. But what about a man who looks back? There is no ready reference for him or for me. I went downstairs to my laboratory at a little past eight, opened the door, and started to tinker around to pass the time more quickly. My every sense was alive, taut, waiting, with the sense of what was to come. I heard a knock on the side door, which led me from my laboratory directly into the forest, which bordered Manchester. I looked out and... Good evening, Victor. Oh, did Elizabeth tell you to come down this way, Professor? No, I found the entrance to your laboratory quite by myself. I help you with your coat, sir? No, no, no. You proceed with your work. Nothing like trivialities to annoy a scientist at work. <clears throat> there we are. Well, follow me, Professor, into the back room, and you'll see for yourself what this is all about. Well, I feel that I'm in for a most exhilarating evening. I wish I had more students fashioned in your mold, Victor. Well, Professor, here is my... Why, what's this? A full-sized replica of a man. Yes. Only he isn't full-sized. He's fashioned on a grander scale. I should say this creature standing up would be approximately eight feet, two inches tall. Well, you should have been an artist, Victor. He's a perfect reproduction. What did you make him out of? Wood? Clay? Animal flesh. Flesh? Feel him. Oh, feels like the body of a dead man. Or the body of a man who hasn't as yet been brought to life. This body is complete in every detail. Heart, lungs, teeth. 
even the fine nervous system. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, interesting. How about the brain cells? Yes, adult brain cells. I think he's quite handsome, don't you? Well, each man to his own taste. He's the best reproduction of a man I've ever seen, but actually his face is hideous. As a plastic surgeon, my dear Victor, I'm afraid I can't give you much credit. Well, what do you intend to do with this Hulk? You see this fluid here in the test tube? Yes. I fill the hypodermic needle with it. And now, now I'm going to inject the full eight ounces into the vein, directly above his heart. But why? Watch. You see, Professor, quite by accident, I stumbled on the secret of life. I've been bringing small, one-cell creatures to life for quite some time. The secret of life? Within 30 seconds, after this injection, this creature will live. You're trying to play God, Victor. It's heresy. It's science. I'm making a new race, by far finer than the present one. Larger in structure, stronger, heavier, healthier. A race able to live on nuts and berries with a greater capacity for feeling. Victor, for the love of heaven, don't go through with this experiment. No man living has the right to tamper with the secret of life. You've created a monster on that floor. You've no idea what will happen if you go through with this. Watch, Professor. The injection. I only hope and pray this is a failure. It can't be. His eyes moved. Watch him, Professor. He's like a baby, first realizing life. His hands touch the floor. His eyes are trying to focus on the world around him. He's hideous. Yes, he's hideous. I made the skin too much like parchment, I'm afraid. Victor, get rid of that monster. Uh, he's trying uh, to stand up. Uh, is that mind which you've created as a twisted one? Have you any idea what kind of horror you've let loose in England? As a humanitarian, I feel it my Christian duty to do this now. Put that knife down, Professor. No, uh, I can't let... Ooh. Uh, oh, uh, he's got me in the clutch of his hand. Uh, Command him to stop this. Victor. Uh, stop fighting him, uh, Professor. He's frightened. Uh, he has the same reaction as a child. Uh, grabs and won't let loose. Let me go, monster. Uh, no. Stop. Don't go out that door. Uh, Put the Professor down. Don't go out that door. Monster left my laboratory through the side entrance into the forest, carrying the incredibly mangled body of the professor with him. I rushed out of my laboratory after him, but the creature was faster than I, and he disappeared from view. I returned to my laboratory and destroyed all evidence of the creature's manufacture. I burned the blueprints from which I had made his body. Then, carefully... I locked my laboratory and went upstairs to join Henry Clerval and Elizabeth. I must have looked wild-eyed as I entered the room. <laughs> Henry, that's most amusing. You tell the best anecdotes in all of England. Oh, you flatter me, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, Victor, you're through sooner than we expected. Uh, Darling, what's the matter? Didn't the professor show up? Nothing's the matter. My experiment was... was a failure. Oh. But the professor... He never showed up. Beth... Henry, I, I want to go away. Of course, darling, we will, as soon as Henry can get the house locked up. Uh, I don't want to wait. I want to leave at once, tonight, please, tonight, Beth. We can get married before we cross the channel and, and then go to Switzerland. But it's almost midnight now, darling. What's the difference? Please, Beth, if you love me. But why tonight, Victor? Henry, you've no idea what I've been through. I have to get away at once. Of course, darling, if you insist. Anything you want. And we'll be married before daylight. Darling, darling, Beth. I know a little minister whom we can awake. And so Beth and I were married that evening in a little chapel on the coast. Then the three of us fled to Bern, Switzerland. I refused to have anything to do with the civilized world. No newspapers, no word of home. Just the peace and quiet of the Swiss mountains. Henry and Elizabeth both tried to learn of the events which had occurred in my laboratory that evening. But I never broke my silence on that subject. After the first tries, they refrained from asking me about it again. It was in the middle of the fourth month of our visit when Henry and I were sitting on the terrace of the little house in the mountain. Beth was out picking berries when Henry suddenly... Victor. 
I'm your closest friend. I've tried to keep silent about... Well, Richard, the day after we left England, I bought a newspaper. Did you, Henry? Yes. I saw this clipping on the front page. I couldn't very well miss it. Well, what clipping? This one. The horribly mangled remains of Professor Waldman was found on Beekman Hill. The identity of the unknown murderer is being sought by Scotland Yard. Poor Professor Waldman. I'd no idea. Hadn't you? No. What are you trying to say to me, Henry? You're leaving England so suddenly that very night. Your fear of being discovered, the secret experiment. Well, it, it all seemed to add up to some some kind of strange connection with this clipping. Now, if you're in trouble, Victor, you can depend on me. I'll stay by your side. I'm not in trouble. I'm just tired, terribly tired. And you know nothing of the professor? Absolutely nothing. He didn't come to our chateau that evening. I told you he didn't then. Stop questioning me. Victor! We're out here, Bev. Oh, I just had a horrible experience. Oh, darling, I'm, I'm so glad to see you, honey. You're pale, Bev. Sit down right here next to me. Oh, what happened, Bev? Well, I was I was walking in the woods not far from here. When I looked up and saw... Well, I saw a man. Sort of a man standing over me. Well, men aren't so bad. That is, if you happen to know the right ones. And you do. I, I'm not joshing, Henry. He wasn't exactly a man. He... He was twice the height of anyone I've ever seen. And his skin looked like dried parchment. It's... It's incredible, but... I think I've seen a monster. Monster? Yes, I... I ran away. He didn't follow me. He just... Just stared after me. Watching me. You do believe me, don't you? A monster stared after you? Look, look. Henry. Victor. Through the trees right out there. Look. There he is again. Yes, the monster stood there, silhouetted against the trees. The monster which I had created, standing like an evil blot of flesh and bone, moved in the darkening twilight, and then suddenly, phantom like, it disappeared. Beth and Henry both watched me as I started from the piazza after the disappearing creature in the backwoods. As I drew near to the heavily wooded section, giant footprints in the soft mud about me showed the path ahead. The sun was sinking in the west, and the last orange pinpoints of light needled my flesh until every sense within me was tingling with the expectations of seeing my living horror. Then I realized I was unarmed. Every crooked tree, each twisted branch which obstructed my path, appeared to be his form. I heard the crackling of a branch and the moving of a form on the velvet moss. I thought you'd come, Creator. You. Are you frightened, Creator? You dare talk to me. Please, don't turn away from me. Please. Let me go. I mean no harm to you. Listen to me, Victor Frankenstein. You must listen to me. You created me. You owe me that much. I owe you nothing, murderer. Why am I a murderer? Because... You created a form so horrible, a face so distorted that no man can look upon me and call me friend. I'm an outcast. You can save me. Let me go. Not until you hear my story. Sit down, creator. My arm! Let me go! I wandered through the streets of London that first day. Children screamed in the streets. People flocked together trying to kill me. And I was lonely and hungry. How did you follow me here? Not so long ago, I returned to my birthplace. 
the laboratory, broke in and discovered your identity. But first, I fled to Scotland and lived outside of a cottage. That's how I learned to speak. An old blind man was teaching a young French girl to speak English. I listened to the lessons from the open windows. Now, what do you expect of me? A companion. A woman of the same species with my defects. One who will be my friend. This, this being, you must create. No, I'll not do it. You must. Every man's entitled to a wife. No. You must. If you create her for me, I'll take her with me into the far wastes, and no one will ever see either of us again, ever. How will you live? On fruits and berries. We'll manage together. Please, you can't deny me this. A maid. A monster's maid. You will? You will. I swear, I'll never harm another human. Never, Creator, if you'll only grant me just one companion. And if I refuse? If you refuse, even a brain that you have made, Creator, might become twisted and distorted. And so that night in the forest, I made a devil's bargain. I bargained to create a monster's mate, perhaps another murderer. How could I know? The monster swore to live in the forest and wait. Wait a year or two years if necessary. And upon completion of my work, he would take his companion away. But if I broke my promise, he swore revenge. And so I started work. I searched Paris for the necessary equipment. Built a shack in the woods about a mile away from our chalet. Three months I worked, three solid months, shaping her who was to be his mate. And then one night, it was windy outside. I thought the wind had blown the door open when... Victor! Victor, I'm sorry, I had to disturb you. Is it Beth? No, not Beth. She's fine and sends her love. It's the townspeople. Your activities have stirred up a lot of curiosity. Oh, the fool! Well, I can't blame them, especially after the rumors which have been going around. Rumors that the... Victor, you know the monster in these forests. You've known of him all along. People have seen him and connect him with you. Mothers in the village are frightened of their children. I know nothing. Look, I'm only trying to help you. I know nothing, I tell you. But the men have banded together. They're going to make a raid on you here. To burn your laboratory down. And to find the monster who lives in these woods. They can't. They mustn't. Oh, what? devil's work are you carrying on, man? I'm trying to help you. Oh, Victor, will you please let your friends be your friends? Henry, go back to Beth and leave me alone. Beth is safe at home. You're in danger and I won't leave your side this night, my friend. Then be prepared. Prepared for what? You've guessed many of the reasons for my secrecy. Then there is a monster. At school, I stumbled on the secret of life. I was trying to create a superior race. I was a fool, and I created him instead. And he does live? Yes, he lives. Professor Waldman. What happened to Professor Waldman? The night I created the monster, Waldman became frightened. He screamed, attempted to kill the creature. The creature, like a child, warded him off and, and then tore him to pieces in front of me. I couldn't stop him. The monster had killed before it had really begun to live. Then what? The monster left the basement through the side entrance, carrying the professor's corpse... I had no choice. I had to leave the country. Oh, what are you doing with that creature now? Fulfilling a promise. Follow me into my cabin and I'll show you. How soon do you think the townsfolk will be here? Oh, within two hours or so. They're meeting in the square in town. Come in. What? A woman. Yes, a woman. The monster's mate, his friend. I promised him a friend. And in return, he swears to hide himself forever from the world. A, a devil's bargain, Victor. A bargain I must keep for all our sakes. But the monster proved himself a murderer time and time again. Why, in London, after the death of Professor Waldman... Time and time again. But how do you know that the mate won't be even more vicious than he? 
You let loose an avalanche of hatred. Oh, destroy her before you bring her to life. Yes, avalanche of hatred. Look, you've no time to waste. Set fire to this cabin quickly, Victor. Set fire to the cabin and come away. But man alive, you can't go through with this thing. But the promise. It's a promise to a fiend. He'll be your death and ours, Victor. Oh, hurry, man, hurry, if you've any love for Beth. I've been insane with grief and fear for Beth and you. Go back to Beth, Henry, at, at once and wait for me. And you? I, I'll set fire to the cabin as soon as I destroy my books. I, I'll join you later. Oh, hurry, friend. We'll meet you home as soon as you can make it. For one full hour, I worked feverishly. I soaked the shack in oil, and then taking the taper from the vase, I, I lit the fire. The fire started quickly. I placed my books in the very center of the room, and then opened the door of my shack. The experiment was at an end, and I felt free. The monster's mate would never live. I walked out, and then I saw him. His face contorted with rage. Ah! My wife! My only dead dad of friends! Ah! My only dead! I knew then what was in his mind as he raced through the forest in front of me. The blazing shack was a beacon of light, and I saw his huge, misshapen form outdistance me, far outdistance me. He was faster than I, taller than I, and covered more territory. Racing, running blindly through the forest, I reached my home. The door of my home was flung open. Henry, mutilated and torn, stumbled blindly toward me. Victor, the monster. Henry, Henry, what? I, I tried to, Victor, I... Henry, you. Beth, Beth's alone. Upstairs. Beth! Beth, I'm coming, darling, I'm coming. I'm coming upstairs. <laughs> Outside my window is my only companion. All else is quiet as I sit by my window, writing this document. I am dying of loneliness and fear, shunned by the world, hated by everyone. I know I am waiting only for the monster's return, and he, having eluded the world, will return when I've suffered my full share of misery. As he has suffered his. From the time worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story Frankenstein. Bellkeeper, hold the bell. heard another immortal tale in The Weird Circle. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Be here in this lonely cave by the restless sea once again next time for another immortal tale in The Weird Circle.
the Graymore Friars Monastery is located on Atoman Mountain near Garrison, New York. Adjacent to this famous monastery, one sees St. Christopher's Inn. Homeless men from all walks of life come to this famous inn. These men are fed and sheltered by the Graymore Friars, and no distinction is ever made of race, creed, or color. invited to listen to the second chapter of the dramatized story, The Life of Christ, brought to you transcribed each week by the Graymore Friars, who offer this new series in devout belief that the retelling of his tragedy and triumph will reawaken and strengthen your faith in and love of Christ. Now, chapter two, The Temptation in the desert. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him only. Ye shall not go after the strange gods of other nations, lest at any time the wrath of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee. Ye shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Now when Jesus came up from the Jordan, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit led him to seek the solitude of the wilderness where he remained for forty days and nights alone, except for the beasts and birds. He fasted and prayed, and no man knew who he was. But there was another who was stirred by doubt and uncertainty, and had to make sure of Jesus' identity. And this one waited until the fast was ended. He stood at the edge of the wilderness and watched Jesus approach. And he was thinking, I must know who he is. But more, I must find out if he knows who he is. If he's the one, he'll give a sign, an unmistakable sign. A simple act will prove everything. And the issue between us will be joined at the very start. Ah, but here he comes. Wait. Jesus of Nazareth? Oh, you don't know me, but I know something about you. I observed you when you were baptized by John at the Jordan. I waited for you to come from the wilderness. A bit odd you spent the same time alone as did Moses on the mountain. After forty days, you must be hungry. There's nothing to eat. That is, unless you care to try these stones. Look, they are the size and shape of a loaf of bread. Well, is it not written that when the Hebrews were tested in the wilderness... Their prophet asked for bread, and it was rained from heaven. Jesus, if thou art the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. It is written, Not by bread alone does man live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Got to know for sure who he is. 
If I can only get him to some high place where crowds of people can look at him, perhaps he'll reveal himself. Yes, he... I have it. I'll take him to the highest point in Jerusalem on a busy day. I'll have a much better chance there. And then the tempter took Jesus into the holy city and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple. And the tempter turned to Jesus. If thou art the Son of God, throw thyself down. For is it not written, He will give his angels charge concerning thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. It is written further, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Twice the tempter failed in his efforts, but he would come again to Jesus in the desert for the final throw of the dice. In the meantime, the priests, aroused by the stories about John the Baptist and by the letter from Pilate to Caiaphas, had sent representatives to the ford at the Jordan to examine him. They came down on him. Carefully they watched and listened, and at last put the question uppermost in the minds of all. I baptize you in water unto penance, but he that shall come after me shall... Stop! Stop a moment. I want to ask you a question. What would you ask of me? Who art thou? I am not the Christ. What then? Art thou Elias? I am not. You then know Moses spoke of a prophet whom the Lord God would rise up from the midst of Moses' brethren. And this prophet would be like unto God, and unto him all would listen. Art thou the prophet? No. Who art thou, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? I am the voice of one crying in the desert, Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, Why then dost thou baptize, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, nor the prophet? I baptize with water. For in the midst of you there has stood one whom you do not know. He it is who is to come after me, who has been set above me. The strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to loose. Come, let us report this to the high priest. Listen to this, Claudia. Caiaphas, the old fox, writes... Having sent a delegation to question John the Baptist, we are of the opinion he has committed no offense under our law which would justify bringing him to trial. However, and listen to this, at the same time we realize that the civil power may take a wider view of the consequences which might follow an extension of his teaching. <laughs> I see nothing wrong with that, Pilot. Don't you see the game? No. John can easily become embarrassing to the Sanhedrin. And Caiaphas knows it. Then why doesn't he do something? That's the point. He wants the odium for his arrest to fall on me. I'm caught. I don't know which is the more dangerous, to leave him alone or to arrest him. But didn't the letter from your spy say John the Baptist was preaching humility? Why, you chuckled over that. You told me the priests wouldn't take well to that from a ragged fanatic. Ah, uh, you have a point, Claudia. I think I'll wait. This fellow will prove more embarrassing to the Jews than to me. Again, your spy reported John did not claim to be the one awaited, only his messenger. I don't take too much stock in that. It might be a clever dodge to forestall arrest 
and to build up expectation in the minds of the people. At Great Jupiter. What now? I just thought of something. The high priest may have planted that fellow there at the Jordan himself. But why? To cause trouble, of course. That's it. They examine him, find nothing illegal, and practically invite me to take action. It's a trap. One I'll not fall into. That's all very well for you and the high priest to outmaneuver each other. But what do you suppose the ordinary people are thinking? Oh, they don't count here. The priests and their scribes tell them what they can think and what they can believe. I'm not so sure. Everywhere I go, in the streets, in the shops, people are talking about the man at the Jordan. There's a new light in their eyes, a new note in their voices. They seem to expect a great deal to come from John. Pilate, believe me, a vast change has come upon these people since we first arrived. Mm. I sense it, too. But all I can do is wait. I can't move until I'm sure who John the Baptist is. How do you expect to find out? He's promised someone to come after him more powerful. If I know agitators, they never like to surrender power once they grasp it. If John gives way to another, then I'll believe him. Yes, at best. If he's ambitious, you may be sure he's not going to step aside. And if he's not ambitious and is speaking the truth? Then neither I nor the priest can do much to stop the coming of the one they expect. But and take care of him after he arrives, if he arrives. And now the tempter came again to Jesus. He was planning the means by which he would force a declaration. I'll throw off the pretense, meet him face to face, and propose an outright bargain. I'll not say if you're the son of God. I'll act as if I knew for sure he is. Then we'll know where we stand, whether it'll be peace or war between us. Again the devil took him up into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and the glory of them. Look upon me, Jesus. Ah, you do know who I am. Well now, look out upon the world, not only to the far horizon, but beyond. See the vistas opening. The whole world's at our feet. Cities bursting with people. Ships carrying riches from all parts of the earth. Fields of grain. Mountains covered with forests. The whole world, which is now and is to be. To thee will I give all this power and their glory. For to me they have been delivered, and to whomever I will, I give them. Therefore, if thou wilt worship before me, the whole shall be thine. Be gone, Satan, for it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou worship, and him only shalt thou serve. And Satan was worsted, but perhaps had learned that which he wanted to know. He left Jesus for a while, and the angels came and ministered to Jesus. Meanwhile, the crowds waited at the Jordan, where John was preaching and baptizing. And the time was about two months since the baptism of Jesus, when one day John looked up and saw a man walking on the opposite bank. Behold, the Lamb of God. Look, that man across the river. It's the carpenter of Nazareth. 
Master, why do you speak thus? Behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me there comes one who has been set above me because he was before me, and I did not know him. But that he may be known to Israel, for this reason have I come baptizing with water. I see only the carpenter. I beheld the Spirit descending as a dove from heaven, and he abode upon him. And I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He upon whom thou wilt see the Spirit descending and abiding, he it is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. I'm sure that was the carpenter from Nazareth. But he didn't even glance in our direction. Now he's around the bend. And Jesus, the Son of God, walked alone on the other side of the Jordan. John had pointed him out with the words of the prophet, but none had understood. But next day, as his followers rested, Jesus came again walking slowly along the river bank. And again, John noticed him first and spoke. Behold, the Lamb of God. And the memory of the words from the scripture came back to Andrew. Again the master calls the carpenter of Nazareth, Lamb of God. Can it be that he is the one? The one spoken of by Isaiah? And the words from the scriptures came back to him. Despised and the most abject of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with infirmity. And his look was, as it were, hidden and despised, whereupon we esteemed him not. He was offered because it was his own will, and he opened not his mouth. He shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter, and shall be dumb as a lamb before his shearer. I shall follow that man. And the man who spoke was Andrew. With Andrew came one companion, and they followed Jesus until they caught up with him. He heard them coming and turned and waited. What is it you seek? Rabbi, where dwellest thou? Come and see. Andrew and his companion trusted Jesus, and without a word they went with him and saw where he lived and stayed with him that day. But of the many who listened to John, only these two followed Jesus at this time. For many clung to the belief that John was not the messenger, but the one he was sent to announce. Pilate, when we come to Jerusalem, why don't we stay in the palace Herod built? We haven't the money to furnish another palace for one reason. But this, this Antonia, as you call it... It's like a citadel. It is a citadel. That's another reason for using it. We're not welcome in Jerusalem. This is the heart of Jewry. In that temple across the way is what they call their Holy of Holies. Oh, the empty room where they have their invisible God? So we're told. Oh, I'd like to go there sometime. Claudia, don't ever try. But why not? It's so sacred that only the high priest ever enters, and then only one day of the year, the day the Jews call their Day of Atonement. But can't we visit the temple at all? Only the outer court, called the Court of Gentiles. 
I'm fascinated by all this mystery. Uh, don't let your fascination get the better of your judgment. Should you go beyond the barrier, it would be my unpleasant duty to have you executed. Oh, you're not serious, Pilate. The priests would demand it. And Caesar has agreed that the Jews may have their religion to themselves. We made a bargain with them. They keep out of politics, and we keep out of their religion. Very well. I'll be careful to observe the customs. The trouble is, the Jew can't seem to distinguish religion from politics. Why, do you know when I came here with my troops, we had to take the images of Caesar from our standards? Why in the world did you have to do that? These people acknowledge no authority except that of their god, not even Caesar. And since they make no images to their god, they don't permit images of any authority in their holy city. Look at their sacred temple. Did you ever see such a filthy place? Why do they permit all those animals within the temple? Those are for the sacrifices. These people are always making sacrifices of one kind or another. They buy the animals at the door and take them in to be killed. Valerius told me that on their great day of celebration, thousands of animals are sacrificed and the place runs red with their blood. Oh. Uh, that's at the Passover. We'll return to see it. I'm told it's quite a spectacle. I don't think I'd care for it. It's the time for me to make some money. The Jews come here by the thousands carrying their riches. They will have to pay a visitor's tax, which I collect. I will also put a tax on everything they buy or sell. They will grumble, but they will pay it. Here comes a soldier with a letter for me. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, thank you. Come quickly, Pilot. There's a band of pilgrims marching toward the temple. Hmm. It's a letter from my intelligence agent. Uh, he, he writes that the place is seething with expectation. There's much talk that John is the Messiah, and at any moment he will declare himself. Uh, listen to this. John has thrown the crowds into confusion by saying that the Deliverer has already appeared and stood among them. Tension is mounting, but John steadily repeats that he is not the Messiah. I suggest you be ready for any eventuality. God, come here. What will you do? I shall ask that more troops be sent to Jerusalem at once. Then I'll arrest John the Baptist. Meanwhile, at the hut near the Jordan, Andrew and his companion talked with Jesus throughout the night. And in the morning, Andrew left the hut and hurried to his brother Simon, who, like himself, was a fisherman from Galilee. Greatly excited, he burst in on Simon, who was in his hut. Simon! Simon! We have found the Messiah! We have found the Messiah! And Simon, looking at the light in his brother's face, and confident in his words, rose and followed him. Jesus had been tested by Satan. John the Baptist had borne witness to him, and how he was discovered by men who would become his disciples. His public life was about to begin. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him only. You shall not go after the strange gods of other nations, lest at any time the wrath of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good 
evening. This is Orson Welles. Our offering for tonight, Theodora Goes Wild, deals with the fascinating subject of a lady who leads a double life. This is, of course, a particularly fascinating subject where the lady is a beautiful, straight-laced, virtuous young woman who is at the same time the author of the most lurid bestseller of her day. Well, when that happens, we arrive at as diverting and heartwarming a piece of entertainment as Theodora Goes Wild, the Columbia Pictures Corporation success of a few seasons ago, which we're about to present tonight. Miss Loretta Young is our star, the Miss Loretta Young than whom no other Hollywood actress of recent years has made more of an impression upon the susceptible male youth of America as the dream girl whom it would be the supreme delight to take to the college prom, the uh, marriage registry bureau, the folks back on the farm for Thanksgiving dinner, or any of the other thousand places in which it imagines itself with its romantic choice. As usual, the male youth of America is right. Theodora Goes Wild starts on its hilarious and romantic way in just a moment, but first, here's something that could have happened the other night. Supper time in the house just down the street from where you live. Two more soup, guys? There's plenty. Mm. I believe I will. Good. Certainly gets the spot on a cold night. Mm -hmm. I thought you said you'd been shopping all day. Why, I have been, yes. But vegetable soup, I mean, doesn't it take you quite a while to... <laughs> I was just waiting for you to say something about that. This is Campbell's vegetable soup. Campbell's, eh? Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, it certainly tastes fine, all right. Lots of vegetables in it, too, the way I like it. You know something? What, dear? I've always said you make grand vegetable soup. I still say so. But say, when you can buy as fine a vegetable soup as this, why, there's just no sense of you spending time making it anymore. That's something that's happening daily in countless homes the country over. Because Campbell's way of making vegetable soup is really the good home way, too. They simmer a vigorous beef stock and fill it with a variety of tender cooked vegetables, 15 of them. Now, isn't that just the tempting, nourishing kind of vegetable soup you want your family to have? Why not have heartwarming plates of Campbell's vegetable soup for supper, say, tomorrow night? And now, Loretta Young and Orson Welles in Theodora Goes Wild. <laughs> Caroline Adams cereal and the bugle is the most indecent thing I've ever made. I'm turning that Caroline Adams cereal off. I'm going to get a new paper and a new editor. Oh, now, see, you said that so you'll be disgusted. Please cancel my subscription as soon as the Caroline Adams cereal is completed. I apologize. Hello. Linfield Bugle, what's that? What's that, Miss Johnson? Okay, Miss Johnson, I apologize. I apologize for breaking my neck to buy the rights to the best-selling novel of the day. I apologize for waking Linfield out of a 20-year sleep to show how people live and love in the wide-awake world. I apologize. What's that? You're giving me fair warning. Miss Rebecca Lynn has called a special meeting of the Ladies' Aid Society tonight to take the matter up officially. Hello, Linfield Bugle. One minute, please. What's that, Mrs. Johnson? You bet I'll be there. Yes, madam, I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. Mr. Potter, I apologize. One moment, ladies. One moment. Ladies. One moment. Quiet, quiet. For those of you who haven't read Miss Caroline Adams' masterpiece, let me tell you, it gets even worse. Listen, you understand these are not my words. Of course, dear. They're Caroline Adams. I'm simply reading. Reading from page five of Jed Waterbury's Lindsay of Bugle. <clears throat> I'd better be going home. Mr. Waterbury, you ought to be ashamed. I apologize. I'd better be going home, Pamela said. It's late. Spencer smiled. It's ten minutes before he answered, his eyes devouring her all the while. Home, Pamela? <laughs> Why, you pretty little... Thing. It's very early. The night's just begun. For us. For us is printed just like all the other words, Miss Rebecca. I know how to read, Mr. Waterbury. I resume, ladies. Resume, <clears throat> He started slowly toward her. His steps were so deliberate, relentless. Some of herself imprisoned and helpless. Uh, that's what I can't understand, Rebecca. It said that the door was unlocked. But the man was possessed of brute strength, Mrs. Hoygrat. The man was possessed of brute strength. Baby. Oh, please, please. 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 She wanted so much to run out of this strange apartment down into the street, but her brain was reeling with drink, and she was robbed of all purpose. He was close to her. He reached out violently, his hands fastened in her arms. She was suddenly pressed tight against him. She fought desperately to break out of his grasp. Let me go, let me go, she shrieked. She could feel his breath in her cheek, his lips on her hers. The room suddenly went dark. That's enough, Rebecca. I think we've heard Please, Miss Rebecca. 
Miss Rebecca, if you don't mind, I haven't been taking the bugle lately. I'd like to hear the rest. Don't worry, Miss Wilson. You can get a copy. I printed an extra hundred. I knew there'd be a demand for them after Miss Rebecca got through reading. That'll be enough from you, Mr. Waterbury. The issue... And remember, ladies, that was only the first installment. The issue is closed. It's clear. The issue is closed. It's clear. Is this literary circle going to let filthy vile trash like this come right into our home and corrupt our vile families? We certainly are. There you are. Do we or do we not want this book stopped, ladies? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Is that plain enough, Jed Waterbury? Yes, that's plain enough, and I got more important things to do than fight the literary circle of Linfield. I'll just cut out printing the thing from now on. That's fine. But I'd better warn all of you. I only got 100 copies of this paper. Come early and avoid the luck. Oh, girl, please. Please. This is Hoysra. Now, one thing more. It says here that this book is published by Stevenson and Company in New York. Well... I propose that the literary circle go on record right here and now as condemning Stevenson and Company lock, stock, and barrel. All in favor? Uh, Theodora. Uh, y- yes, Uncle Betty. Theodora, you didn't say I. Did not? No. Oh. Do you or do you not condemn this book, Theodora? I. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Ladies, I think I'll draw up a resolution tonight. And when my little niece, Theodora, goes to New York tomorrow, she can see that the resolution is sent to this Stevenson and Company. Agree? Aye. Aye. Theodora. I am for better. I. To Arthur Stevenson, Stevenson and Company, New York. Please be advised that at an extraordinary meeting of the Ladies' Literary Circle of Linfield, it was unanimously agreed that you be informed that, in our opinion, the new novel by Caroline Adams, published by you, is a disgrace to American morals and a sin to American youth. Signed, the Linfield Literary Circle. It's magnificent, that's what it is. And it's all your own fault, Mr. Stevenson. My fault, Miss Lynn. Well, why did you have to sell the serial rights of my book to the Linfield Bugle? Well, why not? I think that's very funny, Miss Lynn. Uh, Miss Adams. Oh, all right, Miss yes. Adams. And now, will you please stop worrying? The identity of Carolyn Adams will never be known. I'll carry the secret to the grave. That takes care of everything, doesn't it? Everything but my own conscience. Oh, if Linfield ever oh, finds out that Oh, my dear Miss I... Adams, don't tell me you care what the Linfield Literary Circle thinks. Well, I can't help it. I'm part of it and everything else in Linfield. Were you raised in a small town by a maiden aunt? <laughs> no. Have you taught Sunday school for ten years? No. Have you played the organ in church since you were fifteen? No. Well, I have. And right now I ask myself, where did Carolyn Adams come from? How did all this start, anyway? Well, you walked in here one day with a very promising manuscript. Mm-hmm. My first and my last, Mr. Stevenson. Carolyn Adams has written her last book. Goodbye, Mr. Stevenson. Oh, wait a minute. There's, there's something else that's very important. It seems that I tell the truth, I mean, the way it is. Well, frankly, I promised my wife the next time you came in, she could meet you. You what? Oh, I, I simply had to. But you promised. Nobody. You said you'd carry my secret to the grave. Oh, I will. I swear I will. I'll arrange to have my wife buried with me. But I'll I... do any... Good day, Mr. Stevenson. I beg you. I implore no, you. I sorry. beseech I'm you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'd never believe it. But you don't tell me you're Caroline oh, Adams. Oh, uh, Adams, I had no idea. I mean, there was I'm anything... I'm going to introduce you, Arthur. Oh, yes, of course, dear. Allow me, Miss Lynn, my wife, my wife, Miss Adams. Miss Stevenson, I- I'll never forgive you for this, Mr. Stevenson. Oh, you're worrying about your secret, Miss Adams. I'll keep it. I swear You uh, had better close the door, Ethel. Of course. I'll close it. Hello. Uh, who, who are you? Oh, don't mind me. I, uh... Hello. I said hello. Get out of here, Michael. I just came in. The one thing I can say for Michael Grant, he only shows up where he's not invited. What do you want, Michael? That's a fair question. I'll give you a fair answer. I heard that Caroline Adams you, is here. What I... do you mean you heard? You snooped around and found one out... One way of hearing. Frankly, I felt you ought to meet me, Miss Adams. I'm the man who painted the cover for your book and the... Glorious woman on the poster. Well, I don't know about glorious, but I know she's very underdressed. Yes, she is. That's where I found her in your book, Miss Adams. You I did? even had to add some quotes to her, as a matter oh, of fact. Oh, you apparently pictured it as suit yourself. Yes, you're not the way I pictured you, Miss Adams, yourself. I must oh, say. Oh, I Miss Adams. You aren't. No, I, I, I'd always oh. imagine that Miss Adams ought to look like a, uh, well, she ought to look like a woman who's lived. Well, I've lived. I mean, like in your book. 
What's the explanation? I, I, I fail to see why I should be dissipated looking just to please you, Mr. Dissipated. Let her alone, Michael. Hmm. What did you expect to see? A, a, a tattooed woman? Well, of course exactly he didn't, Miss Adams. You know, I never could get a word about you out of Arthur. I'm just starting to know things. Uh, did you live that scene in which you and Sir Anthony... And Miss really, Adams I, has I, to go, darling. Yes, I do have to go. I, I've got several appointments. Well, maybe later in the afternoon. No, I'm sorry. My whole afternoon is taken. Oh, that's all right. We'll all have dinner together. No, no, no. Really, I won't be able to, but thank you very much. I have to catch an early train back to... Uh... Uh, back home. Oh, where's that? Well, out uh, out west, way out west, out uh, well west. You know, Miss Adams, there are trains leaving all night to way out west. You simply have to meet us. No, I won't take no for an answer. No, and I... whenever won't take no for an answer. Then it's all arranged. Right. We we'll meet you at six. No, really, Miss. It's Mrs. no Mrs. use uh, calling in the police, Miss Adams. You won't be able to get out of it. But I promise you, we'll put you on the earliest possible train after dinner. Very well, I. I'll be here. I really will, but I, I've got to go now. Oh, have a nice afternoon. Yes, I will indeed. Goodbye. 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 I'll be till six o'clock. Goodbye, darling. You shouldn't have bullied that poor girl into having dinner with us. It was her own idea. Yes, Well, dear. I'll be running along, too. Uh, sorry you can't have dinner with us. Yes, I'm so. Who said I could? I did. Just now. other books Arthur publishes. Uh, on a donkey through Brazil, uh, the Sunday totalitarian state is it inevitable. Or was there really a France mistake? Oh, who cares about books like that? But you're not. I, I'm awfully glad you like it, Mrs. Stevens. Oh, I didn't like it. I loved it. Well, I... Oh, yeah. a woman who has lived. Who has known what it is to spend empty nights. Whose heart is beating faster than each from then. Uh, Miss uh, Adams uh, remembers the phrase she wrote, Ethel. You don't have to quote them to her. Uh, tell me something, Miss Adams. Uh, just between us. Did you write why the... Uh, the things actually were happening? What? Or did you well, wait later until the veil of memory? Mrs. Left? Stevenson, you must believe me. A, a writer doesn't have to experience the things she writes about. Oh, I know. But that is so lovely when she really does. And anybody reading your book is Oh, it. I wish I'd never written that book, Mrs. Stevenson. I really do. Well, for a book that has sold nearly 200,000 copies and is still going strong, that's quite a wish. Oh, but you had to write the book, Miss Adams. You had to. Only a woman whose soul isn't shattered like yours could have written it. Only a my woman... soul isn't shattered, Mrs. Stevenson. Oh, how brave you are. Take that note of envy out of your voice, Ethel. It isn't decent. How about some cocktails? A martini. How about you, Miss Adams? None, thank you. Oh, if you'd rather have some vodka, no. Miss Adams. I'm sure Arthur can arrange. No, thank you. Nothing at all. Oh, why not? Well, maybe it's because she doesn't want anything to drink, Ethel. Uh, waiter, two yes, martinis. Sir. Yes, sir. Will you have anything? Well, we'll order later. Yes. You know, Miss Adams, I'd have known you anywhere just from your description of Pamela. Really? You're as like her. Oh, I'll never forget her first meeting with Spencer. Tell the truth, Miss Adams. That part is completely autobiographical. Mrs. Mrs. Stevens, you mean... Uh, you think that... But, Mrs. Stevens, I assure you every word of that scene was made up. Oh, I, of course it was, Miss Adams. Uh, but from memory, wasn't it? Is that what everyone thinks? That I'm supposed... Of course. To... Of course. Why, when Michael... Oh. You know Michael Grant, he was in the office today. Yes, indeed. When he heard you were coming up to the office... He author. had two notions about you, Miss Adams. One was the same as Ethel's. Really? Yes. The other was that you were an old maid school teacher with a petticoat well, showing. Well, how very interesting. Yes, And isn't since you're not an old maid school teacher... You'd have to know Michael to understand. He, he rather fancies himself as a man who knows women. I can get along very well without men who know women. I have so far. Then I'm just in time. Michael! Yes, uh, you've no idea what you miss, Miss Adams, uh, you need to have your innermost thoughts straightened out so that you know what you're really thinking. Michael, I thought we had arranged Be sure of yourself, you know. And you, to know that there's someone who really understands you, I miss Anna. Michael? Where did I... you come from? Pardon me while I say good evening to the ladies. Good evening, ladies. Where did you come from? You want me to lie to you? No. Well, I've been combing the saloons for you. I must say I had good luck. This is the sixth one I've been in. And, uh, <laughs> here we are, aren't we? Michael, I told you plainly in our office office. Oh, that, I hear you. Didn't think I'd hold that little joke against you, did you? You cut me, sir. Don't, because uh, bring one for me, please, whatever it is, as long as it's a whiskey sour. Yes, sir. That's all right. Cocktails before dinner is such a lovely custom. Just a minute, waiter. There's only two drinks. Only two. Now, let me solve this by a process of elimination. Mr. Stevenson is drinking, I'm sure of that. Mrs. Stevenson is also drinking, I'm also sure. That leaves, uh, don't tell me, let me guess, that leaves Miss Adams. You're not drinking, Miss Adams? That's right, I'm not drinking. You mean you never drink? Did I say I never drink? No, you didn't. I no. apologize. It's all good thought. The idea of Miss Carolyn Adams not drinking a slur, Miss Adams, and you do right to resent it. Probably paying off an election bet, is that it? Miss Adams, 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 not to drink. Is that what <laughs> you mean, Mr. Grant? I thought there were two things certain in this world. Mm -hmm. That babies eat spinach and that Miss Adams drinks. You've destroyed something very precious in my life, Miss Adams. Very well, Mr. Grant. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm not drinking. If, 
If you're so interested, it's because I... I... Well, I... I've always thought the cocktails are sort of sissy. Uh, don't you think so? I beg your pardon? Well, I suppose there's a diversion now and then, but not what you call real drinking. Mr. Stevenson, do you suppose I might have a little straight whiskey? A little straight what? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Stop gulping, Michael. Oh, waiter, uh, straight whiskey for the lady. Yes, sir. Miss Adams, uh, Miss Adams, looks like a lovely evening. <laughs> Miss Adams. <laughs> What is it, Ethel? Little Goldilocks dragged me right under the table. I'm passing out, Jan. Oh, darling, you mustn't. They, we've got to put Caroline on the train. Michael, we'll put her on the train. You'd better take little Ethel out of here while she's still warm. Please, Arthur. We can leave while they're not looking. Oh, you're sick of everything, darling. Let's go. I'll uh, tell you what we'll do, Miss Adams. You, uh, you just stand still, and I'll, I'll dance to the left of you, and then... I'll dance to the right well, of you. Oh, that's not fair, Mr. Grant. Why don't you stand still, and then I'll dance to the right of you, and then and then to the left of you. Well, let's you both do it at the same time. You mean each stand still and dance it while the other stands still and dance it? Yeah. Oh, sounds wonderful. I think so. Uh, could we go back to the table now? I think Stevenson. Oh, the Stevensons. Don't worry about the Stevensons. They've, uh, they've left. Uh, and they what? Yes, I, I saw them leave while we weren't looking. How did you know if you weren't looking? I look. Oh, you're wonderful. Yes, it's about time we were discussing the charity bazaar. Oh, you know, I suppose so. I'm so tired. Couldn't have waited until perhaps. It's been delayed too long already. Just oh. because you try to do too much shopping in New York and aren't feeling well today, finish your tea and you'll feel better. All right, Andy, all right. Oh, there's that silly whistling we heard outside of church this morning. What fidgeting, Theodora? What's gotten into you? Nothing, uh, nothing at all. You fidgeted all during church, too. If going to New York for one day affects you like that, well, I... Oh, I wish whoever is doing it would stop that whistling. Well, uh, I'll go to the window and see. You don't have to see. It's the same whistling. It must be the same man that was outside of church. I'll make sure, Auntie. Well, it is, isn't it? Why, um, uh, yes. Walking by? No, sort of, uh, resting on the gate. I'll phone Captain O'Donnell and have that good-for-nothing loafer put in jail where he can whistle to his heart's content. Oh, don't bother, Andy. I'll tell him to go away. Now, don't argue too much with him. Just tell him once, and then I'll call the police. How dare you do this to me? How dare you? How do you do? How do you do? Right smart weather we're having, lady. Right you smart. You get away from here and leave this town as fast as you can go. Is that the way to talk to a friend? An old um, drinking companion? Please, will you listen to me? My aunt is watching us. As far as she is concerned, I don't know a soul outside of Linfield. And if she suspected what you know about me, she'd have fit. Oh, now, be a nice man, won't you, please? Tip your hat politely and then, and then get away from here, will you? <laughs> it's marvelous. This beats my first guess by a mile. Won't you please go? I know Homestead you got here, lady, but one oh, of your lawns looks seedy, and your lawns do need attendance. No, they don't. You know what you need? It's a gardener. No, don't be absurd. We've never had a gardener. You've got one now. Oh, please, won't you listen to me? It's simply can't be done. I can start right away. No, no, right no, 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 no,
case you. Uh-huh. Look here, young man, and keep that dog out of here. If he so much as growls at he me... He never growls at anybody, do you, Herman? <laughs> you see what I said? Come here, uh, Herman. I, uh, have said that. In just one minute, yeah. I'm going to call the police. Oh, I wouldn't, I... Dr. Becker. I think... Thank you, be... young... Thank you. Thank you, young lady. You see, ma'am, my name is uh, Dewberry. You're just wasting your time, young man. I see you're refusing work to a man who needs it, who's willing to work, who wants a chance to recover his self-respect. That isn't very charitable-minded, is it? Very charitable-minded is the rest, but if you... All right, all right. Very well. I'll find work right in this town, too, and then I'll have something to say about how people are treated here. I was telling your poor, your little niece outside. I'll have a lot to say about a lot of things that are there said is around, some here work and, around here. around here, Aunt Rebecca, stuff. cleaning up and, and, and sort of setting the gardens to rest. Thank you, and... lady. That's what I call intelligent charity. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll show them to the spare room you. Thank have you, you gone mad, Theodora? In this way, Gardner. You just lead the way, young lady. I'll follow you. If you think you're going to that spare room alone with my niece. Oh, you can come, too, if uh, you insist. Once and stop this nonsense. All right. Uh, Herman. Herman. Doesn't like our idea, Herman. No, I Sorry. certainly don't. You ought to know better than to say the circus right here in our front. Now, look here. You want me to disappoint people who've walked miles to look me over? I well, bet I played to an audience of a uh, of hundred in the last hour. I hope it's your farewell performance. Herman, let this be a lesson to you. It's a disgrace to have a little fun in Linfield. And don't forget it, Now, Herman. look here. I've got some things I want to say to you um, privately. If this was New York, you could uh, come up to my uh, apartment and see my family. Well, it isn't New York, so uh, just move over to those rose bushes and start trimming. Don't like rose bushes. Now, go along. Keep your eyes on your work. There. Now, now, tell me. How did you attract me to Linfield? I have an elaborate espionage organization all set up for people like you. Oh, you have? Mm-hmm. Yes. Outside of that, I've got a homing instinct like a pigeon. <laughs> you know, you reminded me of a pigeon the first time I saw you. Oh, did I? Now, <laughs> that's you. strange. Now, wait a minute. I insist on your telling me how you found me. Well, you dropped a few papers out of your purse when we both had that um, slight difficulty getting out of the cab at the station. Remember? Oh, yes, yes, I, I do remember that. Good. Then you must remember that I uh, made so bold as to try and kiss you. Look, I am not you... interested in your memoirs. Now that you've had your little laugh, why don't you go away? I like it here. And anyway, I've got a new mission in life. Oh. I'm going to break you out of this jail and give you to the world. The real you, I mean. I'm going to tell everybody I mean. You mixed. wouldn't be so low as to tell my aunt and Linfield about me. I would, would, but I won't. You'll do it yourself. Oh, no, never. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. No. Uh, tell me, what sort of berries are ripe at this time of year? Berries? Oh, oh, uh, uh the blueberries. Why? That's what you and I are going out to pick tomorrow. Oh, now, don't be silly. I can't go skipping off into the woods with you. Not skipping. Picking. You're a wreck, Mr. Dewberry. A total wreck. Now, I've come to a conclusion. <laughs> yes. Uh, berry picking is for the berry pickers. I'm <laughs> through. And outside of that, you're a nasty character. Oh, I was wondering when you'd catch on. <laughs> Are you going to give me some of the berries out of that pail? Well, if you weren't flat on your back, you could dig into the pail yourself, you know. I don't want it. To drop them in my mouth. That's a good job. <laughs> Say, who do you think's going to chew them up for you? Drop them way back so they just slide down. <laughs> hey, that's the idea. I'm sorry I'm putting you to the trouble of swallowing. Oh, that's all right. Gives the fellow the exercise he needs. <laughs> More. Honestly, you're such a fool. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd catch on. Hmm? Laugh again, will you? I will not. You're ashamed of having laughed, aren't you? Out loud and everything. Oh, dear, oh, dear. What would Linfield say? Miss, Miss Theodora Lynn laughed, my dear. I swear she did. I heard her myself. Nobody will believe you. You know you're a strange, sad case, my girl. No. Tell me more, Doctor. To start with, you're really a nice girl, full of normal desires, but I'll tell you what's happening to them. All right, what? They're being strangled to death. You mean murder? No, suicide. Oh. What Linfield doesn't let you feel, you write about. Uh-huh. Love, laughter, freedom, fun, what you want to experience and can't. Yes, yes, go on, Doctor. There's a happy world out yonder, young woman. Break loose. Go on, tell Linfield a... Well, tell Linfield. <laughs> Look, I am very happy the way I am. Thank you very much. Oh, no, you're not. 
You won't be free and happy until you do what I tell you. Now, with my help... Now, wait a minute. As a matter of fact, you, uh, you could help me. Say the word. What do you want me to do? Get out of Linfield and stay out. Then I'll be very happy and very free. You see, Dr. Dubarry, my, my real life is right here. Carolyn Adams was an accident. She won't ride anymore. Too bad if you ask me. Okay, that's your answer if I ask you. And until then, will you please leave it like this, Doctor? I'll be sure to call you if anything ever does go wrong. You promise? I promise. I promise that nothing ever will go wrong. Listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Theodora Goes Wild, starring Loretta Young and Orson Welles. This is the Columbus Broadcasting System. Ernest Chapel, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In just a moment, we shall resume our presentation of Theodora Goes Wild. But first, do you remember, I'm sure many of us do, being sent as a child by mother to the market, and that among the things she ordered was a soup bone for making soup? Ha <laughs> yes siree. You trudged down to a friendly store in the neighborhood, made your wants known, and the soup bone was faithfully brought back and made part of a hearty, old-style, heartwarming soup that mother made so well and you enjoyed so much. But I'll wager that the boy or girl going to the store for mother nowadays doesn't very often have a soup bone on the list. (laughs) Instead, the grocery likely tucks into the bag one or more cans with a familiar red and white label that says Campbell's Soup. Mother knows that into the making of Campbell's Soups go luscious vegetables and fine selected meats. And these soups are the kind she wants her family to have. And so she buys them and serves them regularly. I'd like to ask if you at your house have turned your soup making over to Campbell's. I sincerely believe that if you do so, you'll be delighted to see how keenly your family will enjoy these fine soups. And now we resume our Campbell Playoffs presentation of Theodora Goes Wild, starring Orson Welles and Loretta Young. explanation, Theodora. I can't imagine what in the world you were thinking of going traipsing off into the woods with a gardener, a man you never saw before yesterday. Well, Aunt Rebecca, I admit it was wrong to walk down Main Street like that with him, carrying a pail of blueberries, and I'm sorry everybody happened to see it. But I honestly can't see that it was all so very sinful. To be seen publicly with this loafer? Really, Theodora? I suppose Linfield has his mind all made up about that. If Linfield hasn't, I have. Theodora, I'm putting my foot down once and for all. He's not a fit companion for you. Now, look. Isn't it time I use my own judgment in a matter like this? Very well, then. If you're going to be stubborn about it, his work's about done. You said just a few days. He can be discharged right now. But I don't want him to be... All right, I'll tell him to go at once. It doesn't make any difference to you what I want, does it? It's what you happen to think is good for me. You've been doing that to me since I was three years old, and I'm sick of it. You've bullied and scolded and frightened me all I'll stand for. You know what you're saying? I certainly do, and I haven't said half of what I'm going to say. To begin with, let me tell you something. Theodora, you're working yourself up over nothing at all. I don't think I am. And listen carefully, Aunt Rebecca, because I mean every word of this. There's no law that can put that gardener off these premises. He is going to stay. I say he's not. What I choose to do is none of Linfield's business. This is a free country, and I'm over 21. Well, as far as Linfield is concerned, the whole town can go and and, and, and take a jump on the lake. Theodora! That gardener will stay as long as I want him to, and that's forever. Because I love him. Travel faster alone. I'm leaving in a hurry because it'll be better that way. Good luck. And this Carolyn Adams one. Michael. Oh. Oh, Michael. All right. All right. Why does 
this have to be the only apartment in New York just because I don't rush? Oh. Hello, Michael. Theodora, what... What brings you... <laughs> I should have let you know I was in the neighborhood, by, I suppose, by, by whistling. But you see, Michael, I can't whistle very well. Just listen to this. Look, Theodora. Huh? Oh, maybe we better close the door. I know what you came here about. Do you? Yes. That note. Well, about that note, Theodora... Yes? Writing it was the most difficult thing I ever had to do. Yes? You see, I ran away because... It, if I'd had any idea that it, it would become as, as serious as it did, yes. I, I wouldn't ever have, have, uh, have gone to Linfield. I had no right to, to let it become serious. Now, please believe me. I, uh, I don't believe you. Well, if you'd let me explain. I'm not stopping you from explaining. Well, I can't just say what I want to say now. Now, some other time. I'm expecting my father. I'm afraid and I... some other time won't do, my Theodora, friend. there's nothing more important in the world to me than you. Nothing. And the... there they are now. Theod... Oh, Theodora. If you... The... Theodora, they can't find you here. Who are they, my friend? My father and... and yes? Uh, Theodora. Yes? Won't you please go into another room and go sit down someplace? Yes, Michael. I'll sit down someplace. Right here. Oh. Hello, father. Uh-huh. Uh... Hello, Agnes. Hello, Michael. Well, what do you mean by this, Michael? Running out of town, not letting us know about it? Where were you? Well, I, I was uh, out, of, out of town. I know that. Where were you? <laughs> it's a funny thing, Father, but... Who's that? <laughs> Who's what? Oh, oh. You mean, uh... Oh. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, this, uh, uh, Miss Lynn, from, uh, the Stevenson office. She just, uh, Miss Lynn, she... Brought some material over. I'm going to illustrate, as a matter of uh, my father, Miss Lynn. How do you do, Mr. Grant? Uh, well, I suppose I'll have to introduce myself. I'm Mrs. Grant. Mrs. Grant. Michael, your mother. Well, not exactly, Miss Lynn. I'm Michael's wife. Oh. Oh. How do you do? Michael. Where did you say you were? In the country. Sketching. Well, that's a new name for it. Uh, did you drift back into town accidentally? No. Or did you remember that I'm giving a reception for the government? I remember the... the re yeah, of course I remember. Yes, well, I trust that you'll be good enough to remember also that I expect you and Agnes to be present. Well, I he's will... the one that's insisting, Michael, if it were up to but me. But, Father... I expect you, and with Agnes. Father, this... This pretense of my happy marriage can't go on. It's... It's been washed up for five years. Agnes is just as sick of it as I am. That's a lie. I'm sick of it. I thought we agreed there'd be no divorce as long as I hold public office. Now, you gave me your word, and that's the way it's going to be. Nothing can be done with him, but Michael. There'll but... be no buts. You know what's expected of you, Michael. Come on, Agnes. Uh, goodbye, Miss. Goodbye. Goodbye, Michael. Goodbye. I can scarcely wait for the governor's reception. Neither can I. We always have such cheerful meetings, yes, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. Certainly do. That's all. Oh. That is. That's it, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's all clear now, isn't it? Well, in a way, Michael. Uh, you know, you know, seeing these paintings of yours gives me an idea. What you need, Michael, is an artist's model. I, what? Uh, an artist's model. For the slightest use for a model. Oh, but that's unimportant. You've got one now. Who? Me. What for? Oh, to mow the lawn and do the transplanting no. and pick the berries and laugh at the name. You know. It's a joke. You know. I get it. You see, Michael... You're living in a jail. You don't call your soul now, your wait own, a minute. you... If you're, if you're pretending there's any similarity between your situation and mine, Theodora... <laughs> well, what's Theodora? the difference? What's to stop you from being free? Well, I'm under an obligation to my father. After oh. all, I haven't any right to... Oh, I see. Michael, you claim to love me, don't you? You know I do. And the, and the very minute I'm free, darling, when Theodora... When precisely is this minute to be? Well, just let father serve out his term as lieutenant governor. Yes? He, he's decided not to run for office again. Yes? Ever, and... and... That means that within two years... Two years? Yes. Two years is exactly two years too long, Now, be Michael. reasonable, Theodora. If I had any way in the if world... If you had any courage, if you had any outlook, why, 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 you wouldn't think of waiting for two years. Oh, Michael, it's pretty clear to me that what you need is a model. Theodora, you're not being fair. Oh, yes, I'm being fair. Is this the phone to the lobby downstairs? Yes, that's the phone. Why? Thank you. Hello? What are you doing? Uh, those boxes and things that were left in the lobby. Will you send them up to Mr. Theodora. Grant's apartment, please? Yes, yes, that's right. Thank you. What are you talking... What boxes? What things? Well, my clothes. You don't think I'm going to going to stay here indefinitely without any clothes, Exactly. Do what do you think you're going to do? Return a favor, darling. Well, how? By moving in here and breaking a scandal about my ears? Well, you've got to expect a scandal when you've got a model living in your apartment. Hey. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Well, now, let me. I'm sure it's for me. There, I was right. Oh. Bring them right in, young man. Thank you very Listen much. To Listen to me. If yes. you're going to stay here, I'm not. 
Oh, and it's such a nice apartment. You'd be so happy here. I'm you? leaving right now. Oh. Boy, uh, well, will you uh, please take these things into the spare bedroom? Yes, ma'am. And, uh, boy, tell them at the desk, if there are any calls from Miss Caroline Adams, I'll be in Mr. Grant's apartment from now on. <laughs> Funny, Miss Lynn. I am not Miss Lynn. I am Miss Adams. And I don't want you to think that this is a friendly call, Mr. Stevenson, because it isn't. I came here to have a fight. But really, Miss Lynn, there isn't Adams, anything that... I am dissatisfied with the treatment I received from my publisher. I mean you, Mr. Stevenson. Why don't I get any publicity around but here? But my dear Miss Lynn, Miss Adams, I, I... You may call me Theodora, Mr. Stevenson. Go on, call me Theodora. Theodora. Oh, that sounds very good, very good indeed. You know the Caroline Adams of Theodora, but who else knows Theodora as Caroline Adams? Nobody. Nobody, that's right. The widest selling author in the country, and who knows anything about me? Who knows that I'm young and modern and... Oh, you're going to say beautiful? Well, come along, will you? Oh, yes, go ahead. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Why aren't the facts of my life in Linfield known everywhere? Do you realize what a story that would make? But you said I always thought that... You never thought. I'm beginning to see why the publishing business is so bad. Publishers don't care about increasing the sales of their books. Don't they? No, they don't. I'm going to give you one more chance, Mr. Stevenson. I want publicity, and I want lots of it. I want my picture on every jacket of every book of mine sold. I want the story of Theodore Lynn and Carolyn Adams splattered over every paper in every town in this country. Do you get the general idea, Mr. Uh, Stevenson? I think I do. Well, make sure that you do. You know, you don't want to forget. There are lots of other publishers, but there is only one Carolyn Adams. <laughs> the young people of today. Oh, very well. It, uh, it seems to me that nothing is more important to the modern young girl than this, gentlemen. Be free. Express yourself. Take your life in your own hands and mold it. Oh, that's well, yeah. Yes, that is pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> the world will try to take your freedom away from you, but you'll have to fight for it. It's all you have to live for, girl. Anything else, Jennifer? Have you started a new book, Miss Adams? Well, as a matter of fact, I have one pretty well in mind, yes. That's uh, well. Would you care to tell us anything about it? Well, I'd yeah. be delighted. Let me see. It's, it's about a about love that came to a young girl hidden away in a small mountain town. Outwardly, she seems to belong to that narrow, benighted community. But in her heart, she longed to be called baby. Oh, that's great, 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 great. <laughs> And then out of that big city, there came to that little hamlet the man who did call her baby. And from then on, gentlemen, the story warms up. Uh, of course, I haven't worked out the ending yet, but I, I'll guarantee you it'll be interesting at least. Uh, that wouldn't be the story of your life by any chance, would it, Miss Adams? Well, I, I shouldn't wonder. Yeah. Who's the man? The man. Well, after all, gentlemen, I'm, I'm entitled to one little secret, don't you think? Yeah, but only one. That's the rule. So suppose you tell us. Isn't this Michael Grant's apartment? Michael Grant? Yeah. Michael Grant. Yeah, yeah. Son of Albert W. Grant, Lieutenant Governor. Oh. Unless I'm mistaken. Oh, indeed, you're not mistaken. Yes, this is Mr. Grant's apartment. Uh, we can print that, can we? I, I beg your pardon? That you're living in Mr. Grant's apartment. Well, gentlemen, since I am, I, I don't know what we can do about it. Though how you ever wormed that fact out of me, I'll never know. Now, don't tell me there isn't anything you can do about it, Michael. Well, you have to do something I about it. I can't. If you only understand, Father, this girl has made up her mind. Yes, yeah, she certainly has. Given your address, your apartment, 
Call the police and have her thrown out. What your father means, Margo. I know you... what my father means, Agnes, but he forgets that New York will be looking on if I call in the police, and that'll be fine publicity for the governor's reception, Father. Now, well, you great. must do it without publicity. Do it without the idea of a notorious woman like that. Did you read what she has to say about herself, hidden away in a hamlet, her soul and slave, a woman leading a double life? It's not triple. We don't need your corrections, Agnes. This isn't any consideration of yours. Why not? Well, it isn't. After all, if she's out to break up our marriage, Mike. Well, maybe I ought to root for her. I want you to behave yourself, too, I guess. All right. But let me say this. Don't. This woman can do anything she wants to as long as nobody suffers with my Right. But if it gets talked about and I'm made to look like a foolish, deceived wife, you I'll are. protect myself. Michael's not going to drag me Can't into anything. Can't you understand I'm not dragging anybody into anything? Oh. Just... Now, you must make this woman stop her practical joke immediately, practical Michael. Do you joke. understand that? Yes, sir. I just don't understand how I'm going to do it. Well, that will be up to you. You're so clever, Michael. You'll think of something. <laughs> Make yourself at home. Thank you. Here, let me take your hat. Won't you sit down? No, I I... won't sit down. Just come to tell you something, Theodora. Oh, but you mustn't think you have to have a reason for coming, Michael. After all, this is your home as much as mine. You're always welcome. You know that. Stop it, Theodora. Don't you know you're getting yourself the worst possible kind of reputation? Am I really, Michael? Oh, I knew I would, but I didn't dare hope for you. I want you to stop it. Michael, darling, I can't stop it. Don't you see? I'm just being myself. Whatever happens, that's the way I am. I'm free, Michael. Free. You ought to try it sometime, you know. I'd you... wring your neck right now, only that'd just make matters worse. Oh, you you do care about me, don't you? You listen to me, Theodore. I came up here to ask you to do me a favor. Oh, that's the second thing you said you came up here about. But to start with, you said you only came up here about one thing. You know, you confuse me, Michael. Please, all... Theodora, Theodora, please. <laughs> all right, Theodora, Michael, what is it? Try to be quiet until <laughs> after the governor's reception, please. I'll tell you what, why don't you get out of town until the reception is over? That's all I ask of you. I'll come up to Linfield and, and, and talk to you in, in a month. Only get out now, you're making my life miserable. <laughs> oh, that's a sign that a struggle's going on within you, Michael. But you will be victorious, don't worry. Yes, the light will break suddenly, and then you'll rise up and tell your father what I told Linfield. And, oh, you'll be so happy, Michael. You can break your chains if you want to. We all can. Why can't you be a little reasonable, Theodore? I've forgotten how after Linfield. Is that your final answer? Yes. There's nothing I can... Nothing, Michael. Nothing. Goodbye. Goodbye. Don't stay away so long the next time, Michael. I want you to treat this apartment as if it were your very own. anymore, Governor. Do you mind if we hang around and get whatever pictures we can? Why, of course not. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Governor Cameron, you remember my son, Michael, and his wife? Why, of course. How do you do, Michael? Uh, how, how do you do, sir? You... Still painting, Michael? Pity I'm... he isn't a statesman, isn't it, Governor? Pity. Haven't I seen your name in the papers recently, Michael, about... Uh, oh, no. Which I can uh, recall uh, the incident. Uh, you I... don't mean the story about Carolyn Adams. Oh, that, that is uh, that's... Theodora Lynn, do yeah. you, Governor? Why, I don't really remember. But she was a I... woman that was living in Michael's apartment, you know. Well, Governor, you... You She's see, a celebrated I... novelist, uh, Governor. Yes, a she is. A sensational yes, novelist, yes, Governor. Yes, yes. And a woman with quite a private oh, reputation. Oh, quite a misunderstanding, Governor. I, I, I assure you. You see, I, I never met the lady myself. It, it was, as a matter of fact, that my publisher, as it happened, gave the... Uh, Gave her the use of my apartment. Do you know how the newspapers are, Governor? Sure. Indeed, I do. Yes, you do. I, I yes, hope sir. steps are taken to clear this matter up. They will be, you sir. You know your father and well, I... Well, uh, <coughs> Michael is uh, is clearing the whole thing up. Yeah, I'm clearing the whole matter up, Your sir. father and I have been very careful to keep this administration clean, my boy. Oh, I know that, sir. Uh, Agnes. What? Darling, this is our dance, I believe. Why, Governor, Michael, I... Good evening. Dance with your husband. You must dance with me, Mr. Uh, yes. Thank sir. you, Governor. <laughs> See you, Governor. Governor, you dance divine. Uh, thank you, miss. I I didn't quite get your name. Adam. Oh, yes, Adam. Yes. Well, you're a splendid dancer, too, Miss Adam. Well, thank you, Governor. Michael. Michael, tell me quickly. Yes. Is that that woman with yes. the governor? There's no question her... about it, Father. Can't you see? Oh, this is terrible. 
Hustle. In five minutes, everybody in the house will know who she is. They got a picture of her a minute ago with the governor. All right, I'll take care of that. Now, hurry. See to it that she gets out of this house, Michael. Take her out into the garden on the terrace anywhere and keep her, her there for the rest uh, of the evening. I... There you are, Grant. Oh, How light the party. Governor. And I just had the most fascinating dance. Uh, let me present Miss... Miss, um... uh, Miss Adams. Oh, yes, Miss Adams. Brad and Michael Grant. How do you do? Uh, how, how do you do? How, how do you do? Miss so nice, Miss Adams. Isn't this the most delightful party? You know, I don't know when I've enjoyed myself so much, and the governor dances divinely. <laughs> Give me a charming lady to dance with, and I'm young oh, again. Thank yes, you. that's what Michael always says, isn't yes. it, Michael? Yes, it's, uh, it's what I always say. Ah, there's the music Give again. Uh, may I have the pleasure of this dance, Miss Adams? I could use the power of my office to keep Miss Adams for myself. But you should be served occasionally, I suppose. Uh, you're a one, I Governor. relinquish Miss Adams to you, Michael, with regret. Uh, thank you, Governor. I'll see you. You're not keeping time with the music very well, Mr. Grant. Uh, would it help you if I whistled? The only thing that would help would be if the floor <laughs> would open up and swallow us both. Or anyway, you. Why don't you get in here? Oh, you yeah, isn't that funny? I said to myself, I'll bet the first thing Michael asked me is, how did I get in here? How did you get in here? Darling, don't hold me so tight. This is hardly the How did you get in here? Well, you don't have to give me that. Stevenson's had an invitation, and, and they decided not to come, and so... I want to talk her. to you. Come on out here in the balcony. Hey! Hey, darling, my arm! You're all strong. Now then, you're obviously at this party to start something. What are you going to do? Do? Don't try to fool me. Everywhere you are these days, something happens. Why, my Listen to me, Theodora. If you try to start anything here tonight, I'll... I'll spend the rest of my life persecuting you. Oh. And that goes if you're not out of this house in 15 minutes. Oh, you couldn't really persecute me, could you, Michael? Yes, I could. Well, maybe not, but I'd hire somebody. Oh. And you've got to get out of my apartment and out of New York inside of two days. Is that clear? Do you mean that, Michael? I mean every word of it. I'm, I'm to go back to Linfield? Linfield. And, and just wait? And wait. Oh. Is this really goodbye? Only for now. You do as I ask you to do, Theodore. You're bribing me, Michael. I'm, I'm not bribing you. I'm just trying to make something... All right, all right, Michael. I'll go. I'll go back home. But I, uh... I would like something to lend you by. Have anything? Sure, anything. Well, could I... Could I have a kiss, Michael? Uh, not here. When I see you off. I'll be on the train. I'll kiss you down. But supposing down you on... don't come to the train. I'll... Supposing you're afraid I'll, of... I'll come to the train and kiss you on the train. But I can't take that chance. Theodora. Michael. The... Hold it. I'm surprised, Mr. Grant. Hang what? on, Miss Adams. On the road. No fool. Hey. I told you, boys. You just wait long enough. Theodora. Theodora. You mean you arranged all this? Well, aren't you flattered, Michael? I <laughs> Double cross on this for those photographers. I'll break their necks if they print that picture. I'll skin them alive. Why, I'll crack Michael, them. you know you can't catch somebody. As for you, if I ever said I loved you, Theodora. If you ever said you loved me, what? What? I beg your oh. pardon. Oh, Governor. Hello, Governor. Uh, why, what's Governor. going on here? Can't you see, Governor? It's my husband and Miss Adams with uh, their arms around each other. <laughs> Michael, you really distinguished yourself this time. <laughs> Waterbury. Well, this is Michael Grant, sued for divorce. Yep. Grant's Carolyn Adams is love thief. Yep. Henry, my boy, the moment has come. I want nothing but red ink on the front page this afternoon. Nothing but red ink, you understand? Oh, I wish we hadn't used that big type last time. One moment, Mr. Waterbury. Yes, Miss Wayne, Mr. Waterbury. Yeah, what is it now, Miss Rebecca? It's this headline in your paper. Well, we got to print headlines in the paper. The paper would look silly without them. That's right, Miss Wayne. Very funny, Mr. Waterbury. <laughs> Yeah, Theodora, arriving Saturday. Well, she is arriving Saturday, isn't she? Yes, yeah, she certainly is, Mr. Walker. Most illustrious citizen of Linfield to honor hometown. She is our most illustrious citizen, isn't she? She sure is. Oh. All of Linfield to welcome its own its celebrity. Theodora Tells is... everything in a few words, don't it? That's what a headline ought to be. Let me Let tell me you, Mr. Rebecca, very few editors... Let me tell you, Mr. Waterbury, I won't have it. Won't have what? This, uh, this civic reception you're planning for my niece. I'll see to it that nobody in this town participates in your disgraceful plan. And if you think, Mr. Uh, Mr. Waterbury... Mr. Rebecca, let me tell you something. You may be able to ruin me in my paper, but it's all right with me if you do. If there's nobody else down at the station Saturday, there'll be Henry and me. And if I have to get my paper out on Monday for the last time, Miss Rebecca, I give you fair warning, you'll be in the headlines. You'll be the headlines. Now, Mr. Waterbury? Not yet. Another 30 seconds, maybe. Well, okay, but our arms are getting awful tired. Yes, sir, now? I'll tell you when. Now, now! Oh, I, 
me and your friend? Yes. I want to welcome you on behalf of the people of Linfield. You've shown that by being yourself, by not concealing anything that you do, because you know that what you're doing is right, there's no reason why anybody... That's enough out of you, Jed Waterbury. Aunt Rebecca. What are you doing here, Miss Rebecca? Welcoming my niece home. You know anybody who has a better right? But, but I, I... Just because you didn't see me doesn't mean I wasn't here. That's what telegraph poles are for, Mr. Waterbury, to hide behind from people like you. And another thing, I never did hear a brass band play as bad as yours did just now. I guess I've got to do the band leading, too, here in Linfield. <laughs> Let's see you play as if you meant it. Okay. Blow hard, all of you. Like it was your last blow. Are okay. you ready? One, two, three. I haven't left out a single thing, and, and the only reason I didn't tell oh, you was my I... fault. You, you got a notion I was trying to make you do what I wanted you to do. Well, I, I guess I was. Oh. Only if I'd known you was as capable of handling things by yourself as you are. You, you know, Theodora, yes. I, I got a confession to make to you. Well, what is it, Aunt Rebecca? Well, I've always been telling you to behave like all the Lynns there ever was before you. Yes. But uh, I forgot to tell you there's been wild Lynns as well as quiet ones. Ah, uh, you're going wild yes. like that. No surprise to me. <laughs> I, um, I can remember when I was your age, there was uh, a young fellow over in Springfield. Yes? Oh, oh no, no, I, I guess I better not. Well, go on, Andrew. Oh, no, 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 another time. Now, right now, I, I tell you what, you go out in the tool shed and get me, um, uh, get me my garden scissors. Those uh, bushes need pruning. Oh, but, Andrew, Rebecca, surely they can wait until tomorrow. Yes, yeah, no, I'll go out in that tool shed and get me, uh, get me my garden scissors. Yes, Andrew. Hello, Theodora. Michael. I wanted to come to the station, but Aunt Rebecca... Oh, I'm glad you didn't. Oh, it's so much nicer here, just the two of us, Michael. Oh, I beg your pardon, Herman. I meant just the three of us. You have been listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of Theodora Goes Wild, starring Loretta Young and Orson Welles. Mr. Welles will be back with us in just a moment, but right now, if I may, a brief reminder. When you enjoy Campbell's vegetable soup at your table, you are eating vegetable soup every bit as fine as any that ever came out of a home soup kettle. That's because it's made in the old-fashioned old home way. It's 15 different garden vegetables, and its invigorating beef stock give it the stoutness and substance the really hearty eating that you want in a soup at this time of year. No wonder, indeed, that families everywhere look upon Campbell's vegetable soup as, well, as almost a meal in itself. Now, wouldn't piping hot plates of vegetable soup as Campbell's make it taste really good at supper tomorrow night? And now, here is Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present tonight's guest star. Not only is she one of Hollywood's best-known actresses, but she is by common consent one of the best-liked members of the movie colony. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Loretta Young. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Mr. Wells. I'm, uh, I'm particularly happy to be here tonight because I really think I'm what could be called a Campbell's Playhouse veteran. I was on the very second Campbell Playhouse broadcast in Private of India with Ronald Coleman back in, oh, October 1934. I was going to bring that up. Our records show that you've only appeared with us five times, including tonight, since then, and that's not nearly enough. <laughs> thank you. I want you to promise you'll be back with us again very soon. I'll be glad to appear again here, Orson. While we're about it, I feel I must warn you, Loretta, about tonight's broadcast. Warn me about what? Well, you know what you're going to be suspect from now on, don't you? Let an anonymous novel appear anywhere. Let any author use a nom de plume ah. and we'll all be convinced you're the author. <laughs> well, that's a marvelous idea. And it'll make a good plot for a picture or a broadcast. Oh, why don't we do it and call it, um... Theodora goes wild. Great. And I could play a young artist called Michael and go to Linfield and pick up a dog called Herman. <laughs> yes, you've got the idea. I'm ready right. any time you are. <laughs> well, it's a deal. As soon as I finish with my next picture. That wouldn't be a Columbia Pictures Corporation <laughs> picture, would it? Yes. It would be awesome, and thank you very much. Don't mention it. Thank you. Loretta Young. And good night. Good night. Miss Young, of course, ladies and gentlemen, with Theodora. Jed Waterbury was Ray Collins. Mr. Grant Sr. was Everett Sloan. Mrs. Michael Grant was Georgia Backus. Mary Taylor was Mrs. Stevenson. Aunt Rebecca was Clara Blandick. Frank Reddick was Arthur Stevenson. 
And Michael Grant is your obedient servant. Now it's the next week. Next Sunday night, ladies and gentlemen, our offering will be The Citadel by A.J. Cronin. A human story of the struggle of a young doctor and his wife to see and hold their way clear against the complexities of modern life in its profession. And as Christine, the clear-eyed wife, who manages to remain true at all times, not only to her own self, but to her husband's true self as well, we regard ourselves as extremely fortunate in being able to present an actress who has been universally acclaimed as the outstanding motion picture discovery of last year, with unanimous critical acclaim for a performance in Wuthering Heights and Dark Victory, one of the brightest of the new stars in the Hollywood firmament, Miss Geraldine Fitzgerald. And so until... Next Sunday night in the Citadel, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse remain, as always, obediently yours. Makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we present A.J. Cronin's The Citadel with Miss Geraldine Fitzgerald as our guest star. Meanwhile, if you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's vegetable soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.